Chapter Fourteen of Sentimental Education. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sentimental Education by Gustave Flaubert. Chapter Fourteen The Barricade. Part Two. Martinon tried to reassure him the conservative party in a little while would certainly be able to take its revenge in several cities the commissioners of the provisional government had been driven away the elections were not to occur till the twenty third of april there was plenty of time in short it was necessary for m dambrus to present himself personally in the aub and from that time forth martinon no longer left his side became his secretary and was as attentive to him as any son could be frederick arrived at rosinette's house in a very self-complacent mood delmar happened to be there and told him of his intention to stand as a candidate at the seine elections in a placard addressed to the people in which he addressed them in the familiar manner which one adopts towards an individual the actor boasted of being able to understand them and of having in order to save them got himself crucified for the sake of art so that he was the incarnation the ideal of the popular spirit believing that he had in fact such enormous power over the masses that he proposed by and by when he occupied a ministerial office to quell any outbreak by himself alone and with regard to the means he would employ he gave this answer never fear i'll show them my head frederick in order to mortify him gave him to understand that he was himself a candidate the mummer from the moment that his future colleague aspired to represent the province declared himself his servant and offered to be his guide to the various clubs they visited them or nearly all the red and the blue the furious and the tranquil the puritanical and the licentious the mystical and the intemperate those that had voted for the death of kings and those in which the frauds in the grocery trade had been denounced and everywhere the tenants cursed the landlords the blouse was full of spite against broadcloth and the rich conspired against the poor many wanted indemnities on the ground that they had formerly been martyrs of the police others appealed for money in order to carry out certain inventions or else there were plans of phalansteria projects for cantonal bazaars systems of public felicity then here and there a flash of genius amid these clouds of folly sudden as splashes the law formulated by an oath and flowers of eloquence on the lips of some soldier boy with a shoulder belt strapped over his bare shirtless chest sometimes too a gentleman made his appearance an aristocrat of humble demeanour talking in a plebeian strain and with his hands unwashed so as to make them look hard a patriot recognised him the most virtuous mobbed him and he went off with rage in his soul on the pretext of good sense it was desirable to be always disparaging the advocates and to make use as often as possible of these expressions to carry his stone to the building social problem workshop delmar did not miss the opportunities afforded him for getting in a word and when he no longer found anything to say his device was to plant himself in some conspicuous position with one of his arms akimbo and the other in his waistcoat turning himself round abruptly in profile so as to give a good view of his head then there were outbursts of applause which came from mademoiselle Madnaz at the lower end of the hall frederick in spite of the weakness of orators did not dare to try the experiment of speaking all those people seemed to him too unpolished or too hostile but du sardier made inquiries and informed him that there existed in the rue saint jacques a club which bore the name of the club of intellect such a name gave good reason for hope besides he would bring some friends there he brought those whom he had invited to take punch with him 
the bookkeeper the traveller in wines and the architect even pellerin had offered to come and houssonet would probably form one of the party and on the footpath before the door stood rejambar with two individuals the first of whom was his faithful compagne a rather thick-set man marked with smallpox and with bloodshot eyes and the second an ape-like negro exceedingly hairy and whom he knew only in the character of a patriot from barcelona they passed through a passage and were then introduced into a large room no doubt used by a joiner and with walls still fresh and smelling of plaster four argent lamps were hanging parallel to each other and shed an unpleasant light on a platform at the end of the room there was a desk with a bell underneath it a table representing the rostrum and on each side two others somewhat lower for the secretaries the audience that adorned the benches consisted of old painters of daubs ushers and literary men who could not get their works published in the midst of those lines of paletot with greasy collars could be seen here and there a woman's cap or a workman's linen smock the bottom of the apartment was even full of workmen who had in all likelihood come there to pass away an idle hour and who had been introduced by some speakers in order that they might applaud frederick took care to place himself between du sardier and rejambar who was scarcely seated when he leaned both hands on his walking-stick and his chin on his hands and shut his eyes whilst at the other end of the room delmar stood looking down at the assembly senecal appeared at the president's desk the worthy bookkeeper thought frederick would be pleased at this unexpected discovery it only annoyed him the meeting exhibited great respect for the president he was one who on the twenty fifth of february had desired an immediate organization of labor on the following day at the prado he had declared himself in favor attacking the hotel de ville and as every person at that period took some model for imitation one copied saint just another danton another marat as for him he tried to be like blanqui who imitated robespierre his black gloves and his hair brushed back gave him a rigid aspect exceedingly becoming he opened the proceedings with the declaration of the rights of man and of the citizen a customary act of faith then a vigorous voice struck up barangers souvent near du peuple other voices were raised no no not that la casquette the patriots at the bottom of the apartment began to howl and they sang in chorus the favorite lines of the period doff your hat before my cap kneel before the working man at a word from the president the audience became silent one of the secretaries proceeded to inspect the letters some young men announced that they burned a number of the assemblée nationale every evening in front of the pantheon and they urged on all patriots to follow their example bravo adopted responded the audience the citizen jean jacques langrenou a printer in the rue dauphin would like to have a monument raised to the memory of the martyrs of thermidor michel Evariste, nepomucin ex-professor gave expression to the wish that the european democracy should adopt unity of language a dead language might be used for that purpose as for example improved latin no no latin exclaimed the architect why said the college usher and these two gentlemen engaged in a discussion in which the others also took part each putting in a word of his own for effect and the conversation on this topic soon became so tedious that many went away but a little old man who wore at the top of his prodigiously high forehead a pair of green spectacles asked permission to speak in order to make an important communication it was a memorandum on the assessment of taxes the figures flowed on in a continuous stream as if they were never going to end the impatience of the audience found vent at first in murmurs in whispered talk he allowed nothing to put him out then they began hissing they cat called him senecal called the persons who were interrupting to order the orator went on like a machine it was necessary to catch him by the shoulder in order to stop him the old fellow looked as if he were waking out of a dream and placidly lifting his spectacles said pardon me citizens pardon me i'm going a thousand excuses 
Frederick was disconcerted with the failure of the old man's attempts to read this written statement. He had his own address in his pocket, but an extemporaneous speech would have been preferable. Finally, the president announced that they were about to pass on to the important matter, the electoral question. They would not discuss the big Republican lists. However, the club of intellect had every right, like every other, to form one with all respect for the pashas of the Hôtel de Ville, and the citizens who solicited the popular mandate might set forth their claims. Go on now, said Dussardier, a man in a cassock with woolly hair and a petulant expression on his face, had already raised his hand. He said with a stutter that his name was Du Creteau, priest and agriculturalist, and that he was the author of a work entitled Manures. He was told to send it to a horticultural club. Then a patriot in a blouse climbed up into the rostrum. He was a plebeian with broad shoulders, a big face, very mild-looking, with long black hair. He cast on the assembly an almost voluptuous glance, flung back his head, and finally spreading out his arms. You have repelled Du Criteau, O oh my brothers, and you have done right, but it was not through irreligion, for we are all religious. Many of those present listened open-mouthed with the air of catechumens and in ecstatic attitudes. It is not either because he is a priest, for we too are priests. The workman is a priest, just as the founder of socialism was, the master of us all, Jesus Christ. The time had arrived to inaugurate the kingdom of God. The gospel led directly to 89, after the abolition of slavery, the abolition of the proletariat. They had had the age of hate. The age of love was about to begin. Christianity is the keystone and the foundation of the new edifice. You are making game of us, exclaimed the traveler in wines, who has given me such a priest's cap. This interruption gave great offense. Nearly all the audience got on benches and, shaking their fists, shouted, Atheist, aristocrat, low rascal, whilst the president's bell kept ringing continuously and the cries of order, order, redoubled. But aimless and moreover fortified by three cups of coffee which he had swallowed before coming to the meeting, he struggled in the midst of the others. What? I, an aristocrat, come now. When at length he was permitted to give an explanation, he declared that he would never be at peace with the priests, and since something had just been said about economical measures, it would be a splendid one to put an end to the churches, the sacred pyxes, and finally all creeds. Somebody raised the objection that he was going very far. Yes, I am going very far, but when a vessel is caught suddenly in a storm, without waiting for the conclusion of this simile, another made a reply to his observation. Granted, but this is to demolish at a single stroke like a mason devoid of judgment. You are insulting the masons, yelled a citizen covered with plaster, and persisting in the belief that provocation had been offered to him, he vomited forth insults and wished to fight clinging tightly to the bench whereon he sat. It took no less than three men to put him out. Meanwhile, the workman still remained on the rostrum. The two secretaries gave him an intimation that he should come down. He protested against the injustice done to him. You shall not prevent me from crying out, Eternal love to our dear France, eternal love all to the Republic. Citizens, said Campin, after this, citizens, and by dint of repeating citizens, having obtained a little silence, he leaned on the rostrum with his two red hands, which looked like stumps, bent forward his body, and blinking his eyes, I believe that it would be necessary to give a larger extension to the calf's head. All who heard him kept silence, fancying that they had misunderstood his words. Yes, the calf's head. Three hundred laughs burst forth at the same time. The ceiling shook. At the sight of all these faces, convulsed with mirth, campaign, shrank back he continued in an angry tone what you don't know what the calf's head is it was a paroxysm a delirium they held their sides some of them even tumbled off the benches to the ground with convulsions of laughter campin not being able to stand it any longer took refuge beside rejambar and wanted to drag him away no i am remaining till tis all over said the citizen this reply caused frederick to make up his mind and as he looked about to the right and the left to see whether his friends were prepared to support him, he saw Pellerin on the rostrum in front of him. The artist assumed a haughty tone in addressing the meeting. I would like to get some notion as to who is the candidate amongst all these that represents art. For my part, I have painted a picture. 
we have nothing to do with painting pictures was the churlish remark of a thin man with red spots on his cheekbones bellerin protested against this interruption but the other in a tragic tone ought not the government to make an ordinance abolishing prostitution and want and this phrase having at once won to his side the popular favor he thundered against the corruption of great cities shame and infamy we ought to catch hold of wealthy citizens on their way out of the maison d'or and spit in their faces unless it be that the government countenances debauchery but the collectors of the city dues exhibit towards our daughters and our sisters an amount of indecency a voice exclaimed some distance away this is blackguard language turn him out they extract taxes from us to pay for licentiousness thus the high salaries paid to actors help cried pellerin he leaped from the rostrum pushed everybody aside and declaring that he regarded such stupid accusations with disgust expatiated on the civilizing mission of the player inasmuch as the theatre was the focus of national education he would record his vote for the reform of the theatre and to begin with no more managements no more privileges yes of any sort the actor's performance excited the audience and people moved backwards and forwards knocking each other down no more academies no more institutes no missions no more bachelorships down with university degrees let us preserve them said senecal but let them be conferred by universal suffrage by the people the only true judge besides these things were not the most useful it was necessary to take a level which would be above the heads of the wealthy and he represented them as gorging themselves with crimes under their gilded ceilings while the poor writhing in their garrets with famine cultivated every virtue the applause became so vehement that he interrupted his discourse for several minutes he remained with his eyes closed his head thrown back and as it were lulling himself to sleep over the fury which he had aroused then he began to talk in a dogmatic fashion in phrases as imperious as laws the state should take possession of the banks and of the insurance offices inheritances should be abolished a social fund should be established for the workers many other measures were desirable in the future for the time being these would suffice and returning to the question of the elections we want pure citizens men entirely fresh let some one offer himself frederick arose there was a buzz of approval made by his friends but senecal assuming the attitude of a fourquier tinville began to ask questions as to his christian name and surname his antecedents life and morals frederick answered succinctly and bit his lips senecal asked whether any one saw any impediment to this candidature no no but for his part he saw some all around him bent forward and strained their ears to listen the citizen who was seeking for their support had not delivered a certain sum promised by him for the foundation of a democratic journal moreover on the twenty second of february though he had had sufficient notice on the subject he had failed to be at the meeting place in the place de Pantheon. i swear that he was at the tuileries exclaimed du sardier can you swear to having seen him at the Pantheon? du sardier hung down his head frederick was silent his friends scandalized regarded him with disquietude in any case senecal went on do you know a patriot who will answer to us for your principles i will said dusardier oh this is not enough another frederick turned round to pellerin the artist replied to him with a great number of gestures which meant ah my dear boy they have rejected myself the deuce what would you have thereupon frederick gave rejambar a nudge yes that's true tis time i'm going and rejambar stepped upon the platform then pointing towards the spaniard who had followed him allow me citizens to present to you a patriot from barcelona the patriot made a low bow rolled his gleaming eyes about and with his hand on his heart qui dadanos mucho aprecio el honor that you have bestowed on me however great may be the restra bondad mayor the restra intention i claim the right to speak cried frederick deste que se proclama la constitution de cadiz esa pacto fundamental a las libertades espanolas hasta la ultima revolucion nuestra patria cuenta numerosas y heroicos martires frederick once more made an effort to obtain a hearing but citizens the spaniard went on el martes proximo tendra lugar en la iglesia de la magdalena un servicio funebre 
In fact, this is ridiculous. Nobody understands him. This observation exasperated the audience. Turn him out. Turn him out. Who? I? Asked Frederick. Yourself, said Senecal, majestically. Out with you. He rose to leave in the voice of the Iberian, pursued him. E totus los espanolis descarian ver ali reunis das las disputaciones de los clubs y de la milicia nacional en oración funebre honor of the libertad española y del mundo entero will be pronunciado por un miembro del clero of paris en la sala bon nouvelle honor al pueblo francis qui Ila Maria yo el primero pueblo del mundo sino fuese cuida dano de otra nación. Aristo screamed one blackguard, shaking his fist at Frederick as the latter, boiling with indignation, rushed out into the yard adjoining the place where the meeting was held. He reproached himself for his devotedness without reflecting that, after all, the accusations brought against him were just. What fatal idea was this candidature? But what asses, what idiots, he drew comparisons between himself and these men, and soothed his wounded pride with the thought of their stupidity. Then he felt the need of seeing Rosinette, after such an exhibition of ugly traits and so much magniloquence, her dainty person would be a source of relaxation. She was aware that he had intended to present himself at the club that evening. However, she did not even ask him a single question when he came in. She was sitting near the fire, ripping open the lining of her dress. He was surprised to find her thus occupied. Hello, what are you doing? You can see for yourself, said she dryly. I'm mending my clothes. So much for this republic of yours. Why do you call it mine? Perhaps you want to make out that it's mine and she began to upbraid him for everything that had happened in france for the last two months accusing him of having brought about the revolution and with having ruined her prospects by making everybody that had money leave paris and that she would by and by be dying in a hospital it is easy for you to talk lightly about it with your yearly income however at the rate at which things are going on you won't have your yearly income long that may be said frederick the most devoted or always misunderstood and if one were not sustained by one's conscience the brutes that you mix yourself up with would make you feel disgusted with your own self-denial rosinette gazed at him with knitted brows eh what what self-denial monsieur has not succeeded it would seem so much the better it will teach you to make patriotic donations oh don't lie i know you have given them three hundred francs for this republic of yours has to be kept well amuse yourself with it my good man under this avalanche of abuse frederick passed from his former disappointment to a more painful disillusion he withdrew to the lower end of the apartment she came up to him look here think it out a bit in a country as in a house there must be a master otherwise everyone pockets something out of the money spent at first everybody knows that ledru rollin is head over ears in debt as for le martin how can you expect a poet to understand politics ah tis all very well for you to shake your head and to presume that you have more brains than others all the same what i say is true but you are always cavilling a person can't get in a word with you for instance there's fournier fontaine who had stores at saint roche do you know how much he failed for eight hundred thousand francs and gomer the packer opposite to him another republican that one he smashed the tongs on his wife's head and he drank so much absinthe that he is going to be put into a private asylum that's the way with the whole of them the republicans a republic at twenty five per cent ah yes plume yourself upon it frederick took himself off he was disgusted at the foolishness of this girl which revealed itself all at once in the language of the populace he felt himself even becoming a little patriotic once more the ill temper of rosinette only increased mademoiselle vatnas irritated him with her enthusiasm believing that she had a mission she felt a furious desire to make speeches to carry on disputes and sharper than rosinette in matters of this sort overwhelmed her with arguments one day she made her appearance burning with indignation against Houssonet, who had just indulged in some blackguard remarks at the women's club rosinette approved of this conduct declaring even that she would take men's clothes to go and give them a bit of her mind the entire lot of them and to whip them frederick entered at the same moment you'll accompany me won't you and in spite of his presence a bickering match took place between them one of them playing the part of a citizen's wife and the other of a female philosopher according to rosinette women were born exclusively for love or in order to bring up children to be housekeepers according to mademoiselle Vatnas, women ought to have a position in the government 
in former times the gaulish women and also the anglo-saxon women took part in the legislation the squaws of the hurons formed a portion of the council the work of civilization was common to both it was necessary that all should contribute towards it and that fraternity should be substituted for egoism association for individualism and cultivation on a large scale for minute subdivision of land come that is good you know a great deal about culture just now why not besides it is a question of humanity of its future mind your own business this is my business they got into a passion frederick interposed the badnaz became very heated and went so far as to uphold communism what nonsense said rosenette how could such a thing ever come to pass the other brought forward in support of her theory the examples of the essenes the moravian brethren the jesuits of paraguay the family of the pingans near tears in auvergne and as she gesticulated a great deal her gold chain got entangled in her bundle of trinkets to which was attached a gold ornament in the form of a sheep suddenly rosenette turned exceedingly pale mademoiselle vatnas continued extricating her trinkets don't give yourself so much trouble said rosenette no i know your political opinions what replied the vatnas with a blush on her face like that of a virgin oh oh you understand me frederick did not understand there had evidently been something taking place between them of a more important and intimate character than socialism and even though it should be so said the vatnas in reply rising up unflinchingly tis alone my dear set off one debt against the other faith i don't deny my own debts i owe some thousands of francs a nice sum i borrow at least i don't rob any one mademoiselle vatnas made an effort to laugh oh i would put my hand in the fire for him take care it is dry enough to burn the spinster held out her right hand to her and keeping it raised in front of her but there are friends of yours who find it convenient for them and delusions i suppose as castanets you beggar the marechal made her a low bow there's nobody so charming mademoiselle vatnaus made no reply beads of perspiration appeared on her temples her eyes fixed themselves on the carpet she panted for breath at last she reached the door and slamming it vigorously good night you'll hear from me much i care said rosinette the effort of self-suppression had shattered her nerves she sank down on the divan shaking all over stammering forth words of abuse shedding tears was it this threat on the part of the vatnaz that had caused so much agitation in her mind oh no what did she care indeed about that one it was the golden sheep a present and in the midst of her tears the name of delmar escaped her lips so then she was in love with the mummer in that case why did she take home with me frederick asked himself how is it that he has come back again who compels her to keep me where is the sense of this sort of thing rosinette was still sobbing she remained all the time stretched at the edge of the divan with her right cheek resting on her two hands and she seemed a being so dainty so free from self-consciousness and so sorely troubled that he drew closer to her and softly kissed her on the forehead thereupon she gave him assurances of her affection for him the prince had just left her they would be free but she was for the time being short of money you saw yourself that this was so the other day when i was trying to turn my old linings to use no more equipages now and this was not all the upholsterer was threatening to resume possession of the bedroom and the large drawing-room furniture she did not know what to do frederick had a mind to answer don't annoy yourself about it i will pay but the lady knew how to lie experience had enlightened her he confined himself to mere expressions of sympathy rosinette's fears were not vain it was necessary to give up the furniture and to quit the handsome apartment in the rue through oh she took another on the boulevard poissonniere on the fourth floor the curiosities of her old boudoir were quite sufficient to give to the three rooms a coquettish air there were chinese blinds a tent on the terrace and in the drawing-room a second-hand carpet still perfectly new with ottomans covered with pink silk frederick had contributed largely to these purchases he had felt the joy of a newly married man who possesses at last a house of his own a wife of his own and being much pleased with the place he used to sleep there nearly every evening one morning as he was passing out through the ante-room he saw on the third floor on the staircase the shako of a national guard who was ascending it where in the world was he going frederick waited the man continued his progress up the stairs with his head slightly bent down he raised his eyes it was my lord arnoux the situation was clear they both reddened simultaneously overcome by a feeling of embarrassment common to both arnoux was the first to find a way out of the difficulty she is better isn't that so as if rosinette were ill and he had come to learn how she was frederick took advantage of this opening yes certainly at least so i was told by her maid wishing to convey that they had not been allowed to see her 
then they stood facing each other both undecided as to what they would do next and eyeing one another intently the question now was which of the two was going to remain or knew once more solved the problem pshaw i'll come back by and by where are you going i'll go with you and when they were in the street he chatted as naturally as usual unquestionably he was not a man of jealous disposition or else he was too good-natured to get angry besides his time was devoted to serving his country he never left off his uniform now on the twenty ninth of march he had defended the offices of the press when the chamber was invaded he distinguished himself by his courage and he was at the banquet given to the national guards at amiens Cusinet, who was still on duty with him, availed himself of his flask and his cigars, but irreverent by nature, he delighted in contradicting him, disparaging the somewhat inaccurate style of the decrees, and decrying the conferences at the Luxembourg, the women known as the Vassouvienne, the political section bearing the name of Tyrolean, everything, in fact, down to the car of agriculture drawn by horses to the ox market and escorted by ill-favored young girls. Arnoux, on the other hand, was the upholder of authority and dreamed of uniting the different parties however his own affairs had taken an unfavorable turn and he was more or less anxious about them he was not much troubled about frederick's relations with the marechal for this discovery made him feel justified in his conscience in withdrawing the allowance which he had renewed since the prince had left her he pleaded by way of excuse for this step the embarrassed condition in which he found himself uttered many lamentations and rosinette was generous the result was that m arnoux regarded himself as the lover who appealed entirely to the heart an idea that raised him in his own estimation and made him feel young again having no doubt that frederick was paying the marechal he fancied that he was playing a nice trick on that young man even called at the house in such a stealthy fashion as to keep the other in ignorance of the fact and when they happened to meet left the coast clear for him frederick was not pleased with this partnership and his rival's politeness seemed only an elaborate piece of sarcasm but by taking offence at it he would have removed from his path every opportunity of ever finding his way back to madame arnoux and then this was the only means whereby he could hear about her movements the earthenware dealer in accordance with his usual practice or perhaps with some cunning design recalled her readily in the course of conversation and asked him why he no longer came to see her frederick having exhausted every excuse he could frame assured him that he had called several times to see madame arnoux but without success arnoux was convinced that this was so for he had often referred in an eager tone at home to the absence of their friend and she had invariably replied that she was out when he called so that these two lies in place of contradicting corroborated each other the young man's gentle ways and the pleasure of finding a dupe in him made arnoux like him all the better he carried familiarity to its extreme limits not through disdain but through assurance one day he wrote saying that very urgent business compelled him to be away in the country for twenty-four hours he begged of the young man to mount guard in his stead frederick dared not refuse so he repaired to the guard-house in the place du carousel he had to submit to the society of the national guards and with the exception of a sugar refiner a witty fellow who drank to an inordinate extent they all appeared to him more stupid than their cartridge boxes the principal subject of conversation amongst them was the substitution of sashes for belts others declaimed against the national workshops one man said where are we going the man to whom the words had been addressed opened his eyes as if he were standing on the verge of an abyss where are we going then one who was more daring than the rest exclaimed it cannot last it must come to an end and as the same kind of talk went on till night frederick was bored to death great was his surprise when at eleven o'clock he suddenly beheld an arnoux who immediately explained that he had hurried back to set him at liberty having disposed of his own business the fact was that he had no business to transact the whole thing was an invention to enable him to spend twenty-four hours alone with rosinette but the worthy arnoux had placed too much confidence in his own powers so that now in the state of lassitude which was the result he was seized with remorse he had come to thank frederick and to invite him to have some supper a thousand thanks i'm not hungry all i want is to go to bed a reason the more for having a snack together how flabby you are one does not go home at such an hour as this it is too late it would be dangerous frederick once more yielded arnoux was quite a favorite with his brethren in arms who had not expected to see him and he was a particular crony of the refiner they were all fond of him and he was such a good fellow that he was sorry Houssonet was not there but he wanted to shut his eyes for one minute no longer sit down beside me said he to frederick stretching himself on the camp bed without taking off his belt and straps 
through fear of an alarm in spite of the regulation he even kept his gun in his hand then stammered out some words my darling my little angel and ere long was fast asleep those who had been talking to each other became silent and gradually there was a deep silence in the guard-house frederick tormented by the fleas kept staring about him the wall painted yellow had halfway up a long shelf on which the knapsacks formed a succession of little humps while underneath the muskets which had the colour of lead rose up side by side and there could be heard a succession of snores produced by the national guards whose stomachs were outlined through the darkness in a confused fashion on the top of the stove stood an empty bottle of some plates three straw chairs were drawn around the table on which a pack of cards was displayed a drum in the middle of the bench let its strap hang down a warm breath of air making its way through the door caused the lamp to smoke arnu slept with his two arms wide apart and as his gun was placed in a slightly crooked position with the butt end downward the mouth of the barrel came up right under his arm frederick noticed this and was alarmed but no i'm wrong there's nothing to be afraid of and yet suppose he met his death and immediately pictures unrolled themselves before his mind in endless succession he saw himself with her at night in a post-chaise then on a river's bank on a summer's evening and under the reflection of a lamp at home in their own house he even fixed his attention on household expenses and domestic arrangements contemplating feeling already his happiness between his hands and in order to realize it all that was needed was that the cock of the gun should rise the end of it could be pushed with one's toe the gun would go off it would be a mere accident nothing more end of chapter fourteen part two chapter fourteen of sentimental education this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org sentimental education by gustave flaubert chapter fourteen the barricade part three frederick brooded over this idea like a playwright in the agonies of composition suddenly it seemed to him that it was not far from being carried into practical operation and that he was going to contribute to that result that in fact he was yearning for it and then a feeling of absolute terror took possession of him in the midst of this mental distress he experienced a sense of pleasure and he allowed himself to sink deeper and deeper into it with a dreadful consciousness all the time that his scruples were vanishing in the wildness of his reverie the rest of the world became effaced and he could only realize that he was still alive from the intolerable oppression on his chest let us take a drop of white wine said the refiner as he awoke arnu sprang to his feet and as soon as the white wine was swallowed he wanted to relieve frederick of his sentry duty then he brought him to have breakfast in the rue de chartres at Paris. and as he required to recuperate his energies he ordered two dishes of meat a lobster an omelette with rum a salad etc and finished this off with a brand of sauterne of eighteen nineteen and one of forty two rum manet not to speak of the champagne at dessert and the liqueurs frederick did not in any way gainsay him he was disturbed in mind as if by the thought that the other might somehow trace on his countenance the idea that had lately flitted before his imagination with both elbows on the table and his head bent forward so that he annoyed frederick by his fixed stare he confided some of his hobbies to the young man he wanted to take for farming purposes all the embankments on the northern line in order to plant potatoes there or else to organize on the boulevards a monster cavalcade in which the celebrities of the period would figure he would let all the windows which would at the rate of three francs for each person produce a handsome profit in short he dreamed of a great stroke of fortune by means of a monopoly he assumed a moral tone nevertheless found fault with excesses 
and all sorts of misconduct spoke about his poor father and every evening as he said made an examination of his conscience before offering his soul to god a little curacao eh just as you please as for the republic things would right themselves in fact he looked on himself as the happiest man on earth and forgetting himself he exalted rosinette's attractive qualities and even compared her with his wife it was quite a different thing you could not imagine a lovelier person your health frederick touched glasses with him he had out of complacence drunk a little too much besides the strong sunlight dazzled him and when they went up the rue vivienne together again their shoulders touched each other in a fraternal fashion when he got home frederick slept till seven o'clock after that he called on the marechal she had gone out with somebody with arnoux perhaps not knowing what to do with himself he continued his promenade along the boulevard but could not get past the port st martin owing to the great crowd that blocked the way want had abandoned to their own resources a considerable number of workmen and they used to come there every evening no doubt for the purpose of holding a review and awaiting a signal in spite of the law against riotous assemblies these clubs of despair increased to a frightful extent and many citizens repaired every day to the spot through bravado and because it was the fashion all of a sudden frederick caught a glimpse three paces away of m d'ambreuse along with martinon he turned his head away for m d'ambreuse having got himself nominated as a representative of the people he cherished a secret spite against him but the capitalist stopped him one word my dear monsieur i've some explanations to make to you i'm not asking you for any pray listen to me it was not his fault in any way appeals had been made to him pressure had to a certain extent been placed on him martinon immediately endorsed all that he had said some of the electors of Nogent had presented themselves in a deputation at his house besides i expected to be free as soon as a crush of people on the footpath forced m d'ambreuse to get out of the way a minute after he reappeared saying to martinon this is a genuine service really and you won't have any reason to regret all three stood with their backs resting against a shop in order to be able to chat more at their ease from time to time there was a cry of long live napoleon long live barbet down with marie the countless throng kept talking in very loud tones and all these voices echoing through the houses made so to speak the continuous ripple of waves in a harbour at intervals they ceased and then could be heard voices singing the marseillaise under the court gates men of mysterious aspect offered sword sticks to those who passed sometimes two individuals one of whom preceded the other would wink and then quickly hurry away the footpaths were filled with groups of staring idlers a dense crowd swayed to and fro on the pavement entire bands of police officers emerging from the alleys had scarcely made their way into the midst of the multitude when they were swallowed up in the mass of people little red flags here and there looked like flames coachmen from the place where they sat high up gesticulated energetically and then turned to go back it was a case of perpetual movement one of the strangest sights that could be conceived how all this said martinon would have amused mademoiselle cecile my wife as you are aware does not like my niece to come with us returned m dambrus with a smile one could scarcely recognize in him the same man for the past three months he had been crying long live the republic and he had even voted in favor of the banishment of orleans but there should be an end of concessions he exhibited his rage so far as to carry a tomahawk in his pocket martinon had one too the magistracy not being any longer irremovable he had withdrawn from parquet so that he surpassed monsieur d'ambreuse in his display of violence 
the banker had a special antipathy to lamartine for having supported le rue rollin and at the same time to pierre le rue prudent considerant lamennais and all the cranks all the socialists for in fact what is it they want the duty on meat and arrest for debt have been abolished now the project of a bank for mortgages is under consideration the other day it was a national bank and here are five millions in the budget for the working men but luckily it is over thanks to monsieur de valou good-bye to them let them go in fact not knowing how to maintain the three hundred thousand men in the national workshops the minister of public works had that very day signed an order inviting all citizens between the ages of eighteen and twenty to take service as soldiers or else to start for the provinces to cultivate the ground there they were indignant at the alternative thus put before them convinced that the object was to destroy the republic they were aggrieved by the thought of having to live at a distance from the capital as if it were a kind of exile they saw themselves dying of fevers in desolate parts of the country to many of them moreover who had been accustomed to work of a refined description agriculture seemed a degradation it was in short a mockery a decisive breach of all the promises which had been made to them if they offered any resistance force would be employed against them they had no doubt of it and made preparations to anticipate it about nine o'clock the riotous assemblies which had formed at the bastille and at the chatelet ebbed back towards the boulevard from the port st denis to the port st martin nothing could be seen save an enormous swarm of people a single mass of a dark blue shade nearly black the men of whom one caught a glimpse all had glowing eyes pale complexions faces emaciated with hunger and excited with a sense of wrong meanwhile some clouds had gathered the tempestuous sky roused the electricity that was in the people and they kept whirling about of their own accord with the great swaying movements of a swelling sea and one felt that there was an incalculable force in the depths of this excited throng and as it were the energy of an element then they all began exclaiming lamps lamps many windows had no illumination and stones were flung at the panes m d'ambrouze deemed it prudent to withdraw from the scene the two young men accompanied him home he predicted great disasters the people might once more invade the chamber and on this point he told them how he should have been killed on the fifteenth of may had it not been for the devotion of a national guard but i had forgotten he is a friend of yours your friend the earthware manufacturer jacques arnoux the rioters had been actually throttling him when that brave citizen caught him in his arms and put him safely out of their reach so it was that since then there had been a kind of intimacy between them it would be necessary one of these days to dine together and since you often see him give him the assurance that i like him very much he is an excellent man and has in my opinion been slandered and he has his wits about him in the morning my compliments once more a very good evening frederick after he had quitted m dambrus went back to the marechal and in a very gloomy fashion said that she should choose between him and arnoux she replied that she did not understand dumps of this sort that she did not care about arnoux and had no desire to cling to him frederick was thirsting to fly from paris she did not offer any opposition to this whim and next morning they set out for fontainebleau the hotel at which they stayed could be distinguished from others by a fountain that rippled in the middle of the courtyard attached to it the doors of the various apartments opened out on a corridor as in monasteries the room assigned to them was large well furnished hung with print and noiseless owing to the scarcity of tourists alongside the houses people who had nothing to do kept passing up and down then under their windows when the day was declining children in the street would engage in a game of base and this tranquillity following so soon the tumult they had witnessed in paris filled them with astonishment and exercised over them a soothing influence every morning at an early hour they went to pay a visit to the chateau 
as they passed in through the gate they had a view of its entire front with the five pavilions covered with sharp pointed roofs and its staircase of horseshoe shape opening out to the end of the courtyard which is hemmed in to right and left by two main portions of the building further down on the paved ground lichens blended their colours here and there with the tawny hue of bricks and the entire appearance of the palace rust-coloured like old armour had about it something of the impassiveness of royalty a sort of warlike melancholy grandeur at last a man-servant made his appearance with a bunch of keys in his hand he first showed them the apartments of the queens the pope's oratory the gallery of francis i the mahogany table on which the emperor signed his abdication and in one of the rooms cut into the old galerie des cerfs the place where christine got moldan deshi assassinated rosinette listened to this narrative attentively then turning towards frederick no doubt it was through jealousy mind yourself after this they passed through the council chamber the guards room the throne room and the drawing room of louis the thirteenth the end curtain window sent forth a white light the handles of the window fastenings and the copper feet of the pier tables were slightly tarnished with dust the armchairs were everywhere hidden under coarse linen covers above the doors could be seen reliquaries of louis the fourteenth and here and there hangings representing the gods of olympus psyche or the battles of alexander as she was passing in front of the mirrors rosinette stopped for a moment to smooth her headbands after passing through the dojon court and the saint sarnin chapel they reached the festal hall they were dazzled by the magnificence of the ceiling which was divided into octagonal apartments set off with gold and silver more finely chiselled than a jewel and by the vast number of paintings covering the walls from the immense chimney-piece where the arms of france were surrounded by crescents and quivers down to the musicians gallery which had been erected at the other end along the entire width of the hall the ten arched windows were wide open the sun threw its lustre on the pictures so that they glowed beneath its rays the blue sky continued in an endless curve the ultramarine of the arches and from the depths of the woods where the lofty summits of the trees filled up the horizon there seemed to come an echo of flourishes blown by ivory trumpets and mythological ballets gathering together under the foliage princesses and nobles disguised as nymphs or fauns an epoch of ingenious science of violent passions and sumptuous art when the idea was to sweep away the world in a vision of the hesperides and when the mistresses of kings mingled their glory with the stars there was a portrait of one of the most beautiful of these celebrated women in the form of diana the huntress and even the infernal diana no doubt in order to indicate the power which she possessed even beyond the limits of the tomb all these symbols confirmed her glory and there remained about the spot something of her an indistinct voice a radiation that stretched out indefinitely a feeling of mysterious retrospective voluptuousness took possession of frederick in order to divert these passionate longings into another channel he began to gaze tenderly on rosinette and asked her would she not like to have been this woman what woman diane de poitiers he repeated diane de poitiers the mistress of henry the second she gave utterance to a little ah that was all her silence clearly demonstrated that she knew nothing about the matter and had failed to comprehend his meaning so that out of complacence he said to her perhaps you are getting tired of this no no quite the reverse and lifting up her chin and casting around her a glance of the vaguest description rosinette let these words escape her lips it recalls some memories to me meanwhile it was easy to trace on her countenance a strained expression a certain sense of awe and as this air of gravity made her look all the prettier frederick overlooked it the carp's pan amused her more for a quarter of an hour she kept flinging pieces of bread into the water in order to see the fishes skipping about frederick had seated himself by her side under the linden trees he saw in imagination all the personages who had haunted these walls charles v the valois kings henry the fourth peter the great jean jacques rousseau and the fair mourners of the stage boxes voltaire napoleon pius the seventh and louis philippe and he felt himself environed elbowed by these tumultuous dead people 
he was stunned by such a confusion of historic figures even though he found a certain fascination in contemplating them nevertheless at length they descended into the flower garden it is a vast rectangle which presents to the spectator at the first glance its wide yellow walks its square grass plots its ribbons of boxwood its yew trees shaped like pyramids its low-lying green swards and its narrow borders in which thinly sown flowers make spots on the grey soil at the end of the garden may be seen a park through whose entire length the canal makes its way royal residences have attached to them a peculiar kind of melancholy due no doubt to their dimensions being much too large for the limited number of guests entertained within them to the silence which one feels astonished to find in them after so many flourishes of trumpets to the immobility of their luxurious furniture which attests by the aspect of age and decay it gradually assumes the transitory character of dynasties the eternal wretchedness of all things and this exhalation of the centuries enervating and funereal like the perfume of a mummy makes itself felt even in untutored brains rosinette yawned and moderately they went back to the hotel after their breakfast an open carriage came round for them they started from fontainebleau at a point where several roads diverged then went up at a walking pace a gravelly road leading towards a little pine wood the trees became larger and from time to time the driver would say this is the frere si à moi the ferrement the bouquet de rat not forgetting a single one of these notable sights sometimes even drawing up to enable them to admire the scene they entered the forests of franchar the carriage glided over the grass like a sledge pigeons which they could not see began cooing suddenly the waiter of a cafe made his appearance and they alighted before it, the railing of a garden in which a number of round tables were placed then passing on the left by the walls of a ruined abbey they made their way over big boulders of stone and soon reached the lower part of the gorge it is covered on one side with sandstones and juniper trees tangled together while on the other side the ground almost quite bare slopes toward the hollow of the valley where a foot-track makes a pale line through the brown heather and far above could be traced a flat cone-shaped summit with a telegraph tower behind it half an hour later they stepped out of the vehicle once more in order to climb the heights of Aspremont. the roads form zigzags between the thick set pine trees under rocks with angular faces all this corner of the forest has a sort of choked-up look a rather wild and solitary aspect one thinks of hermits in connection with the companions of huge stags with fiery crosses between their horns who were one to welcome with paternal smiles the good kings of france when they knelt before their grottoes the warm air was filled with a resinous odour and roots of trees crossed one another like veins close to the soil rosinette slipped over them grew dejected and felt inclined to shed tears but at the very top she became joyous once more on finding under a roof made of branches a sort of tavern where carved wood was sold she drank a bottle of lemonade and bought a holly stick and without one glance towards the landscape which disclosed itself from the plateau she entered the brigand's cave with a waiter carrying a torch in front of her their carriage was awaiting them in the bas bro a painter in a blue blouse was working at the foot of an oak tree with his box of colours on his knees he raised his head and watched them as they passed in the middle of the hill of chailly the sudden breaking of a cloud caused them to turn up the hoods of their cloaks almost immediately the rain stopped and the paving stones of the street glistened under the sun when they were re-entering the town some travellers who had recently arrived informed them that a terrible battle had stained paris with blood rosinette and her lover were not surprised then everybody left the hotel became quiet the gas was put out and they were lulled to sleep by the murmur of the fountain in the courtyard on the following day they went to see the wolf's gorge the fairies pool the long rock and the marlut two days later they began again at random just as their coachman thought fit to drive them without asking where they were and often even neglecting the famous sights they felt so comfortable in their old landau low as a sofa and covered with a rug made of a striped material which was quite faded the moats filled with brushwood stretched out under their eyes with a gentle continuous movement white rays passed like arrows through the tall ferns 
sometimes a road that was no longer used presented itself before them in a straight line and here and there might be seen a feeble growth of weeds in the centre between four crossroads a crucifix extended its four arms in other places stakes were bending down like dead trees and little curved paths which were lost under the leaves made them feel a longing to pursue them at the same moment the horse turned round they entered there they plunged into the mire further down moss had sprouted out at the sides of the deep ruts they believed that they were far away from all other people quite alone but suddenly a gamekeeper with his gun or a band of women in rags with big bundles of faggots on their backs would hurry past them when the carriage stopped there was a universal silence the only sounds that reached them were the blowing of the horse in the shafts with the faint cry of a bird more than once repeated the light at certain points illuminating the outskirts of the wood left the interior in deep shadow or else attenuated in the foreground by a sort of twilight it exhibited in the background violet vapours a white radiance the midday sun falling directly on the wide tracks of greenery made splashes of light over them hung gleaming drops of silver from the ends of the branches streaked the grass with long lines of emeralds and flung gold spots on the beds of dead leaves when they let their heads fall back they could distinguish the sky through the tops of the trees some of them which were enormously high looked like patriarchs or emperors or touching one another at their extremities formed with their long shafts as it were triumphal arches others sprouting forth obliquely from below seemed like falling columns this heap of big vertical lines gaped open then enormous green billows unrolled themselves in unequal embossments as far as the surface of the valleys towards which advanced the brows of other hills looking down on white plains which ended by losing themselves in an undefined pale tinge standing side by side on some rising ground they felt as they drank in the air the pride of a life more free penetrating into the depths of their souls with a superabundance of energy a joy which they could not explain the variety of trees furnished a spectacle of the most diversified character the beeches with their smooth white bark twisted their tops together ash trees softly curved their bluish branches in the tufts of the horn beams rose up holly stiff as bronze then came a row of thin birches bent into elegiac attitudes and the pine trees symmetrical as organ pipes seemed to be singing a song as they swayed to and fro there were gigantic oaks with knotted forms which had been violently shaken stretched themselves out from the soil and pressed close against each other and with firm trunks resembling torsos launched forth to heaven despairing appeals with their bare arms and furious threats like a group of titans struck motionless in the midst of their rage an atmosphere of gloom a feverish languor brooded over the pools whose sheets of water were cut into flakes by the overshadowing thorn trees the lichens on their banks where the wolves come to drink are of the colour of sulphur burnt as it were by the footprints of witches and the incessant croaking of the frogs responds to the cawing of the crows as they wheel through the air after this they passed through the monotonous glades planted here and there with a staddle the sound of iron falling with a succession of rapid blows could be heard on the side of the hill a group of quarrymen were breaking the rocks these rocks became more and more numerous and finally filled up the entire landscape cube shaped like houses flat like flagstones propping up overhanging and became intermingled with each other as if they were the ruins unrecognizable and monstrous of some vanished city but the wild chaos they exhibited made one rather dream of volcanoes of deluges of great unknown cataclysms frederick said they had been there since the beginning of the world and would remain so till the end rosinette turned aside her head declaring that this would drive her out of her mind and went off to collect sweet heather the little violet blossoms heaped up near one another formed unequal plates and the soil which was giving way underneath placed soft dark fringes on the sand spangled with mica one day they reached a point halfway up a hill where the soil was full of sand its surface untrodden till now was streaked so as to resemble symmetrical waves here and there like promontories on the dry bed of an ocean rose up rocks with the vague outlines of animals tortoises thrusting forward their heads crawling seals hippopotami and bears not a soul around them not a single sound 
the shingle glowed under the dazzling rays of the sun and all at once in this vibration of light the specimens of the brute creation that met their gaze began to move about they returned home quickly flying from the dizziness that had seized hold of them almost dismayed the gravity of the forest exercised an influence over them and hours passed in silence during which allowing themselves to yield to the lulling effects of springs they remained as it were sunk in the torpor of a calm intoxication with his arm around her waist he listened to her talking while the birds were warbling noticed with the same glance the black grapes on her bonnet and the juniper berries the draperies of her veil and the spiral forms assumed by the clouds and when he bent towards her the freshness of her skin mingled with the strong perfume of the woods they found amusement in everything they showed one another as a curiosity gossamer threads of the virgin hanging from bushes holes full of water in the middle of stones a squirrel on the branches the way in which two butterflies kept flying after them or else at twenty paces from them under the trees a hind strode on peacefully with an air of nobility and gentleness its doe walking by its side rosinette would have liked to run after it to embrace it she got very much alarmed once when a man suddenly presenting himself showed her three vipers in a box she wildly flung herself on frederick's breast he felt happy at the thought that she was weak and that he was strong enough to defend her that evening they dined at an inn on the banks of the seine the table was near the windows rosinette sitting opposite him and he contemplated her little well-shaped white nose her turned-up lips her bright eyes the swelling bands of her nut-brown hair and her pretty oval face her dress of raw silk clung to her somewhat drooping shoulders and her two hands emerging from their sleeves joined close together as if they were one carved poured out wine moved over the tablecloth the waiters placed before them a chicken with his four limbs stretched out a stew of eels in a dish of pipe clay wine that had got spoiled bread that was too hard and knives with notches in them all these things made the repast more enjoyable and strengthened the illusion they fancied that they were in the middle of a journey in italy on their honeymoon before starting again they went for a walk along the bank of the river the soft blue sky rounded like a dome leaned at the horizon on the indentations of the woods on the opposite side at the end of the meadow there was a village steeple and further away to the left the roof of a house made a red spot of the river which wound its way without any apparent motion some rushes bent over it however and the water lightly shook some poles fixed at its edge in order to hold nets an osier bow net and two or three old fishing boats might be seen there near the inn a girl in a straw hat was drawing buckets out of a well every time they came up again frederick heard the grating sound of the chain with a feeling of inexpressible delight he had no doubt that he would be happy till the end of his days so natural did his felicity appear to him so much a part of his life and so intimately associated with this woman's being he was irresistibly impelled to address her with words of endearment she answered with pretty little speeches light taps on the shoulder displays of tenderness that charmed him by their unexpectedness he discovered in her quite a new sort of beauty in fact which was perhaps only the reflection of surrounding things unless it happened to bud forth from their hidden potentialities when they were lying down in the middle of the field he would stretch himself out with his head on her lap under the shelter of her parasol or else with their faces turned towards the green sward in the centre of which they rested they kept gazing towards one another so that their pupils seemed to intermingle thirsting for one another and ever satiating their thirst and then with half-closed eyelids they lay side by side without uttering a single word now and then the distant rolling of a drum reached their ears it was the signal drum which was being beaten in the different villages calling on the people to go and defend paris oh look here tis the rising said frederick with a disdainful pity all this excitement now presenting to his mind a pitiful aspect by the sight of their love and of eternal nature and they talked about whatever happened to come into their heads things that were perfectly familiar to them persons in whom they took no interest a thousand trifles she chatted with him about her chambermaid and her hairdresser 
One day she was so self-forgetful that she told him her age, twenty-nine years. She was becoming quite an old woman. Several times without intending it, she gave him some particulars with reference to her own life. She had been a shop girl, had taken a trip to England, and had begun studying for the stage. All this she told without any explanation of how these changes had come about, and he found it impossible to reconstruct her entire history. She related to him more about herself one day when they were seated side by side under a plane tree at the back of a meadow. At the roadside further down, a little barefooted girl standing amid a heap of dust was making a cow go to pasture. As soon as she caught sight of them, she came up to beg, and while with one hand she held up her tattered petticoat, she kept scratching with the other her black hair, which, like a wig of Louis the Fourteenth's time, curled round her dark face, lighted by a magnificent pair of eyes. "'She will be very pretty by and by,' said Frederick. "'How lucky she is, if she has no mother,' remarked Rosanette. "'Eh? How is that?' "'Certainly I, if it were not for mine.' She sighed and began to speak about her childhood. Her parents were weavers in the Croix Rousse. She acted as an apprentice to her father. In vain did the poor man wear himself out with hard work. His wife was continually abusing him and sold everything for drink. Rosanette could see, as if it were yesterday, the room they occupied with the looms ranged lengthwise against the windows, the pot boiling on the stove, the bed painted like mahogany, a cupboard facing it, and the obscure loft where she used to sleep up to the time when she was fifteen years old. At length the gentleman made his appearance on the scene, a fat man with a face of the color of boxwood, the manners of a devotee, and a suit of black clothes. Her mother and this man had a conversation together, with the result that three days afterwards Rosanette stopped him with a look in which there was as much bitterness as shamelessness. It was done. Then, in response to a gesture of Frederick, as he was married, he would have been afraid of compromising himself in his own house. I was brought to a private room in a restaurant and told that I would be happy, that I would get a handsome present. At the door, the first thing that struck me was a candelabra of vermilion on a table on which there were two covers. A mirror on the ceiling showed their reflections, and the blue silk hangings on the walls made the entire apartment resemble an alcove. I was seized with astonishment. You understand a poor creature who had never seen anything before. In spite of my day's condition of mind, I got frightened. I wanted to go away. However, I remained. The only seat in the room was a sofa close beside the table. It was so soft that it gave way under me. The mouth of the hot air stove in the middle of the carpet sent out towards me a warm breath, and there I sat without taking anything. The waiter who was standing near me urged me to eat. He poured out for me immediately a large glass of wine. My head began to swim. I wanted to open the window. He said to me, No, mademoiselle, that is forbidden, and he left me. The table was covered with a heap of things that I had no knowledge of. Nothing there seemed to me good. Then I fell back on a pot of jam and patiently waited. I did not know what prevented him from coming. It was very late, midnight at last. I couldn't bear the fatigue any longer. While pushing aside one of the pillows in order to hear better, I found under my hand a kind of album, a book of engravings. They were vulgar pictures. I was sleeping on top of it when he entered the room. She hung down her head and remained pensive. The leaves rustled around them. Amid the tangled grass, a great foxglove was swaying to and fro. The sunlight flowed like a wave over the green expanse, and the silence was interrupted at intervals by the browsing of the cow, which they could no longer see. Rosanette kept her eyes fixed on a particular spot three paces away from her, her nostrils heaving, and her mind absorbed in thought. Frederick caught hold of her hand. "'How you suffered, poor darling!' "'Yes,' said she, "'more than you imagine.' so much so that i wanted to make an end of it they had to fish me up what ah think no more about it i love you i'm happy kiss me and she picked off one by one the sprigs of the thistles which clung to the hem of her gown frederick was thinking more than all on what she had not told him what were the means by which she had gradually emerged from wretchedness to what lover did she owe her education what had occurred in her life down to the day when he first came to her house. Her latest avowal was a bar 
to these questions all he asked her was how she had made our news acquaintance through the vatnas wasn't did you that i once saw with both of them at the palais royal he referred to the exact date rosenet made a movement which showed a sense of deep pain yes it is true i was not gay at that time but Arnu had proved himself a very good fellow frederick had no doubt of it however their friend was a queer character full of faults he took care to recall them she quite agreed with him on this point never mind one likes him all the same this camel still even now said frederick she began to redden half smiling half angry oh no that's an old story i don't keep anything hidden from you even though it might be so with him it is different besides i don't think you are nice towards your victim my victim rosenette caught hold of his chin no doubt and in the lisping fashion in which nurses talk to babies have always been so good never went a bye-bye with his wife i never at any time rosenette smiled he felt hurt by this smile of hers which seemed to him a proof of indifference but she went on gently and with one of those looks which seemed to appeal for a denial of the truth are you perfectly certain not a doubt of it frederick solemnly declared on his word of honour that he had never bestowed a thought on madame arnoux as he was too much in love with another woman why with you my beautiful one ah don't laugh at me you only annoy me he thought it a prudent course to invent a story to pretend that he was swayed by a passion he manufactured some circumstantial details this woman however had rendered him very unhappy decidedly you have not been lucky said rosinette oh oh i may have been wishing to convey in this way that he had been often fortunate in his love affairs so that she might have a better opinion of him just as rosinette did not avow how many lovers she had had in order that he might have more respect for her for there will always be found in the midst of the most intimate confidences restrictions false shame delicacy and pity you divine either in the other or in yourself precipices or miry paths which prevent you from penetrating any farther moreover you feel that you will not be understood it is hard to express accurately the thing you mean whatever it may be and this is the reason why perfect unions are rare end of chapter fourteen part three chapter fourteen of sentimental education this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org sentimental education by gustave flaubert chapter fourteen part four the poor marechal had never known one better than this often when she gazed at frederick tears came into her eyes then she would raise them or cast a glance towards the horizon as if she saw there some bright dawn perspectives of boundless felicity at last she confessed one day to him that she wished to have a mass said so that it might bring a blessing on our love how was it then that she had resisted him so long she could not tell herself he repeated his question a great many times and she replied as she clasped him in her arms it was because i was afraid my darling of loving you too well on sunday morning frederick read amongst the list of the wounded given in a newspaper the name of du sardier he uttered a cry and showing the paper to rosinette declared that he was going to start at once for paris for what purpose in order to see him to nurse him you are not going i'm sure to leave me by myself come with me ha ah, to poke my nose in a squabble of that sort oh no thanks however i cannot ta 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 as if they had need of nurses in the hospitals and then what concern is he of yours any longer every one for himself he was roused to indignation by this egoism on her part and he reproached himself for not being in the capital with the others such indifference to the misfortunes of the nation had in it something shabby and only worthy of a small shopkeeper and now all of a sudden 
his intrigue with rosinette weighed on his mind as if it were a crime for an hour they were quite cool towards each other then she appealed to him to wait and not expose himself to danger suppose you happen to be killed well i should only have done my duty rosinette gave a jump his first duty was to love her but no doubt he did not care about her any longer there was no common sense in what he was going to do good heavens what an idea frederick rang for his bill but to get back to paris was not an easy matter the la loire stage cope had just left at the lacan berlins would not be starting the diligence from bourg bonnet would not be passing till a late hour that night and perhaps it might be full one could never tell when he had lost a great deal of time in making inquiries about the various modes of conveyance the idea occurred to him to travel post the master of the post-house refused to supply him with horses as frederick had no passport finally he hired an open carriage the same one in which they had driven about the country and at about five o'clock they arrived in front of the hotel du commerce at milan the market-place was covered with piles of arms the prefect had forbidden the national guards to proceed towards paris those who did not belong to his department wished to go on there was a great deal of shouting and the inn was packed with a noisy crowd rosinette seized with terror said she would not go a step further and once more begged of him to stay the innkeeper and his wife joined in her entreaties a decent sort of man who happened to be dining there interposed and observed that the fighting would be over in a very short time besides one ought to do his duty thereupon the marechal redoubled her sobs frederick got exasperated he handed her his purse kissed her quickly and disappeared on reaching cobeille he learned at the station that the insurgents had cut the rails at regular distances and the coachman refused to drive him any farther he said that his horses were overspent through his influence however frederick managed to procure an indifferent cabriolet which for the sum of sixty francs without taking into account the price of a drink for the driver was to convey him as far as the italian barrier but at a hundred paces from the barrier his coachman made him descend and turn back frederick was walking along the pathway when suddenly a sentinel thrust out his bayonet four men seized him exclaiming this is one of them look out search him brigand scoundrel and he was so thoroughly stupefied that he let himself be dragged to the guard-house of the barrier at the very point where the boulevard des gobelins and de l'hôpital and rue godefroy and montfetard converge four barricades formed at the ends of four different ways enormous sloping ramparts of paving stones torches were glimmering here and there in spite of the rising clouds of dust he could distinguish foot-soldiers of the line and national guards all with their faces blackened their chests uncovered and an aspect of wild excitement they had just captured the square and had shot down a number of men their rage had not yet cooled frederick said he had come from fontainebleau to the relief of a wounded comrade who lodged in the rue belafonte not one of them would believe him at first they examined his hands they even put their noses to his ear to make sure that he did not smell of powder however by dint of repeating the same thing he finally satisfied a captain who directed to fusilier to conduct him to the guard-house of the jardin des plans they descended the boulevard de l'hôpital a strong breeze was blowing it restored him to animation after this they turned with the rue de marche aux chevaux the jardin des plans at the right formed a long black mass whilst at the left the entire front of the pitié illuminated at every window blazed like a conflagration and shadows passed rapidly over the window panes the two men in charge of frederick went away another accompanied him to the polytechnic school the rue saint victor was quite dark without a gas lamp or a light at any window to relieve the gloom every ten minutes could be heard the words sentinels mind yourselves and this exclamation cast into the midst of the silence was prolonged like the repeated striking of a stone against the side of a chasm as it falls through space every now and then the stamp of heavy footsteps could be heard drawing nearer this was nothing less than a patrol consisting of about a hundred men 
from this confused mass escaped whisperings and the dull clanking of iron and moving away with a rhythmic swing it melted into the darkness in the middle of the crossing where several streets met a dragoon sat motionless on his horse from time to time an express rider passed at a rapid gallop then the silence was renewed cannons which were being drawn along the streets made on the pavement a heavy rolling sound that seemed full of menace a sound different from every ordinary sound which oppressed the heart the sounds was profound unlimited a black silence men in white blouses accosted the soldiers spoke one or two words to them and then vanished like phantoms the guardhouse of the polytechnic school overflowed with people the threshold was blocked up with women who had come to see their sons or their husbands they were sent on to the pantheon which had been transformed into a dead house and no attention was paid to frederick he pressed forward resolutely solemnly declaring that his friend de sardier was waiting for him that he was at death's door at last they sent a corporal to accompany him to the top of the rue saint jacques to the mayor's office in the twelfth arrondissement the place du pantheon was filled with soldiers lying asleep on straw the day was breaking the bivouac fires were extinguished the insurrection had left terrible traces in this quarter the soil of the streets from one end to the other was covered with risings of various sizes on the wrecked barricades had been piled up omnibuses gas pipes and cartwheels in certain places there were little dark pools which must have been blood the houses were riddled with projectiles and their framework could be seen under the plaster that was peeled off window blinds each attached only by a single nail hung like rags the staircases having fallen in doors opened on vacancy the interiors of rooms could be perceived with their papers in strips in some instances dainty objects had remained in them quite intact frederick noticed a timepiece a parrot stick and some engravings when he entered the mayor's office the national guards were chattering without a moment's pause about the deaths of brea and negre eh? about the deputy charbonnel and about the archbishop of paris he heard them saying that the duc d'aumal had landed at boulogne that barbet had fled from vincennes that the artillery were coming up from bourges and that abundant aid was arriving from the provinces about three o'clock someone brought good news true spares from the insurgents were in conference with the president of the assembly thereupon they all made merry and as he had a dozen francs left frederick sent for a dozen bottles of wine hoping by this means to hasten his deliverance suddenly a discharge of musketry was heard the drinking stopped they peered with distrustful eyes into the unknown it might be henry v in order to get rid of responsibility they took frederick to the mayor's office in the eleventh arrondissement which he was not permitted to leave till nine o'clock in the morning he started at a running pace from the quai voltaire at an open window an old man in his shirt and sleeves was crying with his eyes raised the seine glided peacefully along the sky was of a clear blue and in the trees round the tuileries birds were singing frederick was just crossing the place du carousel when a litter happened to be passing by the soldiers at the guard-house immediately presented arms and the officer putting his hand to his shako said honor to unfortunate bravery this phrase seemed to have almost become a matter of duty he who pronounced it appeared to be on each occasion filled with profound emotion a group of people in a state of fierce excitement followed the litter exclaiming we will avenge you we will avenge you the vehicles kept moving about on the boulevard and women were making lint before the doors meanwhile the outbreak had been quelled or very nearly so a proclamation from convignac just posted up announced the fact at the top of the rue vivienne a company of the garde mobile appeared then the citizens uttered cries of enthusiasm they raised their hats applauded danced wished to embrace them and to invite them to drink and flowers flung by ladies fell from the balconies at last at ten o'clock at the moment when the cannon was booming as an attack was being made on the faubourg saint antoine frederick reached the abode of dusardier he found the bookkeeper in his garret lying asleep on his back from the adjoining apartment a woman came forth with silent tread mademoiselle vatnaz she led frederick aside and explained to him how dusardier had got wounded on saturday on the top of a barricade in the rue lafayette a young fellow wrapped in a tricolored flag cried out to the national guards are you going to shoot your brothers as they advanced dusardier threw down his gun 
pushed away the others sprang over the barricade and with the blow of an old shoe knocked down the insurgent from whom he tore the flag he had afterwards been found under a heap of rubbish with a slug of copper in his thigh it was found necessary to make an incision in order to extract the projectile mademoiselle vatnaz arrived the same evening and since then had not quitted his side she intelligently prepared everything that was needed for the dressings assisted him in taking his medicine or other liquids attended to his slightest wishes left and returned again with footsteps more light than those of a fly and gazed at him with eyes full of tenderness frederick during the two following weeks did not fail to come back every morning one day while he was speaking about the devotion of the vatnaz dusardier shrugged his shoulders oh no she does this through interested motives do you think so he replied i'm sure of it without seeming disposed to give any further explanation she had loaded him with kindnesses carrying her attention so far as to bring him the newspapers in which his gallant action was extolled he even confessed to frederick that he felt uneasy in his conscience perhaps he ought to have put himself on the other side with the men in blouses for indeed a heap of promises had been made to them which had not been carried out those who had vanquished them hated the republic and in the next place they had treated them very harshly no doubt they were in the wrong not quite however and the honest fellow was tormented by the thought that he might have fought against the righteous cause senecal who was mured in the tuileries under the terrace at the water's edge had none of this mental anguish there were nine hundred men in the place huddled together in the midst of filth without the slightest order their faces blackened with powder and clotted blood shivering with ague and breaking out into cries of rage and those who were brought there to die were not separated from the rest sometimes on hearing the sound of a detonation they believed that they were all going to be shot then they dashed themselves against the walls and after that fell back again into their places so much stupefied by suffering that it seemed to them that they were living in a nightmare a mournful hallucination the lamp which hung from the arched roof looked like a stain of blood and little green and yellow flames fluttered about caused by the emanations from the vault through fear of epidemics a commission was appointed when he had advanced a few steps the president recoiled frightened by the stench from the excrements and from the corpses as soon as the prisoners drew near a vent hall the national guards who were on sentry in order to prevent them from shaking the bars of the grating prodded them indiscriminately with their bayonets as a rule they showed no pity those who were not beaten wished to signalize themselves there was a regular outbreak of fear they avenged themselves at the same time on newspapers clubs mobs speech-making everything that had exasperated them during the last three months and in spite of the victory that had been gained equality as if for the punishment of its defenders and the exposure of its enemies to ridicule manifested itself in a triumphal fashion an equality of brute beasts a dead level of sanguinary vileness for the fanaticism of self-interest balance the madness of want aristocracy had the same fits of fury as low debauchery and the cotton cap did not show itself less hideous than the red cap the public mind was agitated just as it would be after great convulsions of nature sensible men were rendered imbeciles for the rest of their lives on account of it pere roque had become very courageous almost foolhardy having arrived on the twenty sixth at paris with some of the inhabitants of Nogent, instead of going back at the same time with them he had gone to give his assistance to the national guard in camp to the tuileries and he was quite satisfied to be placed on sentry in front of the terrace at the water side there at any rate he had these brigands under his feet he was delighted to find that they were beaten and humiliated and he could not refrain from uttering invectives against them one of them a young lad with long fair hair put his face to the bars and asked for bread m roque ordered him to hold his tongue but the young man repeated in a mournful tone bread have i any to give you other prisoners presented themselves at the vent hole with their bristling beards their burning eyeballs all pushing forward and yelling bread pere roque was indignant at seeing his authority slighted in order to frighten them he took aim at them and borne onward into the vault by the crush that nearly smothered him the young man with his head thrown backwards once more exclaimed bread hold on here it is said pere roque firing a shot from his gun there was a fearful howl then silence at the side of the trough something white could be seen lying after this m roque returned to his abode for he had a house in the rue saint martin which he used as a temporary residence and the injury done to the front of the building during the riots had in no slight degree contributed to excite his rage 
it seemed to him when he next saw it that he had exaggerated the amount of damage done to it his recent act had a soothing effect on him as if it indemnified him for his loss it was his daughter herself who opened the door for him she immediately made the remark that she had felt uneasy at his excessively prolonged absence she was afraid that he had met with some misfortune that he had been wounded this manifestation of filial love softened pere roque he was astonished that she should have set out on a journey without catherine i sent her out on a message was louise's reply and she made inquiries about his health about one thing or another then with an air of indifference she asked him whether he had chanced to come across frederick no i didn't see him it was on his account alone that she had come up from the country someone was walking at that moment in the lobby oh excuse me and she disappeared catherine had not found frederick he had been several days away and his intimate friend monsieur de laurier was now living in the provinces louise once more presented herself shaking all over without being able to utter a word she leaned against the furniture what's the matter with you tell me what's the matter with you exclaimed her father she indicated by a wave of her hand that it was nothing and with a great effort of will she regained her composure the keeper of the restaurant at the opposite side of the street brought them soup but pere roque had passed through too exciting an ordeal to be able to control his emotions he is not likely to die and at dessert he had a sort of fainting fit a doctor was at once sent for and he prescribed a potion then when m roque was in bed he asked to be as well wrapped up as possible in order to bring on perspiration he gasped he moaned thanks my good catherine kiss your poor father my chicken ah those revolutions and when his daughter scolded him for having made himself ill by tormenting his mind on her account he replied yes you are right but i couldn't help it i'm too sensitive End of chapter 14 part 4「Chapter 15 of Sentimental Education」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sentimental Education by Gustave Flaubert Chapter 15 How Happy Could I Be With Either Madame d'Ambreuse, in her boudoir, between her niece and Miss John, was listening to Monsieur Roque as he described the severe military duties he had been forced to perform. She was biting her lips and appeared to be in pain. Oh, tis nothing, it will pass away. And, with a gracious air, we are going to have an acquaintance of yours at dinner with us, Monsieur Moreau. Louise gave a start. Oh, we'll only have a few intimate friends there, amongst others, Alfred de Sissi and she spoke in terms of high praise about his manners his personal appearance and especially his moral character madame d'ambreuse was nearer to a correct estimate of the state of affairs than she imagined the vicomte was contemplating marriage he said so to martino adding that mademoiselle cecile was certain to like him and that her parents would accept him to warrant him in going so far as to confide to another his intentions on the point, he ought to have satisfactory information with regard to her dowry. Now, Martineau had a suspicion that Cécile was Monsieur d'Ambreuse's natural daughter, and it is probable that it would have been a very strong step on his part to ask for her hand at any risk. Such audacity, of course, was not unaccompanied by danger and for this reason Martinon had, up to the present, acted in a way that could not compromise him. Besides, he did not see how he could well get rid of the aunt. Cesi's confidence induced him to make up his mind, and he had formally made his proposal to the banker, who, seeing no obstacle to it, had just informed Madame d'Ambreuse about the matter. Cesi presently made his appearance she arose and said you have forgotten us cecile shake hands at the same moment frederick entered the room ah at last we have found you again exclaimed pere roque i called with cecile on you three times this week frederick had carefully avoided them 
he pleaded by way of excuse that he spent all his days beside a wounded comrade. For a long time, however, a heap of misfortunes had happened to him, and he tried to invent stories to explain his conduct. Luckily, the guests arrived in the midst of his explanation. First of all, Monsieur Paul de Cremonville, the diplomatist whom he met at the ball, then Fumichon, that manufacturer whose conservative zeal had scandalized him one evening. After them came the old Duchesse de Montreuil Nantois. But two loud voices in the anteroom reached his ears. They were that of Monsieur de Nonancourt, an old beau with the air of a mummy preserved in cold cream, and that of Madame de la Silois, the wife of a prefect of Louis-Philippe. She was terribly frightened, for she had just heard an organ playing a polka, which was a signal amongst the insurgents. Many of the wealthy class of citizens had similar apprehensions. They thought that men in the catacombs were going to blow up the Faubourg Saint-Germain, some noises escaped from cellars, and things that excited suspicion were passed up to windows. Everyone in the meantime made an effort to calm Madame de la Silois. Order was re-established. There was no longer anything to fear. Cavignac has saved us. As if the horrors of the insurrection had not been sufficiently numerous, they exaggerated them. There had been 23,000 convicts on the side of the socialists, no less. They had no doubt whatever that food had been poisoned, that Garde Mobile had been sawn between two planks, and that there had been inscriptions on flags inciting the people to pillage and incendiarism. Aye, and something more, added the ex-prefect. Oh, dear, said Madame d'Ambreuse whose modesty was shocked, while she indicated the three young girls with a glance. Monsieur d'Ambreuse came forth from his study, accompanied by Martinon. She turned her head round and responded to a bow from Pellerin, who was advancing towards her. The artist gazed in a restless fashion towards the walls. The banker took him aside and conveyed to him that it was desirable for the present to conceal his revolutionary picture. No doubt, said Pellerin, the rebuff which he received at the Club of Intellect having modified his opinions. Monsieur d'Ambreuse let it slip out very politely that he would give him orders for other works. But, excuse me, ah, my dear friend, what a pleasure! Arnoux and Madame Arnoux stood before Frederick. He had a sort of vertigo. Rosanette had been irritating him all the afternoon with her display of admiration for soldiers, and the old passion was reawakened. The steward came to announce that dinner was on the table. With a look, she directed the vicomte to take Cécile's arm, while she said in a low tone to Martinon, You wretch! And then they passed into the dining room. Under the green leaves of a pineapple, in the middle of the tablecloth, a dorado stood, with its snout reaching towards a quarter of roebuck and its tail just grazing a bushy dish of crayfish. Figs, huge cherries, pears and grapes, the first fruits of Parisian cultivation, rose like pyramids in baskets of old sacks. Here and there, a bunch of flowers mingled with the shining silver plate. The white silk blinds, drawn down in front of the windows, filled the apartment with a mellow light. It was cooled by two fountains, in which there were pieces of ice, and tall men-servants in short breeches waited on them. All these luxuries seemed more precious after the emotion of the past few days. They felt a fresh delight at possessing things which they had been afraid of losing. And Nonancourt expressed the general sentiment when he said, Ah, let us hope that these Republican gentlemen will allow us to dine. In spite of their fraternity, Père Roque added with an attempt at wit. The two personages were placed respectively at the right and at the left of Madame d'Ambreuse. Her husband, 
being exactly opposite her, between Madame Larcellois, at whose side was the diplomatist and the old Duchesse, whom Fumichon elbowed. Then came the painter, the dealer in faience, and Mademoiselle Louise, and, thanks to Martinon, who had carried her chair to enable her to take a seat near Louise, Frederick found himself beside Madame Arnoux. She wore a black barège gown, a gold hoop on her wrist, and, as on the first day that he dined at her house, something red in her hair, a branch of fuchsia twisted round her chignon. He could not help saying, "'Tis a long time since we saw each other.' "'Ah,' she returned coldly. He went on in a mild tone, which mitigated the impertinence of his question, "'Have you thought of me now and then?' "'Why should I think of you?' "'Frederick was hurt by these words. "'You are right, perhaps, after all. "'But very soon regretting what he had said, "'he swore that he had not lived a single day "'without being ravaged by the remembrance of her. "'I don't believe a single word of it, monsieur. "'However, you know that I love you.' Madame Arnoux made no reply. "'You know that I love you!' She still kept silent. "'Well, then, go be hanged,' said Frederick to himself. And, as he raised his eyes, he perceived Mademoiselle Roque at the other side of Madame Arnoux. She thought it gave her a coquettish look to dress entirely in green, a colour which contrasted horribly with her red hair. The buckle of her belt was large, and her collar cramped her neck. This lack of elegance had, no doubt, contributed to the coldness which Frederick at first displayed towards her. She watched him from where she sat, some distance away from him, with curious glances. And Arnoux, close to her side, in vain lavished his gallantries. He could not get her to utter three words, so that, finally abandoning all hope of making himself agreeable to her, he listened to the conversation. She now began rolling about a slice of Luxembourg pineapple in her pea soup. Louis Blanc, according to Fumichon, owned a large house in the Rue Saint-Dominique, which he refused to let to the workmen. For my part, I think it rather a funny thing, said Nonancourt, to see Lederu Rollin hunting over the crown lands. He owes twenty thousand francs to a goldsmith, Sizzy interposed, and tis maintained. Madame d'Ambreuse stopped him. Ah, how nasty it is to be getting hot about politics, and for such a young man, too. Fee, fee, pay attention, rather, to your fair neighbour. After this, those who were of a grave turn of mind attacked the newspapers. Arnoux took it on himself to defend them. Frederick mixed himself up in the discussion, describing them as commercial establishments just like any other house of business. Those who wrote for them were, as a rule, imbeciles or humbugs. He gave his listeners to understand that he was acquainted with journalists, and combated with sarcasm his friend's generous sentiments. Madame Arnoux did not notice that this was said through a feeling of spite against her. Meanwhile, the Vicomte was torturing his brain in the effort to make a conquest of Mademoiselle Cécile. He commenced by finding fault with the shape of the decanters and the graving of the knives, in order to show his artistic tastes. Then he talked about his stable, his tailor, and his shirt-maker. Finally he took up the subject of religion, and seized the opportunity of conveying to her that he fulfilled all his duties. Martinon set to work in a better fashion. With his eyes fixed on her continually, he praised, in a monotonous fashion, her bird-like profile, her dull fair hair, and her hands, which were unusually short. The plain-looking young girl was delighted at this shower of flatteries. It was impossible to hear anything, as all present were talking at the tops of their voices. Monsieur Roc wanted an iron hand to govern France. Nonancourt even regretted that the political scaffold was abolished. They ought to have all these scoundrels put together. 
Now that I think of it, are we speaking of Dussadier? said Monsieur d'Ambreuse, turning towards Frederick. The worthy shopman was now a hero, like Celeste, the brothers Janson, the wife of Pequilet, etc. Frederick, without waiting to be asked, related his friend's history. It threw around him a kind of halo. Then they came quite naturally to refer to different traits of courage. According to the diplomatist, it was not hard to face death. Witness the case of men who fight duels. We might take the vicomte's testimony on that point, said Martinon. The vicomte's face got very flushed. The guests stared at him. And Louise, more astonished than the rest, murmured, What is it, pray? He sank before Frederick, returned Arnaud in a very low tone. Do you know anything, mademoiselle? said Nonancourt presently, and he repeated her answer to Madame Nambreuse, who, bending forward a little, began to fix her gaze on Frederick. Martinon did not wait for Cecile's questions. He informed her that this affair had reference to a woman of improper character. The young girl drew back slightly in her chair, as if to escape from contact with such a libertine. The conversation was renewed. The great wines of Bordeaux were sent around, and the guests became animated. Pellerin had a dislike to the revolution because he attributed to it the complete loss of the Spanish Museum. This is what grieved him most as a painter. As he made the latter remark, Monsieur Roque asked, Are you not yourself the painter of a very notable picture? Perhaps. What is it? It represents a lady in a costume, faith, a little light with a purse and a peacock behind. Frederick, in his turn, reddened. Pellerin pretended that he had not heard the words. Nevertheless, it is certainly by you, for your name is written at the bottom of it, and there is a line on it stating that it is Monsieur Moreau's property. One day, when Père Roque and his daughter were waiting at his residence to see him, they saw the Maréchal's portrait. The old gentleman had even taken it for a Gothic painting. No, said Pellerin rudely. "'Tis a woman's portrait. Martinot added, "'And a living woman's, too, and no mistake. "'Isn't that so, Cece? "'Oh, I know nothing about it. "'I thought you were acquainted with her. "'But since it causes you pain, "'I must beg a thousand pardons.' "'Cece lowered his eyes, "'proving by his embarrassment "'that he must have played a pitiable part "'in connection with this portrait.' As for Frederick, the model could only be his mistress. It was one of those convictions which are immediately formed, and the faces of the assembly revealed it with the utmost clearness. How he lied to me, said Madame Arnoux to herself. It is for her, then, that he left me, thought Louise. Frederick had an idea that these two stories might compromise him, and when they were in the garden, Mademoiselle Cécile's wooer burst out laughing in his face. Oh, not at all. It will do you good. Go ahead. What did he mean? Besides, what was the cause of this good nature, so contrary to his usual conduct? Without giving any explanation, he proceeded towards the lower end where the ladies were seated. The men were standing round them, and, in their midst, Pellerin was giving vent to his ideas. The form of government most favourable for the arts was an enlightened monarchy. He was disgusted with modern times. If it were only on account of the National Guard, he regretted the Middle Ages and the days of Louis the Fourteenth. Monsieur Roque congratulated him on his opinions, confessing that they overcame all his prejudices against artists. But almost without a moment's delay, he went off when the voice of Fumichon attracted his attention. Arnaud tried to prove that there were two socialisms, a good and a bad. The manufacturer saw no difference whatever between them, his head becoming dizzy with rage at the utterance of the word property. "'Tis a law written on the face of nature. Children cling to their toys.' 
all peoples all animals are of my opinion the lion even if he were able to speak would declare himself a proprietor thus i myself monsieur began with a capital of fifteen thousand francs would you be surprised to hear that for thirty years i used to get up at four o'clock every morning i've had as much pain as five hundred devils in making my fortune and people will come and tell me i'm not the master that my money is not my money in short the property is theft but prudon let me alone with your prudon if he were here i think i'd strangle him he would have strangled him after the intoxicating drink he had swallowed fumichon did not know what he was talking about any longer and his apoplectic face was on the point of bursting like a bombshell good morrow arnoux said Houssonnet, who was walking briskly over the grass he brought monsieur d'ambreuse the first leaf of a pamphlet bearing the title of the hydra the bohemian defending the interests of a reactionary club and in that capacity he was introduced by the banker to his guests Houssonnet amused them by relating how the dealers in tallow hired three hundred and ninety-two street boys to bawl out every evening lamps and then turning into ridicule the principle of eighty-nine the emancipation of the negroes and the orators of the left and he even went so far as to do prud'homme on a barricade perhaps under the influence of a kind of jealousy of these rich people who had enjoyed a good dinner the caricature did not please them overmuch their faces grew long this however was not a time for joking so nonancourt observed as he recalled the death of monseigneur affre and that of general de brea these events were being constantly alluded to and arguments were constructed out of them monsieur roc described the archbishop's end as everything that one could call sublime Fumichon gave the palm to the military personage, and, instead of simply expressing regret for these two murders, they held disputes with a view to determining which ought to excite the greatest indignation. A second comparison was next instituted, namely, between La Mauricière and Cavaignac, Monsieur d'Ambreuse glorifying Cavaignac, and non encore La Mauricière. Not one of the persons present, with the exception of Arnoux, had ever seen either of them engaged in the exercise of his profession none the less every one formulated an irrevocable judgment with reference to their operations frederick however declined to give an opinion on the matter confessing that he had not served as a soldier the diplomatist and monsieur d'ambreuse gave him an approving nod of the head in fact to have fought against the insurrection was to have defended the republic the result, although favourable, consolidated it, and now they had got rid of the vanquished, they wanted to be conquerors. As soon as they had got out into the garden, Madame d'Ambreuse, taking Cici aside, chided him for his awkwardness. When she caught sight of Martinon, she sent him away, and then tried to learn from her future nephew the cause of his witticisms at the vicomte's expense. There's nothing of the kind and all this as it were for the glory of monsieur moreau what is the object of it there's no object frederick is a charming fellow i'm very fond of him and so am i too let him come here go and look for him after two or three commonplace phrases she began by lightly disparaging her guests and in this way she placed him on a higher level than the others he did not fail to run down the rest of the ladies more or less which was an ingenious way of paying her compliments but she left his side from time to time as it was a reception night and ladies were every moment arriving then she returned to her seat and the entirely accidental arrangement of the chairs enabled them to avoid being overheard she showed herself playful and yet grave melancholy and yet quite rational her daily occupations interested her very little there was an order of sentiments of a less transitory kind she complained of the poets who misrepresent the facts of life then she raised her eyes towards heaven asking of him what was the name of a star two or three chinese lanterns had been suspended from the trees the wind shook them and lines of coloured light quivered on her white dress 
she sat after her usual fashion a little back in her armchair with a footstool in front of her the tip of a black satin shoe could be seen and at intervals madame d'ambreuse allowed a louder word than usual and sometimes even a laugh to escape her these coquetries did not affect martinon who was occupied with cecile but they were bound to make an impression on monsieur roc's daughter who was chatting with madame arnoux she was the only member of her own sex present whose manners did not appear disdainful louise came and sat beside her then yielding to the desire to give vent to her emotions does he not talk well frederick moreau i mean do you know him oh intimately we are neighbors and he used to amuse himself with me when i was quite a little girl madame arnoux cast at her a sidelong glance which meant i suppose you are not in love with him the young girl's face replied with an untroubled look yes you see him often then oh no only when he comes to his mother's house tis ten months now since he came he promised however to be more particular the promises of men are not to be too much relied on my child but he has not deceived me as he did others louise shivered can it be by any chance that he promised something to her and her features became distracted with distrust and hate madame arnoux was almost afraid of her she would have gladly withdrawn what she had said then both became silent as frederick was sitting opposite them on a folding stool they kept staring at him the one with propriety out of the corner of her eye the other boldly with parted lips so that madame d'ambreuse said to him come now turn round and let her have a good look at you whom do you mean why monsieur roc's daughter and she rallied him on having won the heart of this young girl from the provinces he denied that this was so and tried to make a laugh of it is it credible i ask you such an ugly creature however he experienced an intense feeling of gratified vanity he recalled to mind the reunion from which he had returned one night some time before his heart filled with bitter humiliation and he drew a deep breath for it seemed to him that he was now in the environment that really suited him as if all these things including the d'ambreuse mansion belonged to himself the ladies formed a semicircle around him while they listened to what he was saying and in order to create an effect he declared that he was in favor of the re-establishment of divorce which he maintained should be easily procurable so as to enable people to quit one another and come back to one another without any limit as often as they liked they uttered loud protests a few of them began to talk in whispers little exclamations every now and then burst forth from the place where the wall was overshadowed with aristolochia one would imagine that it was a mirthful cackling of hens and he developed his theory with that self-complacency which is generated by the consciousness of success a manservant brought into the arbor a tray laden with ices the gentlemen drew close together and began to chat about the recent arrests thereupon frederick revenged himself on the vicomte by making him believe that he might be prosecuted as a legitimist the other urged by way of reply that he had not stirred outside his own room his adversary enumerated in a heap the possible mischances messieurs d'ambreuse and grémonville found the discussion very amusing then they paid frederick compliments while expressing regret at the same time that he did not employ his abilities in the defence of order they grasped his hand with the utmost warmth. He might for the future count on them. At last, just as everyone was leaving, the vicomte made a low bow to Cécile. Mademoiselle, I have the honour of wishing you a very good evening. She replied coldly, Good evening. But she gave Martinon a parting smile. Père Roque, in order to continue the conversation between himself and Arnoux, offered to see him home as well as madame they were going the same way louise and frederick walked in front of them she had caught hold of his arm and when she was some distance away from the others she said ah oh, at last at last i've had enough to bear all the evening how nasty those women were 
What haughty airs they had! He made an effort to defend them. First of all, you might certainly have spoken to me the moment you came in, after being away a whole year. It was not a year, said Frederick, glad to be able to give some sort of rejoinder on this point in order to avoid the other questions. Be it so, the time appeared very long to me, that's all, but during this horrid dinner one would think you felt ashamed of me. Ah, I understand. I don't possess what is needed in order to please as they do. You are mistaken, said Frederick. Really? Swear to me that you don't love anyone. He did swear. You love nobody but me alone? I assure you, I do not. This assurance filled her with delight. She would have liked to lose her way in the streets, so that they might walk about together the whole night. I have been so much tormented down there. Nothing was talked about but barricades. I imagined I saw you falling on your back, covered with blood. Your mother was confined to her bed with rheumatism. She knew nothing about what was happening. I had to hold my tongue. I could stand it no longer, so I took Catherine with me. And she related to him all about her departure, her journey, and the lie she told her father. He's bringing me back in two days. Come tomorrow evening, as if you were merely paying a casual visit, and take advantage of the opportunity to ask for my hand in marriage. Never had Frederick been further from the idea of marriage. Besides, Mademoiselle Roch appeared to him a rather absurd young person. How different she was from a woman like Madame d'Ambreuse. A very different future was in store for him. He had found reason today to feel perfectly certain on that point, and, therefore, this was not the time to involve himself from mere sentimental motives in a step of such momentous importance. It was necessary now to be decisive. And then he had seen Madame Arnoux once more. Nevertheless, he was rather embarrassed by Louise's candour. He said in reply to her last words, "'Have you considered this matter?' "'How is that?' she exclaimed, frozen with astonishment and indignation. He said that to marry at such a time as this would be a piece of folly. So you don't want to have me? Nay, you don't understand me. And he plunged into a confused mass of verbiage in order to impress upon her that he was kept back by a more serious considerations, that he had business on hand which it would take a long time to dispose of that even his inheritance had been placed in jeopardy. Louise cut all this explanation short with one plain word. That, last of all, the present political situation made the thing undesirable. So, then, the most reasonable course was to wait, patiently, for some time. Matters would, no doubt, right themselves, at least he hoped so. And, as he could think of no further grounds to go upon just at that moment, he pretended to have been suddenly reminded that he should have been with Dussardier two hours ago. Then, bowing to the others, he darted down the Rue Hauteville, took a turn round the gymnase, returned to the boulevard, and quickly rushed up Rosanette's four flights of stairs. Monsieur and Madame Arnoux left Père Roc and his daughter at the entrance of the Rue Saint-Denis. Husband and wife returned home without exchanging a word, as he was unable to continue chattering any longer feeling quite worn out. She even leaned against his shoulder. He was the only man who had displayed any honourable sentiments during the evening. She entertained towards him feelings of the utmost indulgence. Meanwhile, he cherished a certain degree of spite against Frederick. Did you notice his face when a question was asked about the portrait? When I told you that he was her lover, you did not wish to believe what I said. Oh, yes, I was wrong. Arnoux, gratified with his triumph, pressed the matter even further. I'd even make a bet that when he left us a little while ago, he went to see her again. He's with her, at this moment, you may be sure. He's finishing the evening with her. Madame Arnoux had pulled down her hat very low. Why, you're shaking all over. That's because I feel cold, was her reply. As soon as her father was asleep, 
Louise made her way into Catherine's room and, catching her by the shoulders, shook her. Get up, quick, as quick as ever you can, and go and fetch a cab for me. Catherine replied that there was not one to be had at such an hour. Will you come with me yourself there, then? Where, might I ask? To Frederick's house. Impossible. What do you want to go there for? It was in order to have a talk with him. She could not wait. She must see him immediately. Just think of what you're about to do. To present yourself this way at a house in the middle of the night? Besides, he's asleep by this time. I'll wake him up. But this is not a proper thing for a young girl to do. I am not a young girl. I'm his wife. I love him. Come, put on your shawl. Catherine, standing at the side of the bed, was trying to make up her mind how to act. She said at last, No, I won't go. Well, stay behind then. I'll go there by myself. Louise glided like an adder towards the staircase. Catherine rushed after her and came up with her on the footpath outside the house. Her remonstrances were fruitless, and she followed the girl, fastening her undervest as she hurried along in the rear. The walk appeared to her exceedingly tedious. She complained that her legs were getting weak from age. "'I'll go on after you. Faith, I haven't the same thing to drive me on that you have.' Then she grew softened. "'Poor soul. You haven't anyone now but your Catal, don't you see?' From time to time, scruples took hold of her mind. "'Ah, this is a nice thing you're making me do. Suppose your father happened to wake and miss you. Lord God, let us hope no misfortune will happen.' In front of the Théâtre des Varietés, a patrol of National Guards stopped them. Louise immediately explained that she was going with her servant to look for a doctor in the Rue Rumfort. The patrol allowed them to pass on. At the corner of the Madeleine, they came across a second patrol, and, Louise having given the same explanation, one of the National Guards asked in return, "'Is it for a nine-month ailment, Ducky?' "'Oh, damn it!' exclaimed the captain." No blackguardisms in the rank. Pass on, ladies. In spite of the captain's orders, they still kept cracking jokes. I wish you much joy. My respects to the doctor. Mind the wolf. They like laughing, Catherine remarked in a loud tone. That's the way it is to be young. At length they reached Frederick's abode. Louise gave the bell a vigorous pull, which she repeated several times. The door opened a little, and, in answer to her inquiry, the porter said, No. But he must be in bed. I tell you, he's not. Why, for nearly three months he has not slept at home, and the little pane of the lodge fell down sharply, like the blade of a guillotine. They remained in the darkness under the archway. An angry voice cried out to them, Be off! The door was again opened. They went away. Louise had to sit down on a boundary stone, and, clasping her face with her hands, she wept copious tears welling up from her full heart. The day was breaking, and carts were making their way into the city. Catherine led her back home, holding her up, kissing her, and offering her every sort of consolation that she could extract from her own experience. She need not give herself so much trouble about a lover. If this one failed her, she could find others. End of chapter 15 Recording by Kate McKenzie Chapter 16 of Sentimental Education This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. Sentimental Education by Gustave Flaubert. Chapter 16. Unpleasant News from Rosanette. When Rosanette's enthusiasm for the guard mobile had calmed down, she became more charming than ever, and Frederick insensibly glided into the habit of living with her. The best portion of the day was the morning on the terrace, in a light cambric dress and with her stockingless feet Thrust into slippers, she kept moving about him, went and cleaned her canary's cage, gave her goldfishes some water, and with a fire shovel did a little amateur gardening in the box filled with clay, from which arose a trellis of nasturtiums, 
giving an attractive look to the wall. Then resting with their elbows on the balcony, they stood side by side, gazing at the vehicles and the passers-by, and they warmed themselves in the sunlight and made plans for spending the evening. He absented himself only for two hours at most, and after that they would go to some theater where they would get seats in front of the stage, and Rosanette, with a large bouquet of flowers in her hand, would listen to the instruments, while Frederick, leaning close to her ear, would tell her comic or amatory stories. At other times, they took an open carriage to drive to the Bois de Boulogne. They kept walking about slowly until the middle of the night. At last, they made their way home through the Arc de Triomphe and the Grand Avenue, inhaling the breeze with the stars above their heads, and with all the gas lamps ranged in the background of the perspective like a double string of luminous pearls. Frederick always waited for her when they were going out together. She was a very long time fastening the two ribbons of her bonnet, and she smiled at herself in the mirror set in the wardrobe. Then she would draw her arm over his and making him look at himself in the glass beside her. We produce a good effect in this way, the two of us side by side. Ah, my poor darling, I could eat you. He was now her, her property. She wore on her face a continuous radiance, while at the same time she appeared more languishing in manner, more rounded in vigor, and without being able to explain in what way, he found her altered nevertheless. One day she informed him, as if it were a very important bit of news, that my lord Arnoux had lately set up a linen draper's shop for a woman who was formerly employed in his pottery works. He used to go there every evening. He spent a great deal on it, no later than a week ago. He had even given her a set of rosewood furniture. How do you know that, said Frederick. Oh, I'm sure of it. Delphine, while carrying out some orders for her, had made enquiries about the matter. She must then be much attached to Arnout to take such a deep interest in his movements. He contented himself with saying to her in reply, What does this signify to you? Rosanette looked surprised at this question. Why? The rascal owes me money. Isn't it atrocious to see him keeping beggars? Then, with an expression of triumphant hate in her face, Besides, she is having a nice laugh at him. She has three others on hand. So much the better. And I'll be glad if she eats him up, even to the last farthing. Arnoux had in fact let himself be made use of by the girl from Bordeaux with the indulgence which characterizes senile attachments. His manufactory was no longer going on. The entire state of his affairs was pitiable, so that in order to set them afloat again, he was at first projecting the establishment of a café chantant, at which only patriotic pieces would be sung. With a grant from the minister, this establishment would become at the same time a focus for the purpose of propagandism and a source of profit. Now that power had been directed into a different channel, the thing was impossible. His next idea was a big military hat-making business. He lacked capital, however, to give it a start. He was not more fortunate in his domestic life. Madame Arnoux was less agreeable in manner towards him, sometimes even a little rude. Bertha always took her father's part. This increased the discord, and the house was becoming intolerable. He often set forth in the morning, passed his day in making long excursions out of the city in order to divert his thoughts, then dined at a rustic tavern, abandoning himself to his reflections. The prolonged absence of Frederick disturbed his habits. Then he presented himself one afternoon, begged of him to come and see him as in former days, and obtained from him a promise to do so. Frederick did not feel sufficient courage within him to go back to Madame Arnoux's house. It seemed to him as if he had betrayed her, but this conduct was very pusillanimous. There was no excuse for it. There was only one way of ending the matter, and so one evening he set out on his way. As the rain was falling, he had just turned up the passage Jouffroy, when, under the light shed from the shop windows, a fat little man accosted him. Frederick had no difficulty in recognizing Compan, that orator whose motion had excited so much laughter at the club. He was leaning on the arm of an individual whose head was muffled in a zouave's red cap, with a very long upper lip, a complexion as yellow as an orange, a tuft of beard under his jaw, and big staring eyes listening with wonder. Compan was, no doubt, proud of him, for he said, Let me introduce you to this jolly dog. He is a bootmaker whom I include amongst my friends. Come, and let us take something. Frederick, having thanked him, he immediately thundered against Rato's motion, which he described as a maneuver of the aristocrats. In order to put an end to it, it would be necessary to begin 93 over again. Then he inquired about Régin Barr and some others, who were also well-known, such as Maslin, Sanson, Laconi, Marichal, and a certain Delaurier, who had been implicated in the case of the carbines lately intercepted at Troyes. All this was new to Frederick. Campan knew nothing more about the subject. He quitted the young man with these words, You'll come soon, will you not, for you belong to it. To what? The calf's head. What calf's head? Ha, you rogue, returned Campan, giving him a tap on the stomach. And the two terrorists plunged into a cafe. 
Ten minutes later, Frederick was no longer thinking of Delaria. He was on the footpath of the Rue de Paradis in front of a house, and he was staring at the light which came from a lamp in the second floor behind a curtain. At length he ascended the stairs. Is our new there? The chambermaid answered, No, but come in all the same. And abruptly opening the door, Madame, it is Monsieur Moreau. She arose, whiter than the collar round her neck. To what do I owe the honor of a visit so unexpected? Nothing. The pleasure of seeing old friends once more. And as he took a seat, how is the worthy Arnu going on? Very well. He has gone out. Ah, I understand. Still following his old nightly practices. A little distraction. And why not? After a day spent in making calculations, the head needs a rest. She even praised her husband as a hard-working man. Frederick was irritated at hearing this eulogy and pointing towards a piece of black cloth with a narrow blue braid which lay on her lap. What is it you are doing there? A jacket, which I am trimming for my daughter. Now that you remind me of it, I have not seen her. Where is she, pray? At a boarding school, was Madame Arnoux's reply. Tears came into her eyes. She held them back while she rapidly plied her needle. To keep himself in countenance, he took up a number of l'illustration which had been lying on the table close to where she sat. These caricatures of Cam are very funny, are they not? Yes. And they relapsed into silence once more. All of a sudden, a fierce gust of wind shook the window panes. What weather? said Frederick. It was very good of you indeed to come here in the midst of this dreadful rain. Oh, what do I care about that? I'm not like those whom it prevents, no doubt, from going to keep their appointments. What appointments? she asked with an ingenuous air. Don't you remember? A shudder ran through her frame, and she hung down her head. He gently laid his hand on her arm. I assure you that you have given me great pain. She replied with a sort of wail in her voice. But I was frightened about my child. She told him about Eugene's illness and all the tortures which she had endured on that day. Thanks, thanks. I doubt you no longer. I love you as much as ever. Ah, oh, no, it is not true. Why so? She glanced at him coldly. You forget the other, the one you took with you to the races, the woman whose portrait you have, your mistress. Well, yes, exclaimed Frederick. I don't deny anything. I am a wretch. Just listen to me. If he had done this, it was through despair, as one commits suicide. However, he had made her very unhappy in order to avenge himself on her with his own shame. What mental anguish do you not realize what it means? Madame Arnoux turned away her beautiful face while she held out her hand to him, and they closed their eyes, absorbed in a kind of intoxication that was like a sweet, ceaseless rocking. Then they stood face to face, gazing at one another. Could you believe it possible that I no longer loved you? She replied in a low voice, full of caressing tenderness. No, in spite of everything, I felt at the bottom of my heart that it was impossible, and that one day the obstacle between us two would disappear. So did I, and I was dying to see you again. I once passed close to you in the Palais Royale. Did you really? And he spoke to her of the happiness he experienced at coming across her again at the Dumbrose's house. But how I hated you that evening as I was leaving the place. Poor boy! My life is so sad. And mine too. If it were only the vexations, the anxieties, the humiliations, all that I endure as wife and as mother, seeing that one must die, I would not complain. The frightful part of it is my solitude, without anyone. But you have me here with you. Oh, yes. A sob of deep emotion made her bosom smile. She spread out her arms, and they strained one another while their lips met in a long kiss. A creaking sound on the floor not far from them reached their ears. There was a woman standing close to them. It was Rosanette. Madame Arnoux had recognized her. Her eyes opened to their widest, scanned this woman, full of astonishment and indignation. At length, Rosanette said to her, I have come to see Monsieur Arnoux about a matter of business. You see, he is not here. Ah, oh, that's true, returned the Marechal. Your nurse is right. A thousand apologies. And turning towards Frederick, so here you are, you. The familiar tone in which she addressed him, and in her own presence too, made Madame Arnoux flush as if she had received a slap right across the face. I tell you again, he is not here. Then the Marechal, who was looking this way and that, said quietly, let us go back together. I have a cab waiting below. He pretended not to hear. Come, let us go. Ah, yes, this is a good opportunity. Go, go, said Madame Anu. 
They went off together, and then she stooped over the head of the stairs in order to see them once more. And a laugh, piercing, heartrending, reached them from the place where she stood. Frederick pushed Rosanette into the cab, sat down opposite her, and during the entire drive, did not utter a word. The infamy which had outraged him to see once more flowing back on him had been brought about by himself alone. The experience, at the same time, the dishonor of a crushing humiliation, and the regret caused by the loss of his newfound happiness. Just when, alas, he had it in his grasp, it had forever become impossible, and that through the fault of this girl of the town, the Charlotte, he would have liked to strangle her. He was choking with rage. When they had gotten to the house, he flung his hat on a piece of furniture and tore off his cravat. Ha! You have just done a nice thing. Confess it. She planted herself boldly in front of him. Ah! Well, what of that? Where's the harm? What? You are playing the spy on me? Is that my fault? Why'd you go to amuse yourself with virtuous women? Never mind, I don't wish you to insult them. How have I insulted them? We had no answer to make to this, and in a more spiteful tone. But on the other occasion, at the Champ de Ma. Ah, you bore us to death with your old women. Wretch! He raised his fist. Don't kill me, I'm pregnant. Frederick staggered back. You are lying. Why? Just look at me. She seized the candlestick and putting at her face. Don't you recognize the fact there? Little yellow spots dotted her skin, which was strangely swollen. Frederick did not deny the evidence. He went to the window and opened it, took a few steps up and down the room, and sank into a armchair. This event was a calamity, which in the first place put off the rupture, and in the next place upset all his plans. The notion of being a father, moreover, appeared to him grotesque, inadmissible. But why? If in place of the Marechal, and his reverie became so deep that he had a kind of hallucination. He saw there, on the carpet, in front of the chimney piece, a little girl. She resembled Madame Arnoux and himself a little, dark and yet fair, with two black eyes, very large eyebrows, and a red ribbon in her curling hair. Oh, how he would have loved her. And he seemed to hear her voice saying, Papa, Papa. Rosanette, who had just undressed herself, came across to him, and noticing a tear in his eyelids, kissed him gravely on the forehead. He rose, saying, By Jove, we mustn't kill this little one. Then she talked a lot of nonsense. To be sure, it would be a boy, and its name would be Frederick. It would be necessary for her to begin making its clothes, and seeing her so happy, a feeling of pity for her, took possession of him. As he no longer cherished any anger against her, he desired to know the explanation of the steps she had recently taken. She said it was because Mademoiselle Vanaz had sent her that day a bill which had been protested for some time past, and so she hastened to Arnoux to get the money from them. I'd have given it to you, said Frederick. It is a simpler course for me to get over there what belongs to me, and to pay back to the other one her thousand francs. Is this really all you owe her? She answered, certainly. On the following day, at nine o'clock in the evening, the hour specified by the doorkeeper, Frederick repaired to the Mademoiselle Vatnas's residence. In the anteroom, he jostled against the furniture which was heaped together, but the sound of voices and of music guided him. He opened the door and tumbled into the middle of a rout, standing up before a piano which a young lady in spectacles was fingering. Delmar, as serious as a pontiff, was declaiming a humanitarian poem on prostitution, and his hollow voice rolled to the accompaniment of the metallic chords. A row of women sat close to the wall, attired as a rule in dark colors without neckbands or sleeves. Five or six men, all people of culture, occupied seats here and there. In an armchair was seated a former writer of fables, a mere wreck now, and the pungent odor of the two lamps was intermingled with the aroma of the chocolate which filled a number of bowls placed on the card table. Mademoiselle Vatnas, with an oriental shawl thrown over her shoulders, sat at one side of the chimney piece. Dusardier sat facing her at the other side. He seemed to feel himself in an embarrassing position. Besides, he was rather intimidated by his artistic surroundings. He had had the Vatnas then broken off with Delmar. Perhaps not. However, she seemed jealous of the worthy shopman, and Frederick, having asked to let him exchange a word with her, she made a sign to him to go with them into her own apartment. When the thousand francs were paid down before her, she asked an addition for interest. "'Tisn't worthwhile,' said Desarge. "'Pray hold your tongue. This want of moral courage on the part of so brave a man was agreeable to Frederick as a justification of his own conduct. He took away the bill with him and never again referred to the scandal in Madame Arnoux's house.' But from that time forth, he saw clearly all the defects in the Marechal's character. 
She possessed incurable bad taste, incomprehensible laziness, the ignorance of a savage, so much so that she regarded Dr. de Rogi as a person of great celebrity, and she felt proud of entertaining himself and his wife because they were married people. She lectured with a pedantic air on the, on the affairs of daily life to Mademoiselle Irma, a poor little creature endowed with a little voice, who had as a protector a gentleman very well off, an ex-clerk in the custom house, who had a rare talent for card tricks. Rosanette used to call it my big Lulu. Frederick could no longer endure the repetition of her stupid words, such as some caster du Kylo, one could never know, etc., and she persisted in wiping off the dust in the morning from her trinkets with a pair of old white gloves. He was, above all, disgusted by her treatment of her servant, whose wages were constantly in arrear, and who even lent her money. On the days when they settled their accounts, they used to wrangle like two fishwomen, and then, on becoming reconciled, used to embrace each other. It was a relief to them when Madame D'Ambrose's evening parties began again. There, at any rate, he found something to amuse him. She was well-versed in the intrigues of society, the changes of ambassadors, the personal character of dressmakers, and if commonplaces escaped her lips, they did so in such a becoming fashion that her language might be regarded as the expression of respect or for propriety or of polite irony. It was worthwhile to watch the way in which... In the midst of twenty persons chatting around her, she would, without overlooking any of them, bring about the answers she desired and avoid those that were dangerous. Things of a very simple nature, when related by her, assume the aspect of confidences. Her slightest smile gave rise to dreams. In short, her charm, like the exquisite scent which she usually carried about with her, was complex and indefinable. While he was with her, Frederick experienced on each occasion the pleasure of a new discovery, and nevertheless, he always found her equally serene the next time they met like the reflection of limpid waters. But why was there such coldness in her manner towards her niece? At times she even darted strange looks at her. As soon as the question of marriage was started, she had urged as an objection to it when discussing the matter with Monsieur D'Ambros, the state of the dear child's health, and had at once taken her off to the baths of Balaruc. On her return, fresh pretexts were raised by her that the young man was not in a good position, that this ardent passion did not appear to be a very serious attachment and that no risk would be run by waiting. Martinon had replied, when the suggestion was made to him that he would wait. His conduct was sublime. He lectured Frederick. He did more. He enlightened him as to the best means of pleasing Madame D'Ambrose, even giving him to understand that he had ascertained from the niece the sentiments of her aunt. As for Monsieur D'Ambrose, far from exhibiting jealousy, he treated his young friend with the most utmost attention, consulted him about different things, and even showed anxiety about his future, so that one day, while they were talking about Pere Roque, he whispered with a sly air, You have done well. And Cecil, Miss John, the servants and the porter, every one of them exercised a fascination over him in this house. He came there every evening, quitting Rosanette for that purpose. Her approaching maternity rendered her graver in manner, and even a little melancholy, as if she were tortured by anxieties. To every question put to her, she replied, You are mistaken, I am quite well. She had, as a matter of fact, signed five notes in her previous transactions, and not having the courage to tell Frederick after the first had been paid, she had gone back to the abode of Arnoux, who had promised her in writing the third part of his profits, in the lighting of the towns of Languedoc, by gas, a marvellous undertaking, while requesting her not to make use of this letter at the meeting of shareholders. The meeting was put off from week to week. Meanwhile, the Marechal wanted money. She would have died sooner than asked Frederick for any. She did not wish to get it from him. It would have spoiled their love. He contributed a great deal to the household expenses, but a little carriage, which he hired by the month, and other sacrifices, which were indispensable since he had begun to visit the D'Ambroses, prevented him from doing more for his mistress. On two or three occasions, when he came back to the house at a different hour from his usual time, he fancied he could see men's backs disappearing behind the door, and she often went out without wishing to state where she was going. Frederick did not attempt to inquire minutely into these matters. One of these days... He would make up his mind as to his future course of action. He dreamed of another life which would be more amusing and more noble. It was the fact that he had such an ideal before his mind that rendered him indulgent towards the D'Ambrose mansion. It was an establishment in the neighborhood of the Rue de Poitiers. There he met the great M.A., the illustrious B., the profound C., the eloquent Z., the immense Y., the old terrors of the left center, the paladins of the right. The Burgraves of the Golden Mean, the eternal good old men of the comedy. He was astonished at their abominable style of talking, their menaces, 
the rancors, their dishonesty, all these personages after voting for the Constitution, now striving to destroy it, and they got into a state of great agitation and launched forth manifestos, pamphlets, and biographies, whose name's biography of Fumicon was a masterpiece. Nanancor devoted himself to the work of propagandism in the country districts. Monsieur Grémontville worked up the clergy, and Martinon brought together the young men of the wealthy class. Each exerted himself according to his resources, including Ceci himself. With his thoughts now all day long absorbed in matters of grave moment, he kept making excursions here and there in a cab in the interests of the party. Monsieur D'Ambrose, like a barometer, constantly gave expression to its latest variation. Lamartine could not be alluded to without eliciting from this gentleman the quotation of a famous phrase of the man of the people. Enough of poetry. Cavagnac was from this time forth nothing better in his eyes than a traitor. The president, whom he had admired for a period of three months, was beginning to fall off in his esteem, as he did not appear to exhibit the necessary energy, and as he always wanted, a savior, his gratitude, since the affair of the conservatoire belonged to Concarnie. Thank God for Concarnie. Let us place our reliance on Concarnie. Oh, there's nothing to fear as long as Concarnie. Monsieur Deer was praised above all for his volume against socialism, in which he showed that he was quite as much of a thinker as a writer. Now was an immense laugh at Pierre Leroux, who had quoted passages from the philosophers in the chamber. Jokes were made about the Philanstarian tale. The market of ideas came in for a meed of applause, and its authors were compared to Aristophanes. Frederick patronized the work as well as the rest. Political verbiage and good living had an enervating effect on his morality. Mediocre in capacity as these persons appeared to him, he felt proud of knowing them, and internally longed for the respectability that attached to a wealthy citizen. A mistress like Madame D'Ambrose would give him a position. He set about taking the necessary steps for achieving that object. He made it his business to cross her path, did not fail to go and greet her with a bow in her box at the theater, and being aware of the hours when she went to the church, would, he would plant himself behind a pillar in a melancholy attitude. There was a continual interchange of little notes between them with regard to curiosities to which they drew each other's attention, preparations for a concert, or the borrowing of books or reviews. In addition to his visit each night, he sometimes made a call just as the day was closing, and he experienced a progressive succession of pleasures in passing through the large front entrance, through the courtyard, through the anteroom, and through the two reception rooms. Finally, he reached her boudoir which was as quiet as a tomb, as warm as an alcove, and in, in which one jostled against the upholstered edging of furniture in the midst of objects of every sort placed here and there. Chiffoniers, screens, bowls, and trays made of lacquer, or shell or ivory or malachite, expensive trifles to which fresh additions were frequently made. Among single specimens of these rarities might be noticed three etreta rollers, which were used as paper presses, and a Frisian cap hung from a Chinese folding screen. Nevertheless, there was harmony between all these things, and one was even impressed by the noble aspect of the entire place, which was, no doubt, due to the loftiness of the ceiling, the richness of the portieres, and the long silk fringes that floated over the gold legs of the stools. She nearly always sat on a little sofa close to the flower stand which garnished the recess of the window, Frederick, seating himself on the edge of a large wheeled ottoman, addressed to her compliments of the most appropriate kind that he could conceive, and she looked at him with her head on a little on one side and a smile playing around her mouth. He read for her pieces of poetry into which he threw his whole soul in order to move her and excite her admiration. She would now and then interrupt him with a disparaging remark or practical observation, and their conversation elapsed incessantly into the eternal question of love. They discussed with each other. What were the circumstances that produced it? Whether women felt it more than men, and what was the difference between them on that point? Frederick tried to express his opinion, at the same time to avoid anything like coarseness or insipidity. This became at length a species of contest between them, sometimes agreeable and at other times tedious. Whilst at her side, he did not experience that ravishment of his entire being which drew him towards Madame Arnoux, nor the feeling of voluptuous delight with which Rosanette had at first inspired him. But he felt a passion for her as a thing that was abnormal and difficult of attainment because she was of aristocratic rank, because she was wealthy, because she was a devotee, 
imagining that she had a delicacy of sentiment as rare as the lace she wore, together with amulets on her skin, and modest instincts, even in her depravity. He made a certain use of his old passion for Madame Arnoux, ushering in his new flames hearing all those amorous sentiments which the other had caused him to feel in downright earnest, and pretending that it was Madame d'Ambrose herself who had occasioned them. She received these vows like one accustomed to such things, and without giving him a formal repulse did not yield in the slightest degree, and he came no nearer to seducing her than Martinon did to getting married. In order to bring matters to an end with her niece's suitor, she accused him of having money for his object, and even begged of her husband to put the matter to the test. Monsieur d'Ambrose then declared to the young man that Cecil, being the orphan child of poor parents, had neither expectations nor a dowry. Martinot, not believing that this was true, or feeling that he had gone too far to draw back, or through one of those outbursts of idiotic infatuation which may be described as acts of genius, replied that his patrimony, amounting to 15,000 francs a year, would be sufficient for them. The banker was touched by this unexpected display of disinterestedness. He promised the young man a tax collectorship undertaking to obtain the post for him, and in the month of May 1850, Martinot married Mademoiselle Cécile. There was no ball to celebrate the event. The young people started the same evening for Italy. Frederick came next day to pay a visit to Madame d'Ambrose. She appeared to him paler than usual. She sharply contradicted him about two or three matters of no importance. However, she went on to observe all men were egoists. There were, however, some devoted men, though he might happen himself to be the only one. Pooh, pooh, you're just like the rest of them. Her eyelids were red. She had been weeping, then forcing a smile. Pardon me, I am in the wrong. Sad thoughts have taken possession of my mind. He could not understand what she meant to convey by the last words. No matter, she is not so hard to overcome as I imagined, he thought. She rang for a glass of water, drank a mouthful of it, sent it away again, and then began to complain of the wretched way in which her servants attended on her. In order to amuse her, he offered to become her servant himself, pretending that he knew how to hand round plates, dust furniture, and announce visitors. In fact, to do the duties of a valet de chambre, or rather, of a running footman. Although the latter was now out of fashion, he would have liked to cling on behind her carriage with a hat adorned with cock's feathers. And how I would follow you with majestic stride carrying your pug on my arm. You are facetious, said Madame d'Ambrose. Was it not a piece of folly he returned to take everything seriously? There were enough of miseries in the world without creating fresh ones. Nothing was worth the cost of a single pang. Madame d'Ambrose raised her eyelids with a sort of vague approval. This agreement in their views of life impelled Frederick to take a bolder course. His former miscalculations now gave him insight. He went on. Our grandsires lived better. Why not obey the impulse that urges us onward? After all, love was not a thing of such importance in itself. But what you have just said is immoral. She had resumed her seat on the little sofa. He sat down at the side of it, near her feet. Don't you see that I am lying? For in order to please women, one must exhibit the thoughtlessness of a buffoon or all the wild passion of tragedy. They only laugh at us when we simply tell them that we love them. For my part, I consider those hyperbolical phrases which tickle their fancy a profanation of true love, so that it is no longer possible to give expression to it especially when addressing women who possess more than ordinary intelligence. She gazed at him from under her drooping eyelids. He lowered his voice while he bent his head closer to her face. Yes, you frighten me. Perhaps I am offending you. Forgive me. I did not intend to say all that I have said. It is not my fault. You are so beautiful. Madame D'Ambrose closed her eyes, and he was astonished at his easy victory. The tall trees and the clouds streaked the sky with long strips of red and on Every side there seemed to be a, a suspension of vital movements. And he recalled to mind, in a confused sort of way, evenings just the same as this, filled with the same unbroken silence. Where was it that he had known them? He sank upon his knees, seized her hand, and swore that he would love her forever. Then, as he was leaving her, she beckoned to him to come back, and said to him in a low tone, Come by and by and dine with us, we'll be all alone. It seemed to Frederick, as he descended the stairs that he had become a different man, that he was surrounded by the balmy temperature of hot houses, and that he was, beyond all question, entering into the higher sphere of patrician adulteries and lofty intrigues. In order to occupy the first rank, there all he required was a woman of the stamp, 
Greedy, no doubt, of power and of success, and married to a man of inferior caliber, for whom she had done prodigious services. She longed for some one of ability in order to be his guide. Nothing was impossible now. He felt himself capable of riding two hundred leagues on horseback, of traveling for several nights in succession without fatigue. His heart overflowed with pride. Just in front of him, on the footpath, a man wrapped in a seedy overcoat was walking, with downcast eyes and with such an air of de dejection that Frederick, as he passed, turned aside to have a better look at him. The other raised his head. It was Delaria. He hesitated. Frederick fell upon his neck. Ah, my poor old friend, what tis you? And he dragged Delaria into his house at the same time, asking his friend a heap of questions. The three Berlin's excommission commenced by describing the tortures to which he had been subjected. As he preached fraternity to the conservatives and respect for the laws to the socialists, the former tried to shoot him, and the latter brought cords to hang him with. After June, he had been brutally dismissed. He found himself involved in a charge of conspiracy, that which was connected with the seizure of arms at Troyes. He had subsequently been released for want of evidence to sustain the charge. Then the acting community had sent him to London, where his ears had been boxed in the very middle of a banquet at which he and his colleagues were being entertained. On his return to Paris, why did you not call here then to see me? You were always out. Your porter had mysterious airs. I did not know what to think, and in the next place I had no desire to reappear before you in the character of a defeated man. He had knocked at the portals of democracy, offering to serve it with his pen, with his tongue, with all his energies. He had been everywhere repelled. They had mistrusted him, and he had sold his watch, his bookcase, and even his linen. It would be much better to be breaking one's back on the pontoon's bell aisle with Seneca. Frederick, who had been fastening his cravat, did not appear to be much affected by this news. Ha, so he has transported this good Seneca. Delaurier replied while he surveyed the walls with an envious air. Not everybody has your luck. Excuse me, said Frederick, without noticing the allusion to his own circumstances. But I am dining in the city. We must get you something to eat. Order whatever you like. Take even my bed. This cordial reception dissipated Delaria's bitterness. Your bed, but that might inconvenience you. Oh, no, I have others. Oh, all right, returned the advocate with a laugh. Pray, where are you dining? And Madame D'Ambrosis, can it be that you are, perhaps? You are too inquisitive, said Frederick with a smile, which confirmed this hypothesis. Then after a glance at the clock, he resumed his seat. That's how it is, and we mustn't despair, my ex-defender of the people. Oh, pardon me, let others bother themselves about the people henceforth. The advocate detested the working men because he had suffered so much on their account in his province, a coal-mining district. Every pit had appointed a provisional government from which he received orders. Besides, their conduct has been everywhere charming, at Lyon, at Lille, at Havre, at Paris. For in imitation of the manufacturers who would fain exclude the products of the foreigners, these gentlemen call on us to banish the English, German, Belgian and Savoyard workmen. As for their intelligence, what was the use of that precious trades union of theirs which they established under the Restoration? In 1830, they joined the National Guard, without having the common sense to gain the upper hand of it. Is it not the fact that since the morning when 1848 dawned, the various trade bodies had not reappeared with their banners? They have even demanded popular representatives for themselves, who are not to open their lips except on their own behalf. All this is the same as the deputies who represent beetroot were to concern themselves about nothing save beetroot. Ah, oh, I've had enough of these dodgers who in turn prostrate themselves before the scaffold of Robespierre, the boots of the emperor, and the umbrella of Louis Philippe, a rabble who always yield allegiance to the person that flings bread into their mouths. They are always crying out against the venality of Talleyrand and Mirabeau, but the messenger down below there would sell his country for fifty centimes if they'd only promise to fix a tariff of three francs on his walk. Ah, oh, what a wretched state of affairs. We ought to set the four corners of Europe on fire. Frederick said in reply, The spark is what you lack. You were simply a lot of shop boys, and even the best of you were nothing better than penniless students. As for the workmen, they may well complain, for if you accept a million taken out of the civil list and of which you made a grant to them with the meanest expressions of flattery. You have done nothing for them, save to talk and steal their phrases. The workman's certificate remains in the hands of the employer, and the person who has paid wages remains, even in the eye of the law, the inferior of his master, because his word is not believed. 
In short, the Republic seems to me a worn-out institution. Who knows? Perhaps progress can be realized only through an aristocracy or through a single man. The initiative always comes from the top. And whatever may be the people's pretensions, they are lower than those placed over them. That may be true, said Delorier. According to Frederick, the vast majority of citizens aimed only at a life of peace. He had been improved by his visits to the Dambrosis, and the chances were all on the side of the conservatives. That party, however, was lacking in new men. If you came forward, I am sure. He did not finish the sentence. Delorier saw what Frederick meant, and passed his two hands over his head, then all of a sudden, but what about yourself? Is there anything to prevent you from doing it? Why would you not be a deputy? In consequence of a double election, there was in the Alp a vacancy for a candidate. Monsieur D'Ambrose, who had been re-elected as a member of the Legislative Assembly, belonged to a different arrondissement. Do you wish me to interest myself on your behalf? He was acquainted with many publicans, schoolmasters, doctors, notaries, clerks, and their masters. Besides, you can make the peasants believe anything you like. Frederick felt his ambition rekindling. Delaurier added, that you would find no trouble in getting a situation for me in Paris. Oh, it would not be hard to manage it through Monsieur D'Ambros. As we happen to have been talking just now about coal mines, the advocate went on, what has become of his big company? Is this the sort of employment that would suit me, and I could make myself useful to them while preserving my own independence? Frederick promised that he would introduce them to the banker before three days had passed. The dinner, which he enjoyed alone with Madame D'Ambros, was a delightful affair. She sat facing him with a smile on her countenance at the opposite side of the table, whereon was placed a basket of flowers, while a lamp suspended above their heads shed its light on the scene, and as the window was open they could see the stars. They talked very little, distressing themselves, no doubt, but the moment the servants had turned their backs they sent across a kiss to one another from the tips of their lips. He told her about his idea of becoming a candidate. She approved of the project promising even to get Monsieur D'Ambros to use every effort on his behalf. As the evening advanced, some of her friends presented themselves to the purpose of congratulating her, and at the same time expressing sympathy with her. She must be so much pained at the loss of her niece. Besides, it was all very well for newly married people to go on a trip. By and by would come encumbrances, children. But really, Italy did not realize one's expectations. They had not as yet passed the age of illusions, and in the next place, the honeymoon made everything look beautiful. The last two who remained behind were Monsieur de Grimonville and Frederick. The diplomatist was not inclined to leave. At last, he departed at midnight. Madame d'Ambrose beckoned to Frederick to go with him and thanked him for this compliance with her wishes by giving him a gentle pressure with her hand more delightful than anything that had gone before. The marshal uttered an exclamation of joy on seeing him again. She had been waiting for him for the last five hours. He gave, as an excuse for the delay, an indispensable step which he had to take in the interests of De Laurier. His face wore a look of triumph and was surrounded by an areola which dazzled Rosinette. "'Tis perhaps on account of your black coat which, which fits you well, but I have never seen you look so handsome. How handsome you are. In a transport of tenderness, she made a vow internally never again to belong to any other man, no matter what might be the consequence. Even if she were to die of want, her pretty eyes sparkled with such intense passion that Frederick took her upon his knees and said to himself, What a rascally part I am playing, while admiring his own perversity. End of chapter 16. Recording by Arden. Chapter 17, Part 1 of Sentimental Education. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sentimental Education by Gustave Flaubert Chapter 17 A Strange Betrothal Part 1 Monsieur d'Ambreuse, when de Laurier presented himself at his house, was thinking of reviving his great coal-mining speculation, but this fusion of all the companies into one was looked upon unfavourably. There was an outcry against monopolies, as if immense capital were not needed for carrying out enterprises of this kind. De Laurier, who had read for the purpose the work of Jobet and the articles of Monsieur Chappe in the Journal des Mines, understood the question perfectly. 
he demonstrated that the law of 1810 established for the benefit of the grantee a privilege which could not be transferred. Besides, a democratic colour might be given to the undertaking. To interfere with the formation of coal mining companies was against the principle even of association. Monsieur d'Ambrez entrusted to him some notes for the purpose of drawing up a memorandum. As for the way in which he meant to pay for the work, he was all the more profuse in his promises from the fact that they were not very definite. Delaurier called again at Frederick's house and gave him an account of the interview. Moreover, he had caught a glimpse of Madame d'Ambrez at the bottom of the stairs, just as he was going out. I wish you joy, upon my soul I do. Then they had a chat about the election. There was something to be devised in order to carry it. Three days later, Delaurier reappeared with a sheet of paper covered with handwriting intended for the newspapers, and which was nothing less than a friendly letter from Monsieur d'Ambrez expressing approval of their friend's candidature. Supported by a conservative and praised by a red, he ought to succeed. How was it that the capitalist had put his signature to such a lucubration? The advocate had, of his own motion, and, without the least appearance of embarrassment, gone and shown it to Madame d'Ambrez, who, thinking it quite appropriate, had taken the rest of the business on her own shoulders. Frederick was astonished at this proceeding. Nevertheless, he approved of it. Then, as de Laurier was to have an interview with Monsieur Roque, his friend explained to him how he stood with regard to Louise. Tell them anything you like, that my affairs are in an unsettled state, that I am putting them in order. She is young enough to wait. De Laurier set forth, and Frederick looked upon himself as a very able man. He experienced, moreover, a feeling of gratification, a profound satisfaction. His delight at being the possessor of a rich woman was not spoiled by any contrast. The sentiment harmonized with the surroundings. His life now would be full of joy in every sense. Perhaps the most delicious sensation of all was to gaze at Madame d'Ambreuse in the midst of a number of other ladies in her drawing-room. The propriety of her manners made him dream of other attitudes. While she was talking in a tone of coldness, he would recall to mind the loving words which she had murmured in his ear. All the respect which he felt for her virtue gave him a thrill of pleasure, as if it were an homage which was reflected back on himself, and at times he felt a longing to exclaim, But I know her better than you. She is mine. It was not long ere their relations came to be socially recognised as an established fact. Madame d'Ambreuse, during the whole winter, brought Frederick with her into fashionable society. He nearly always arrived before her, and he watched her as she entered the house they were visiting with her arms uncovered, a fan in her hand and pearls in her hair. She would pause on the threshold, the lintel of the door formed a framework round her head, and she would open and shut her eyes with a certain air of indecision, in order to see whether he was there. She drove him back in her carriage. The rain lashed the carriage blinds. The passers-by seemed merely shadows wavering in the mire of the street, and, pressed close to each other, they observed all these things vaguely, with a calm disdain. Under various pretexts, he would linger in her room for an entire additional hour. It was chiefly through a feeling of ennui that Madame and D'Ambreuse had yielded. But this latest experience was not to be wasted. She desired to give herself up to an absorbing passion, and so she began to heap on his head adulations and caresses. She sent him flowers. She had an upholstered chair made for him. She made presents to him of a cigar holder, an inkstand, a thousand little things for daily use, so that every act of his life should recall her to his memory. These kind attentions charmed him at first, 
and in a little while appeared to him very simple. She would step into a cab, get rid of it at the opening into a byway, and come out at the other end, and then, gliding along by the walls, with a double veil on her face, she would reach the street where Frederick, who had been keeping watch, would take her arm quickly to lead her towards his house. His two men-servants would have gone out for a walk, and the doorkeeper would have been sent on some errand. She would throw a glance around her, nothing to fear, and she would breathe forth the sigh of an exile who beholds his country once more. Their good fortune emboldened them. Their appointments became more frequent. One evening she even presented herself, all of a sudden, in full ball dress. These surprises might have perilous consequences. He reproached her for her lack of prudence. Nevertheless, he was not taken with her appearance. The low body of her dress exposed her thinness too freely. It was then that he discovered what had hitherto been hidden from him. The disillusion of his senses. Nonetheless, did he make professions of ardent love. But... In order to call up such emotions, he found it necessary to evoke the images of Rosanette and Madame Arnoux. This sentimental atrophy left his intellect entirely untrammeled, and he was more ambitious than ever of attaining a high position in society. Inasmuch as he had such a stepping stone, the very least he could do was to make use of it. One morning, about the middle of January, Senecal entered his study, and, in response to his exclamation of astonishment, announced that he was de Laurier's secretary. He even brought Frederick a letter. It contained good news, and yet it took him to task for his negligence. He would have to come down to the scene of action at once. The future deputy said he would set out on his way there in two days' time. Senecal gave no opinion on the other's merits as a candidate. He spoke about his own concerns and about the affairs of the country. Miserable as the state of things happened to be, it gave him pleasure, for they were advancing in the direction of communism. In the first place, the administration led towards it of its own accord, since every day a greater number of things were controlled by the government. As for property, the constitution of 48, in spite of its weakness, had not spared it. The state might, in the name of public utility, henceforth take whatever it thought would suit it. Senecal declared himself in favour of authority. And Frederick noticed in his remarks the exaggeration which characterised what he had said himself to De Laurier. The Republican even inveighed against the masses for their inadequacy. Robespierre, by upholding the right of the minority, had brought Louis the Sixteenth to acknowledge the National Convention and saved the people. Things were rendered legitimate by the end towards which they were directed. A dictatorship is sometimes indispensable. Long live tyranny, provided that the tyrant promotes the public welfare. Their discussion lasted a long time, and, as he was taking his departure, Senecal confessed, perhaps it was the real object of his visit that de Laurier was getting very impatient at Monsieur d'Ambreuse's silence. But Monsieur d'Ambreuse was ill. Frederick saw him every day, his character of an intimate friend enabling him to obtain admission to the invalid's bedside. General Changarnier's recall had powerfully affected the capitalist's mind. He was, on the evening of the occurrence, seized with a burning sensation in his chest together with an oppression that prevented him from lying down. The application of leeches gave him immediate relief. The dry cough disappeared. The respiration became more easy, and eight days later he said while swallowing some broth, Ah, I'm better now, but I was near going on the last long journey. Not without me, exclaimed Madame d'Ambreuse, intending by this remark to convey that she would not be able to outlive him. Instead of replying, he cast upon her, and upon her lover, a singular smile, in which there was at the same time resignation, indulgence, irony, and even, as it were, a touch of humour, a sort of secret satisfaction almost amounting to actual joy. 
Frederick wished to start for Nausea. Madame d'Ambreuse objected to this, and he unpacked and repacked his luggage by turns according to the changes in the invalid's condition. Suddenly, Monsieur d'Ambreuse spat forth considerable blood. The princes of medical science, on being consulted, could not think of any fresh remedy. His legs swelled, and his weakness increased. He had several times evinced a desire to see Cécile, who was at the other end of France with her husband, now a collector of taxes, a position to which he had been appointed a month ago. Monsieur d'Ambreuse gave express orders to send for her. Madame d'Ambreuse wrote three letters, which she showed him. Without trusting him even to the care of the nun, she did not leave him for one second, and no longer went to bed. The ladies who had their names entered at the door lodge made inquiries about her with feelings of admiration, and the passers-by were filled with respect on seeing the quantity of straw which was placed in the street under the windows. On the 12th of February, at five o'clock, a frightful hemoptysis came on. The doctor who had charge of him pointed out that the case had assumed a dangerous aspect. They sent in hot haste for a priest. While Monsieur d'Ambreuse was making his confession, Madame kept gazing curiously at him some distance away. After this, the young doctor applied a blister and awaited the result. The flame of the lamps, obscured by some of the furniture, lighted up the apartment in an irregular fashion. Frederick and Madame d'Ambreuse, at the foot of the bed, watched the dying man. In the recess of a window, the priest and the doctor chatted in low tones. The good sister on her knees kept mumbling prayers. At last came a rattling in the throat. The hands grew cold. The face began to turn white. Now and then he drew a deep breath all of a sudden, but gradually this became rarer and rarer. Two or three confused words escaped him. He turned his eyes upward, and at the same moment his respiration became so feeble that it was almost imperceptible. Then his head sank on one side of the pillow. For a minute, all present remained motionless. Madame d'Ambreuse advanced towards the dead body of her husband, and, without an effort, with the unaffectedness of one discharging a duty, she drew down the eyelids. Then she spread out her two arms, her figure writhing as if in a spasm of repressed despair, and quitted the room, supported by the physician and the nun. A quarter of an hour afterwards, Frederick made his way up to her apartment. There was in it an indefinable odour, emanating from some delicate substances with which it was filled. In the middle of the bed lay a black dress, which formed a glaring contrast with the pink coverlet. Madame d'Ambreuse was standing at the corner of the mantelpiece. Without attributing to her any passionate regret, he thought she looked a little sad, and in a mournful voice he said, You are enduring pain? I? No, not at all. As she turned around, her eyes fell on the dress which she inspected. Then she told him not to stand on ceremony. Smoke, if you like. You can make yourself at home with me. And with a great sigh. Ah, blessed virgin, what a riddance. Frederick was astonished at this exclamation. He replied as he kissed her hand. All the same, you were free. This allusion to the facility with which the intrigue between them had been carried on hurt Madame d'Ambreuse. Ah, you don't know the services that I did for him, or the misery in which I lived. What? Why, certainly. Was it a safe thing to have always near him that bastard, a daughter, whom he introduced into the house at the end of five years of married life, and who, were it not for me, might have led him into some act of folly? Then she explained how her affairs stood. The arrangement on the occasion of her marriage was that the property of each party should be separate. 
the amount of her inheritance was three hundred thousand francs monsieur d'ambreuse had guaranteed by the marriage contract that in the event of her surviving him she should have an income of fifteen thousand francs a year together with the ownership of the mansion but a short time afterwards he had made a will by which he gave her all he possessed and this she estimated so far as it was possible to ascertain just at present at over three millions frederick opened his eyes widely it was worth the trouble wasn't it however i contributed to it it was my own property i was protecting cecile would have unjustly robbed me of it why did she not come to see her father as he asked her this question madame nambreuse eyed him attentively then in a dry tone i haven't the least idea want of heart probably oh i know what she is and for that reason she won't get a farthing from me she had not been very troublesome he pointed out at any rate since her marriage ha her marriage said madame d'ambreuse with a sneer and she grudged having treated only too well this stupid creature who was jealous self-interested and hypocritical all the faults of her father she disparaged him more and more there was never a person with such profound duplicity and with such a merciless disposition into the bargain as hard as a stone a bad man a bad man even the wisest people fall into errors madame lambreuse had just made a serious one through this overflow of hatred on her part frederick sitting opposite her in an easy chair was reflecting deeply scandalized by the language she had used she arose and knelt down beside him to be with you is the only real pleasure you are the only one i love while she gazed at him her heart softened a nervous reaction brought tears into her eyes and she murmured will you marry me at first he thought he had not understood what she meant he was stunned by this wealth she repeated in a louder tone will you marry me at last he said with a smile have you any doubt about it then the thought forced itself on his mind that his conduct was infamous and in order to make a kind of reparation to the dead man he offered to watch by his side himself but feeling ashamed of this pious sentiment he added in a flippant tone it would be perhaps more seemly perhaps so indeed she said on account of the servants the bed had been drawn completely out of the alcove the nun was near the foot of it and at the head of it sat a priest a different one a tall spare man with the look of a fanatical spaniard on the night table covered with a white cloth three wax tapers were burning frederick took a chair and gazed at the corpse the face was as yellow as straw at the corners of the mouth there were traces of blood-stained foam a silk handkerchief was tied around the skull and on the breast covered with a knitted waistcoat lay a silver crucifix between the two crossed hands it was over this life full of anxieties how many journeys had he not made to various places how many rows of figures had he not piled together how many speculations had he not hatched how many reports had he not heard read what quackeries what smiles and curvets for he had acclaimed napoleon the cossacks louis the eighteenth eighteen thirty the working men every regime loving power so dearly that he would have paid in order to have the opportunity of selling himself but he had left behind him the estate of la fortelle three factories in picardy the woods of crancey in the yonne the farm near orleans and a great deal of personal property in the form of bills and papers frederick thus made an estimate of her fortune and it would soon nevertheless belong to him first of all he thought of what people would say then he asked himself what present he ought to make to his mother and he was concerned about his future equipages and about employing an old coachman belonging to his own family as the doorkeeper 
Of course, the livery would not be the same. He would convert the large reception room into his own study. There was nothing to prevent him by knocking down three walls from setting up a picture gallery on the second floor. Perhaps there might be an opportunity for introducing into the lower portion of the house a hall for Turkish baths. As for Monsieur d'Ambreuse's office, a disagreeable spot. What use could he make of it? These reflections were, from time to time, rudely interrupted by the sounds made by the priest in blowing his nose, or by the good sister in settling the fire. But the actual facts showed that his thoughts rested on a solid foundation. The corpse was there. The eyelids had reopened, and the pupils, although steeped in clammy gloom, had an enigmatic, intolerable expression. Frederick fancied that he saw there a judgment directed against himself, and he felt almost a sort of remorse, for he had never any complaint to make against this man, who, on the contrary, "'Come now, an old wretch!' And he looked at the dead man more closely in order to strengthen his mind, mentally addressing him thus, "'Well, what? Have I killed you?' Meanwhile, the priest read his breviary. The nun, who sat motionless, had fallen asleep. The wicks of the three wax tapers had grown longer. For two hours could be heard the heavy rolling of carts making their way to the markets. The window panes began to admit streaks of white. A cab passed. Then a group of donkeys went trotting over the pavement. Then came strokes of hammers, cries of itinerant vendors of wood and blasts of horns. Already every other sound was blended with the great voice of awakening Paris. Frederick went out to perform the duties assigned to him. He first repaired to the mayor's office to make the necessary declaration. Then, when the medical officer had given him a certificate of death, he called a second time at the municipal buildings in order to name the cemetery which the family had selected and to make arrangements for the funeral ceremonies. The clerk in the office showed him a plan which indicated the mode of interment adopted for the various classes, and a programme giving full particulars with regard to the spectacular portion of the funeral. Would he like to have an open funeral car, or a hearse with plumes, plats on the horses, and aigrettes on the footman, initials, or a coat of arms, funeral lamps, a man to display the family distinctions, and what number of carriages would he require? Frederick did not economise in the slightest degree. Madame d'Ambreuse was determined to spare no expense. After this, he made his way to the church. The curate, who had charge of burials, found fault with the waste of money on funeral pomps. For instance, the officer for the display of armorial distinctions was really useless. It would be far better to have a goodly display of wax tapers. A low mass accompanied by music would be appropriate. Frederick gave written directions to have everything that was agreed upon carried out, with a joint undertaking to defray all the expenses. He went next to the Hôtel de Ville to purchase a piece of ground. A grant of a piece which was two metres in length and one in breadth cost five hundred francs. Did he want a grant for fifty years, or forever? Oh, forever, said Frederick. He took the whole thing seriously, and got into a state of intense anxiety about it. In the courtyard of the mansion, a marble cutter was waiting to show him estimates and plans of Greek, Egyptian, and Moorish tombs. But the family architect had already been in consultation with Madame, and on the table in the vestibule there were all sorts of prospectuses with reference to the cleaning of mattresses, the disinfections of rooms, and the various processes of embalming. After dining, he went back to the tailor's shop to order mourning for the servants, and he had still to discharge another function, for the gloves that he had ordered were of beaver, whereas the right kind for a funeral were floss silk. When he arrived next morning, at ten o'clock, the large reception room was filled with people, and nearly everyone said on encountering the others in a melancholy tone, It's only a month ago since I saw him. Good heavens, it will be the same way with us all. Yes, but let us try to keep it as far away from us as possible. Then there were little smiles of satisfaction, and they even engaged in conversations entirely unsuited to the occasion. At length, the master of the ceremonies, in a black coat in the French fashion and short breeches, with a cloak, cambric morning bands, 
a long sword by his side and a three-cornered hat under his arm, gave utterance, with a bow, to the customary words, Monsieur, when it shall be your pleasure. The funeral started. It was the market day for flowers on the Place de la Madeleine. It was a fine day, with brilliant sunshine, and the breeze, which shook the canvas tents, a little swelled at the edges the enormous black cloth which was hung over the church gate. The escutcheon of Monsieur d'Ambres, which covered a square piece of velvet, was repeated there three times. It was sable, with an arm sinister, or, and a clenched hand, with a glove argent, with the coronet of a count, and this device, by every path. The bearers lifted the heavy coffin to the top of the staircase, and they entered the building. The six chapels, the hemicycles, and the seats were hung with black. The catafalque at the end of the choir formed, with its large wax tapers, a single focus of yellow lights. At the two corners, over the candelabra, flames of spirits of wine were burning. The persons of highest rank took up their position in the sanctuary, and the rest in the nave and then the office for the dead began. With the exception of a few, the religious ignorance of all was so profound that the master of the ceremonies had, from time to time, to make signs to them to rise, to kneel, or to resume their seats. The organ and the two double basses could be heard alternately with the voices. In the intervals of silence, the only sounds that reached the ear were the mumblings of the priest at the altar. Then the music and the chanting went on again. The light of day shone dimly through the three cupolas, but the open door let in, as it were, a stream of white radiance, which, entering in a horizontal direction, fell on every uncovered head. And in the air, halfway towards the ceiling of the church, floated a shadow, which was penetrated by the reflection of the gildings that decorated the ribbing of the pendentives and the foliage of the capitals. Frederick, in order to distract his attention, Listen to the D.S. Ire. He gazed at those around him, or tried to catch a glimpse of the pictures hanging too far above his head, wherein the life of the Magdalen was represented. Luckily, Pellerin came to sit down beside him, and immediately plunged into a long dissertation on the subject of frescoes. The bell began to toll. They left the church. The hearse, adorned with hanging draperies and tall plumes, set out for Père Lachaise, drawn by four black horses, with their manes plaited, their heads decked with tufts of feathers, and with large trappings embroidered with silver flowing down to their shoes. The driver of the vehicle, in hessian boots, wore a three-cornered hat, with a long piece of crepe falling down from it. The cords were held by four personages, a quester of the Chamber of Deputies, a member of the General Council of the Aube, a delegate from the coal-mining company, and Fumichon, as a friend. The carriage of the deceased and a dozen mourning coaches followed. The persons attending at the funeral came in the rear, filling up the middle of the boulevard. The passers-by stopped to look at the mournful procession. Women, with their brats in their arms, got up on chairs, and people, who had been drinking glasses of beer in the cafés, presented themselves at the windows with billiard cues in their hands. The way was long, and, as at formal meals at which people are at first reserved and then expansive, the general deportment speedily relaxed. They talked of nothing but the refusal of an allowance by the chamber to the president. Monsieur Piscatori had shown himself harsh. Montalembert had been magnificent as usual, and Monsieur Chambal Pidou Cretan, in short, the entire committee, would be compelled, perhaps, to follow the advice of Messieurs Quentin Beauchamp and Dufour. This conversation was continued as they passed through the Rue de la Roquette, with shops on each side, in which could be seen only chains of coloured glass and black circular tablets covered with drawings and letters of gold, which made them resemble grottoes full of stalactites and crockery-ware shops. But when they had reached the cemetery gate, everyone instantaneously ceased speaking. The tombs among the trees, broken columns, pyramids, temples, dolmens, obelisks, and Etruscan vaults with doors of bronze. In some of them might be seen funereal boudoirs, so to speak, with rustic armchairs and folding stools. 
spiders webs hung like rags from the little chains of the urns and the bouquets of satin ribbons and the crucifixes were covered with dust everywhere between the balusters on the tombstones may be observed crowns of immortelles and chandeliers vases flowers black discs set off with gold letters and plaster statuettes little boys or little girls or little angels sustained in the air by brass wires several of them have even a roof of zinc overhead huge cables made of glass strung together black white or azure descend from the tops of the monuments to the ends of the flagstones with long folds like boas the rays of the sun striking on them made them scintillate in the midst of the black wooden crosses the hearse advanced along the broad paths which are paved like the streets of a city from time to time the axle trees cracked women kneeling down with their dresses trailing in the grass addressed the dead in tones of tenderness little white fumes arose from the green leaves of the yew trees these came from offerings that had been left behind waste material that had been burnt monsieur d'ambreuse's grave was close to the graves of manuel and benjamin constant the soil in this place slopes with an abrupt decline one has under his feet there the tops of green trees further down the chimneys of steam pumps then the entire great city frederick found an opportunity of admiring the scene while the various addresses were being delivered the first was in the name of the chamber of deputies the second in the name of the general council of the aube the third in the name of the coal minings company of saint et loire the fourth in the name of the agricultural society of the yonne and there was another in the name of a philanthropic society finally just as everyone was going away a stranger began reading a sixth address in the name of the amiens society of antiquaries and thereupon they all took advantage of the occasion to denounce socialism of which monsieur d'ambreuse had died a victim it was the effect produced on his mind by the exhibitions of anarchic violence together with his devotion to order that had shortened his days they praised his intellectual powers his integrity his generosity and even his silence as a representative of the people for if he was not an orator he possessed instead those solid qualities a thousand times more useful etc with all the requisite phrases premature end eternal regrets the better land farewell or rather no au revoir the clay mingled with stones fell on the coffin and he would never again be a subject for discussion in society however there were a few allusions to him as the persons who had followed his remains left the cemetery Husane, who would have to give an account of the interment in the newspapers took up all the addresses in a chaffing style for in truth the worthy d'ambreuse had been one of the most notable port de vin of the last reign then the citizens were driving in the morning coaches to their various places of business the ceremony had not lasted very long they congratulated themselves on the circumstance frederick returned to his own abode quite worn out when he presented himself next day at madame d'ambreuse's residence he was informed that she was busy below stairs in the room where monsieur d'ambreuse had kept his papers the cardboard receptacles and the different drawers had been opened confusedly and the account books had been flung about right and left a roll of papers on which were endorsed the words repayment hopeless lay on the ground he was near falling over it and picked it up madame d'ambreuse had sunk back in the armchair so that he did not see her well where are you what is the matter she sprang to her feet with a bound what is the matter i am ruined ruined do you understand monsieur adolphe langlois the notary had sent her a message to call at his office and had informed her about the contents of a will made by her husband before their marriage he had bequeathed everything to cecile and the other will was lost frederick turned very pale no doubt she had not made sufficient search well then look yourself said madame d'ambreuse pointing at the objects contained in the room 
The two strong boxes were gaping wide, having been broken open with blows of a cleaver, and she had turned up the desk, rummaged in the cupboards, and shaken the straw mattings, when, all of a sudden uttering a piercing cry, she dashed into a corner where she had just noticed a little box with a brass lock. She opened it. Nothing. Ah, the wretch I who took such devoted care of him! Then she burst into sobs. Perhaps it is somewhere else, said Frederick. Oh, no, it was there, in that strong box. I saw it there lately. Tis burned. I'm certain of it. One day, in the early stage of his illness, Monsieur d'Ambreuse had gone down to this room to sign some documents. Tis then he must have done the trick. And she fell back on a chair, crushed. A mother grieving beside an empty cradle was not more woeful than Madame d'Ambreuse was at the sight of the open strong boxes. Indeed, her sorrow, in spite of the baseness of the motive which inspired it, appeared so deep that he tried to console her by reminding her that, after all, she was not reduced to sheer want. It is want, when I am not in a position to offer you a large fortune. She had not more than thirty thousand livres a year, without taking into account the mansion, which was worth from eighteen to twenty thousand, perhaps. Although to Frederick this would have been opulence, he felt, none the less, a certain amount of disappointment. Farewell to his dreams, and to all the splendid existence on which he had intended to enter. Honour compelled him to marry Madame d'Ambreuse. For a minute he reflected. Then, in a tone of tenderness, I'll always have yourself. She threw himself into his arms, and he clasped her to his breast with an emotion in which there was a slight element of admiration for himself. Madame d'Ambreuse, whose tears had ceased to flow, raised her face, beaming all over with happiness, and, seizing his hand, Ah! I never doubted you. I knew I could count on you. The young man did not like this tone of anticipated certainty with regard to what he was pluming himself on as a noble action. Then she brought him into her own apartment, and they began to arrange their plans for the future. Frederick should now consider the best way of advancing himself in life. She even gave him excellent advice with reference to his candidature. The first point was to be acquainted with two or three phrases borrowed from political economy. It was necessary to take up a specialty, such as the stud system, for example to write a number of notes on questions of local interest, to have always at his disposal post offices or tobacconist's shops, and to do a heap of little services. In this respect, Monsieur d'Ambreuse had shown himself a true model. Thus, on one occasion in the country, he had drawn up his wagonette, full of friends of his, in front of a cobbler's stall, and had bought a dozen pair of shoes for his guests, and for himself a dreadful pair of boots, which he had not even the courage to wear for an entire fortnight. This anecdote put them into a good humour. She related others, and that with a renewal of grace, youthfulness, and wit. She approved of his notion of taking a trip immediately to Nogent. Their parting was an affectionate one. Then, on the threshold, she murmured once more, You love me, do you not? Eternally, was his reply. End of chapter 17, part 1. Recording by Kate McKenzie. Chapter 17, Part 2 of Sentimental Education This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sentimental Education by Gustave Flaubert Chapter 17, A Strange Betrothal, Part 2 a messenger was waiting for him at his own house with a line written in lead pencil informing him that rosonette was about to be confined he had been so much preoccupied for the past few days that he had not bestowed a thought upon the matter she had been placed in a special establishment at cheo frederick took a cab and set out for this institution at the corner of the rue de marboeuf he read on a board in big letters private lying in hospital kept by madame alessandri first-class midwife, ex-pupil of the maternity, author of various works, etc. Then, in the centre of the street, over the door, a little side door, there was another signboard. 
private hospital of Madame Alessandri, with all her titles. Frederick gave a knock. A chambermaid, with the figure of an Abigail, introduced him into the reception room, which was adorned with a mahogany table and armchairs of garnet velvet, and with a clock under a globe. Almost immediately, Madame appeared. She was a tall brunette of forty, with a slender waist, fine eyes, and the manners of good society. She apprised Frederick of the mother's happy delivery, and brought him up to her apartment. Rosanette broke into a smile of unutterable bliss, and, as if drowned in the floods of love that were suffocating her, she said in a low tone, A boy, there, there, pointing towards a cradle close to her bed. He flung open the curtains, and saw, wrapped up in linen, a yellowish-red object, exceedingly shriveled-looking, which had a bad smell, and which was bawling lustily. "'Embrace him,' he replied in order to hide his repugnance. "'But I am afraid of hurting him.' "'No, no.' Then, with the tips of his lips, he kissed his child. "'How like you he is!' and with her two weak arms she clung to his neck with an outburst of feeling which he had never witnessed on her part before. The remembrance of Madame d'Ambreuse came back to him. He reproached himself as a monster for having deceived this poor creature, who loved and suffered with all the sincerity of her nature. For several days he remained with her till night. She felt happy in this quiet place. The window shutters in front of it remained always closed. Her room hung with bright chintz, looked out on a large garden. Madame Alessandri, whose only shortcoming was that she liked to talk about her intimate acquaintanceship with eminent physicians, showed her the utmost attention. Her associates, nearly all provincial young ladies, were exceedingly bored, as they had nobody to come to see them. Rosanette saw that they regarded her with envy, and told this to Frederick with pride. It was desirable to speak low, nevertheless. The partitions were thin, and everyone stood listening at hiding places in spite of the constant thrumming of the pianos. At last, he was about to take his departure for Nogent, when he got a letter from des Lauriers. Two fresh candidates had offered themselves, the one a conservative, the other a red. A third, whatever he might be, would have no chance. It was all Frederick's fault. He had let the lucky moment pass by. He should have come sooner and stirred himself. You have not even been seen at the agricultural assembly. The advocate blamed him for not having any newspaper connection. Ah, if you had followed my advice long ago. If we had only a public print of our own. He laid special stress on this point. However, many persons who would have voted for him out of consideration for Monsieur d'Ambreuse abandoned him now. De Laurier was one of the number. Not having anything more to expect from the capitalist, he had thrown over his protégé. Frederick took the letter to show it to Madame Lambreuse. "'You have not been to Nogent, then,' said she. "'Why do you ask?' "'Because I saw De Laurier three days ago.' Having learned that her husband was dead, the advocate had come to make a report about the coal mines and to offer his services to her as a man of business. This seemed strange to Frederick. And what was his friend doing down there? Madame Lambreuse wanted to know how he had spent his time since they had parted. I have been ill, he replied. You ought at least to have told me about it. Oh, it wasn't worth while. Besides, he had to settle a heap of things, to keep appointments and to pay visits. From that time forth, he led a double life sleeping religiously at the Maréchal's abode and passing the afternoon of Madame d'Ambreuse, so that there was scarcely a single hour of freedom left to him in the middle of the day. The infant was in the country at Andilly. They went to see it once a week. The wet nurse's house was on rising ground in the village, at the end of a little yard as dark as a pit, with straw on the ground, hens here and there, and a vegetable cart under the shed. Rosanette would begin by frantically kissing her baby, and, seized with a kind of delirium, would keep moving to and fro, trying to milk the she-goat, eating big pieces of bread, and inhaling the odour of manure. She even wanted to put a little of it into her handkerchief. Then they took long walks, in the course of which she went into the nurseries, tore off branches from the lilac trees which hung down over the walls, and exclaimed, "'Gee ho, donkey!' to the asses that were drawing cars along and stopped to gaze through the gate into the interior of one of the lovely gardens, 
or else the wet nurse would take the child and place it under the shade of a walnut tree, and for hours the two women would keep talking the most tiresome nonsense. Frederick, not far away from them, gazed at the beds of vines on the slopes, with here and there a clump of trees, at the dusty paths resembling strips of grey ribbon, at the houses which showed white and red spots in the midst of the greenery and sometimes the smoke of a locomotive stretched out horizontally to the bases of the hills, covered with foliage like a gigantic ostrich's feather, the thin end of which was disappearing from view. Then his eyes once more rested on his son. He imagined the child grown into a young man. He would make a companion of him. But perhaps he would be a blockhead, a wretched creature. In any event, he was always oppressed by the illegality of the infant's birth. It would have been better if he had never been born. And Frederick would murmur, Poor child, his heart swelling with feelings of unutterable sadness. They often missed the last train. Then Madame Nambreuse would scold him for his want of punctuality. He would invent some falsehood. It was necessary to invent some explanations too, to satisfy Rosanette. She could not understand how he spent all his evenings. And when she sent a messenger to his house, he was never there. One day, when he chanced to be at home, the two women made their appearance almost at the same time. He got the maréchal to go away, and concealed Madame d'Ambreuse, pretending that his mother was coming up to Paris. Ere long he found these lies amusing. He would repeat to one the oath which he had just uttered to the other, send them bouquets of the same sort, write to them at the same time, and then would institute a comparison between them. There was a third always present in his thoughts. The impossibility of possessing her seemed to him a justification of his perfidies, which were intensified by the fact that he had to practice them alternately, and the more he deceived, no matter which of the two, the fonder of him she grew, as if the love of one of them added heat to that of the other, and as if by a sort of emulation each of them were seeking to make him forget the other. "'Admire my confidence in you,' said Madame d'Ambreuse one day to him, opening a sheet of paper in which she was informed that Monsieur Moreau and a certain Rose Bron were living together as husband and wife. "'Can it be that this is the lady of the races?' "'What an absurdity!' he returned. "'Let me have a look at it.' The letter, written in Roman characters, had no signature. Madame d'Ambreuse, in the beginning, had tolerated this mistress, who furnished a cloak for their adultery. But— as her passion became stronger, she had insisted on a rupture, a thing which had been effected long since, according to Frederick's account, and when he had ceased to protest, she replied, half closing her eyes, in which shone a look like the point of a stiletto under a muslin robe. Well, and the other? What other? The earthenware dealer's wife. He shrugged his shoulders disdainfully. She did not press the matter. But, a month later, while they were talking about honour and loyalty, and he was boasting about his own, in a casual sort of way, for the sake of precaution, she said to him, "'It is true. You are acting uprightly. You don't go back there any more.' Frederick, who at the moment, thinking of the Marechal, stammered, "'Where, pray?' "'To Madame Arnoux.' He implored her to tell him from whom she got the information." It was through her second dressmaker, Madame Regimbar. So, she knew all about his life, and he knew nothing about hers. In the meantime, he had found in her dressing room the miniature of a gentleman with long moustaches. Was this the same person about whose suicide a vague story had been told him at one time? But there was no way of learning any more about it. However, what was the use of it? The hearts of women are like little pieces of furniture wherein things are secreted, full of drawers fitted into each other. One hurts himself, breaks his nails in opening them, and then finds within only some withered flower, a few grains of dust or emptiness. And then, perhaps, he felt afraid of learning too much about the matter. She made him refuse invitations where she was unable to accompany him, stuck to his side, was afraid of losing him, and, in spite of this union, which was every day becoming stronger, all of a sudden, abysses disclosed themselves between the pair about the most trifling questions an estimate of an individual or a work of art she had a style of playing on the piano which was correct and hard her spiritualism madame lamprose believed in the transmigration of souls into the stars did not prevent her from taking the utmost care of her cash-box 
she was haughty towards her servants her eyes remained dry at the sight of the rags of the poor in the expressions of which she habitually made use a candid egoism manifested itself what concern is that of mine i should be very silly what need have i and a thousand little acts incapable of analysis revealed hateful qualities in her she would have listened behind doors she could not help lying to her confessor through a spirit of despotism she insisted on frederick going to the church with her on sunday he obeyed and carried her prayer book the loss of the property she had expected to inherit had changed her considerably these marks of grief which people attributed to the death of monsieur d'ambrez rendered her interesting and as in former times she had a great number of visitors since frederick's defeat at the election she was ambitious of obtaining for both of them an embassy in germany therefore the first thing they should do was submit to the reigning ideas some persons were in favour of the empire others of the orleans family and others of the comte de chambord but they were all of one opinion as to the urgency of decentralization and several expedients were proposed with that view such as to cut up paris into many large streets in order to establish villages there to transfer the seat of government to versailles to have the schools set up at bourges to suppress the libraries and to entrust everything to the generals of division and they glorified a rustic existence on the assumption that the uneducated man had naturally more sense than other men hatreds increased hatred of primary teachers and wine merchants of the classes of philosophy of the courses of lectures on history of novels red waistcoats long beards of independence in any shape or any manifestation of individuality for it was necessary to restore the principle of authority let it be exercised in the name of no matter whom let it come from no matter where as long as it was force authority the conservatives now talked in the very same way as senecal frederick was no longer able to understand their drift and once more he found at the house of his former mistress the same remarks uttered by the same men the salons of the unmarried women it was from this period that their important states were a sort of neutral ground where reactionaries of different kinds met Husserne, who gave himself up to the depreciation of contemporary glories a good thing for the restoration of order inspired rosanette with a longing to have evening parties like any other he undertook to publish accounts of them and first of all he brought a man of grave deportment fumichon then came nonancourt monsieur de cremonville the sieur de la silois ex-prefect and sisi who was now an agriculturist in lower brittany and more christian than ever in addition men who had at one time been the marechal's lovers such as the baron de Comaine, the comte de jumillac and others presented themselves and frederick was annoyed by their free and easy behaviour in order that he might assume the attitude of master in the house he increased the rate of expenditure there then he went in for keeping a groom took a new habitation got a fresh supply of furniture these displays of extravagance were useful for the purpose of making his alliance appear less out of proportion with his pecuniary position the result was that his means were soon terribly reduced and rosanette was entirely ignorant of the fact one of the lower middle class who had lost caste she adored domestic life a quiet little home however it gave her pleasure to have an at-home day in referring to persons of her own class she called them those women she wished to be a society lady and believed herself to be one she begged of him not to smoke in the drawing-room any more and for the sake of good form tried to make herself look thin she played her part badly after all for she grew serious and even before going to bed always exhibited a little melancholy just as there are cypress trees at the door of a tavern he found out the cause of it she was dreaming of marriage she too frederick was exasperated at this besides he recalled to mind her appearance at madame arnoux's house and then he cherished a certain spite against her for having held out against him so long he made inquiries none the less as to who her lovers had been she denied having had any relations with any of the persons he mentioned a sort of jealous feeling took possession of him he irritated her by asking questions about presents that had been made to her and were still being made to her 
and in proportion to the exciting effect which the lower portion of her nature produced upon him he was drawn towards her by momentary illusions which ended in hate her words her voice her smile all had an unpleasant effect on him and especially her glances with that woman's eye forever limpid and foolish sometimes he felt so tired of her that he would have seen her die without being moved at it but how could he get into a passion with her she was so mild that there was no hope of picking a quarrel with her des lauriers reappeared and explained his sojourn at nogent by saying that he was making arrangements to buy a lawyer's office frederick was glad to see him again it was somebody and as a third person in the house he helped to break the monotony the advocate dined with them from time to time and whenever any little disputes arose always took rosinette's part so that frederick on one occasion said to him ah you can have with her if it amuses you so much did he long for some chance of getting rid of her about the middle of the month of june she was served with an order made by the law courts by which maitre athanase gautereau sheriff's officer called on her to pay him four thousand francs due to mademoiselle clemence vatnas if not he would come to make a seizure on her in fact of the four bills which she had at various times signed only one had been paid the money which she happened to get since then having been spent on other things that she required she rushed off at once to see arnoux he now lived in the faubourg saint germain and the porter was unable to tell her the name of the street she made her way next to the houses of several friends of hers could not find one of them at home and came back in a state of utter despair she did not wish to tell frederick anything about it fearing lest this new occurrence might prejudice the chance of a marriage between them on the following morning monsieur athanas gautereau presented himself with two assistants close behind him one of them sallow with a mean-looking face and an expression of devouring envy in his glance the other wearing a collar and straps drawn very tightly with a sort of thimble of black taffeta on his index finger and both ignobly dirty with greasy necks and the sleeves of their coats too short their employer a very good-looking man on the contrary began by apologizing for the disagreeable duty he had to perform while at the same time he threw a look around the room full of pretty things upon my word of honor he added not to speak of the things that can't be seized at a gesture the two bailiff's men disappeared then he became twice as polite as before could any one believe that a lady so charming would not have a genuine friend a sale of her goods under an order of the courts would be a real misfortune one never gets over a thing like that he tried to excite her fears then seeing that she was very much agitated suddenly assumed a paternal tone he knew the world he had been brought into business relations with all these ladies and as he mentioned their names he examined the frames of the pictures on the walls they were old pictures of the worthy arnoux sketches by sombari watercolours by bourrieux and three landscapes by ditmer it was evident that rosinette was ignorant of their value maitre gotero turned round to her look here to show that i am a decent fellow do one thing give me up those ditmers here and i am ready to pay all do you agree at that moment frederick who had been informed about the matter by delphine in the anteroom and who had just seen the two assistants came in with his hat on his head in a rude fashion maitre gotero resumed his dignity and as the door had been left open come on gentlemen right down in the second room let us say an oak table with its two leaves two sideboards frederick here stopped him asking whether there was not some way of preventing the seizure oh certainly who paid for the furniture i did well draw up a claim you still have time to do it maitre gotero did not take long in writing out his official report wherein he directed that mademoiselle Brun should attend at an inquiry in chambers with reference to the ownership of the furniture and having done this he withdrew frederick uttered no reproach he gazed at the traces of mud left on the floor by the bailiff's shoes and speaking to himself it will soon be necessary to look about for money ah oh, my god how stupid i am said the marechal she ransacked a drawer took out a letter and made her way rapidly to the longer dock gas lighting company in order to get the transfer of her shares she came back an hour later the interest in the shares 
had been sold to another. The clerk had said, in answer to her demand, while examining the sheet of paper containing Arnoux's written promise to her, "'This document in no way constitutes you the proprietor of the shares. The company has no cognizance of the matter.' In short, he sent her away unceremoniously, while she choked with rage. And Frederick would have to go to Arnoux's house at once to have the matter cleared up. But Arnoux would perhaps imagine that he had come to recover in an indirect fashion the fifteen thousand francs due on the mortgage which he had lost. And then this claim, from a man who had been his mistress's lover, seemed to him a piece of baseness. Selecting a middle course, he went to the Nambre's mansion to get Madame Regimbaud's address, sent a messenger to her residence, and in this way ascertained the name of the café which the citizen now haunted. It was the little café on the Place de la Bastille, in which he sat all day in the corner to the right at the lower end of the establishment, never moving any more than if he were a portion of the building. After having gone successively through the half-cup of coffee, the glass of grog, the bishop, the glass of mulled wine, and even the red wine and water, he fell back on beer, and every half-hour he let fall this word, bock, having reduced his language to what was actually indispensable. Frederick asked him if he saw Arnoux occasionally. No? Look here, why? An imbecile. Politics, perhaps, kept them apart, and so Frederick thought it a judicious thing to inquire about Compin. What a brute, said Regimbar. How is that? His calf's head. Huh? Explain to me what the calf's head is. Regimbar's face wore a contemptuous smile. Some tomfoolery. After a long interval of silence, Frederick went on to ask, So, then, he has changed his address? Who? Arnoux. Yes, Rue de Fleurus. What number? Do I associate with the Jesuits? What? Jesuits? The citizen replied angrily, With the money of a patriot who... I introduced to him. This pig has set up a dealer in beads. It isn't possible. Go there and see for yourself. It was perfectly true. Arnoux, enfeebled by a fit of sickness, had turned religious. Besides, he had always had a stock of religion in his composition, and, with that mixture of commercialism and ingenuity which was natural to him, in order to gain salvation and fortune both together, he had begun to traffic in religious objects. Frederick had no difficulty in discovering his establishment, on whose signboard appeared these words, Emporium of Gothic Art, Restoration of Articles Used in Ecclesiastical Ceremonies, Church Ornaments, Polychromatic Sculpture, Frankincense of the Magi, Kings, etc., etc., at the two corners of the shop window rose two wooden statues streaked with gold, cinnabar, and azure, a St. John the Baptist with his sheepskin, and a St. Genevieve with roses in her apron and a distaff under her arm. Next, groups in plaster, a good sister teaching a little girl, a mother on her knees beside a little bed, and three collegians before the holy table. The prettiest object there was a kind of chalet representing the interior of a crib with the ass, the ox, and the child Jesus stretched on straw, real straw. From the top to the bottom of the shelves could be seen medals by the dozen, every sort of beads, holy water basins in the form of shells, and portraits of ecclesiastical dignitaries, amongst whom Monsignor Afre and our Holy Father shone forth with smiles on their faces. Arnoux sat asleep at his counter with his head down. He had aged terribly. He had, even round his temples, a wreath of rosebuds, and the reflection of the gold crosses touched by the rays of the sun fell over him. Frederick was filled with sadness at this spectacle of decay. Through devotion to the Maréchal, he, however, submitted to the ordeal and stepped forward. At the end of the shop, Madame Arnoux showed herself. Thereupon, he turned on his heel. I couldn't see him, he said when he came back to Rosanette, and in vain he went on to promise that he would write at once to his notary at Havre for some money. She flew into a rage. She had never seen a man so weak, so flabby. While she was enduring a thousand privations, other people were enjoying themselves. Frederick was thinking about poor Madame Arnoux and picturing to himself the heart-rending impoverishment of her surroundings. 
he had seated himself before the writing desk and as rosanette's voice still kept up its bitter railing ah in the name of heaven hold your tongue perhaps you are going to defend them well yes he exclaimed for what's the cause of this display of fury but why is it that you don't want to make them pay up tis for fear of vexing your old flame confess it he felt an inclination to smash her head with the timepiece words failed him he relapsed into silence rosanette as she walked up and down the room continued i am going to hurl a writ at this arnoux of yours oh i don't want your assistance but i'll get legal advice three days later delphine rushed abruptly into the room where her mistress sat madame madame there's a man here with a pot of paste who has given me a fright rosanette made her way down to the kitchen and saw there a vagabond whose face was pitted with smallpox moreover one of his arms was paralysed and he was three-fourths drunk and hiccuped every time he attempted to speak this was maitre gautereau's bill sticker the objections raised against the seizure having been overruled the sale followed as a matter of course for his trouble in getting up the stairs he demanded in the first place a half glass of brandy then he wanted another favour namely tickets for the theatre on the assumption that the lady of the house was an actress after this he indulged for some minutes in winks whose import was perfectly incomprehensible finally he declared that for forty sous he would tear off the corners of the poster which he had already affixed to the door below stairs rosanette found herself referred to by name in it a piece of exceptional harshness which showed the spite of the vatnaz she had at one time exhibited sensibility and had even while suffering from the effects of a heartache written to Béranger for his advice. But, under the ravages of life's storms, her spirit had become soured, for she had been forced in turn to give lessons on the piano, to act as manageress of a table d'hôte, to assist others in writing for the fashion journals, to sublet apartments and to traffic in lace in the world of light women, her relations with whom enabled her to make herself useful to many persons, and amongst others, to Arnoux. She had formerly been employed in a commercial establishment there it was one of her functions to pay the workwomen and for each of them there were two livres one of which always remained in her hands dusardier who through kindness kept the amount payable to a girl named hortense bazelin presented himself one day at the cash office at the moment when mademoiselle vatnaz was presenting this girl's account one thousand six hundred and eighty two francs which the cashier paid her now on the very day before this dusardier had entered down the sum as one thousand and eighty-two in the girl Baslin's book. He asked to have it given back to him on some pretext. Then, anxious to bury out of sight the story of this theft, he stated that he had lost it. The workwoman ingenuously repeated this falsehood to Mademoiselle Vatnaz, and the latter, in order to satisfy her mind about the matter, came with a show of indifference to talk to the shopman on the subject. He contented himself with the answer. I have burned it. That was all. A little while afterwards, she quitted the house, without believing that the book had been really destroyed, and filled with the idea that Dusardier had preserved it. On hearing that he had been wounded, she rushed to his abode with the object of getting it back. Then, having discovered nothing in spite of the closest searches, she was seized with respect, and presently with love, for this youth, so loyal, so gentle, so heroic, and so strong. At her age, such good fortune in an affair of the heart was a thing that one would not expect. She threw herself into it with the appetite of an ogress, and she had given up literature, socialism, the consoling doctrines and the generous utopias, the course of lectures which she had projected on the desubaltonization of woman, everything, even Delmar himself. Finally, she offered to unite herself to Dusardier in marriage. Although she was his mistress, he was not at all in love with her. Besides, he had not forgotten her theft. Then she was too wealthy for him. He refused her offer. Thereupon, with tears in her eyes, she told him about what she had dreamed. It was to have for both of them a confectioner's shop. She possessed the capital that was required beforehand for the purpose, and next week this would be increased to the extent of four thousand francs. By way of explanation, she referred to the proceedings she had taken against the Maréchal. Dusardier was annoyed at this on account of his friend. He recalled to mind the cigar-holder that had been presented to him at the guardhouse, 
the evenings spent in the quai napoleon the many pleasant chats the books lent to him the thousand acts of kindness which frederick had done in his behalf he begged of the vatnaz to abandon the proceedings she rallied him on his good nature while exhibiting an antipathy against rosinette which he could not understand she longed only for wealth in fact in order to crush her by and by with her four-wheeled carriage Dussardier was terrified by these black abysses of hate, and when he had ascertained what was the exact day fixed for the sale, he hurried out. On the following morning, he made his appearance at Frederick's house with an embarrassed countenance. I owe you an apology. For what, pray? You must take me for an ingrate. I, whom she is the... He faltered. Oh, I'll see no more of her. I am not going to be her accomplice and as the other was gazing at him in astonishment isn't your mistress's furniture to be sold in three days time who told you that herself the vatnaz but i am afraid of giving you offence impossible my dear friend ah that is true you are so good and he held out to him in a cautious fashion a hand in which he clasped a little pocket-book made of sheep leather it contained four thousand francs all his savings what oh no no i knew well i would wound your feelings returned de Sadier with a tear in the corner of his eye frederick pressed his hand and the honest fellow went on in a piteous tone take the money give me that much pleasure i am in such a state of despair can it be furthermore that all is over i thought we should be happy when the revolution had come do you remember what a beautiful thing it was how freely we breathed but here we are flung back into a worse condition of things than ever now they are killing our republic just as they killed the other one the roman ay and poor venice poor poland poor hungary what abominable deeds first of all they knocked down the trees of liberty then they restricted the right to vote shut up the clubs re-established the censorship and surrendered to the priests the power of teaching so that we might look out for the inquisition why not the conservatives want to give us a taste of the stick the newspapers are fined merely for pronouncing an opinion in favour of abolishing the death penalty paris is overflowing with bayonets Sixteen departments are in a state of siege, and then the demand for amnesty is again rejected. He placed both hands on his forehead, then, spreading out his arms as if his mind were in a distracted state. If, however, we only made the effort. If we were only sincere, we might understand each other. But no, the workmen are no better than the capitalists, you see. At Elberf recently, they refused to help at a fire. There are wretches who profess to regard barbares as an aristocrat in order to make the people ridiculous they want to get nominated for the presidency nado a mason just imagine and there is no way out of it no remedy everybody is against us for my part i have never done any harm and yet this is like a weight pressing down on my stomach if this state of things continues i'll go mad i have a mind to do away with myself i tell you i want no money for myself You'll pay it back to me. Deuce, take it. I am lending it to you. Frederick, who felt himself constrained by necessity, ended up taking the four thousand francs from him. And so they had no more disquietude, so far as the Vatnaz was concerned. But it was not long ere Rosanette was defeated in her action against Arnoux, and through sheer obstinacy she wished to appeal. De Laurier exhausted his energies in trying to make her understand that Arnoux's promise constituted neither a gift nor a regular transfer. She did not even pay the slightest attention to him, her notion being that the law was unjust. It was because she was a woman. Men backed up each other amongst themselves. In the end, however, she followed his advice. He made himself so much at home in the house that, on several occasions, he brought Senecal to dine there. Frederick, who had advanced him money, and even got his own tailor to supply him with clothes, did not like this unceremoniousness and the advocate gave his old clothes to the socialist, whose means of existence were now of an exceedingly uncertain character. He was, however, anxious to be of service to Rosanette. One day, when she showed him a dozen shares in the Kaoling Company, that enterprise which led to Arnoux being cast in damages to the extent of 30,000 francs, he said to her, But this is a shady transaction, and you have now a grand chance. She had the right to call on him to pay her debts. In the first place, she could prove that he was jointly bound to pay all the company's liabilities, since he had certified personal debts as collective debts. In short, he had embezzled sums which were payable only to the company. 
All this renders him guilty of fraudulent bankruptcy under Articles 586 and 587 of the Commercial Code, and you may be sure my pet will send him packing. Rosanette threw herself on his neck. He entrusted her case next day to his former master, not having time to devote attention to it himself, as he had business at Nogent. In case of any urgency, Senecal could write to him. His negotiations for the purchase of an office were a mere pretext. He spent his time at Monsieur Roque's house, where he'd begun not only by sounding the praises of their friend, but by imitating his manners and language as much as possible. And in this way he had gained Louise's confidence, while he won over that of her father by making an attack on Ledru Rollin. If Frederick did not return, it was because he mingled in aristocratic society, and gradually Delaurier gave them to understand that he was in love with somebody, that he had a child, and that he was keeping a fallen creature. The despair of Louise was intense. The indignation of Madame Moreau was not less strong. She saw her son whirling towards the bottom of a gulf, the depth of which could not be determined, was wounded in her religious ideas as to propriety, and, as it were, experienced a sense of personal dishonour. Then, all of a sudden, her physiognomy underwent a change. To the questions which people put to her with regard to Frederick, she replied in a sly fashion, He is well, quite well. She was aware that he was about to be married to Madame d'Ambreuse. The date of the event had been fixed, and he was even trying to think of some way of making Rosanette swallow the thing. About the middle of autumn, she won her action with reference to the Caroline shares. Frederick was informed about it by Senecal, whom he met at his own door, on his way back from the courts. It had been held that Monsieur Arnoux was privy to all the frauds, and the ex-tutor had such an air of making merry over it that Frederick prevented him from coming further, assuring Senecal that he would convey the intelligence to Rosanette. He presented himself before her with a look of irritation on his face. Well, now you are satisfied. But without minding what he had said, look here, and she pointed towards her child, which was lying in a cradle close to the fire. She had found it so sick at the house of the wet nurse that morning that she had brought it back with her to Paris. All the infant's limbs were exceedingly thin, and the lips were covered with white specks, which in the interior of the mouth became, so to speak, clots of blood-stained milk. What did the doctor say? Oh, the doctor! He pretends that the journey has increased his... I don't know what it is, some name in... Eight. In short, that he has the thrush. Do you know what that is? Frederick replied without hesitation. Certainly, adding that it was nothing. But in the evening he was alarmed by the child's debilitated look, and by the progress of these whitish spots resembling mould, as if life, already abandoning this little frame, had left now nothing but matter from which vegetation was sprouting. His hands were cold. He was no longer able to drink anything, and the nurse, another woman, whom the porter had gone and taken on chance at an office, kept repeating, "'It seems to me he's very low, very low.' Rosanette was up all night with the child. In the morning she went to look for Frederick. Just come and look at him. He doesn't move any longer. In fact, he was dead. She took him up, shook him, clasped him in her arms, calling him most tender names, covered him with kisses, broke into sobs, turned herself from one side to the other in a state of distraction, tore her hair, uttered a number of shrieks, and then let herself sink on the edge of the divan, where she lay with her mouth open and a flood of tears rushing from her wildly glaring eyes. Then a torpor fell upon her, and all became still in the apartment. The furniture was overturned. Two or three napkins were lying on the floor. It struck six. The nightlight had gone out. Frederick, as he gazed at the scene, could almost believe that he was dreaming. His heart was oppressed with anguish. It seemed to him that this death was only a beginning— and that behind it was a worse calamity, which was just about to come on. Suddenly, Rosanette said in an appealing tone, We'll preserve the body, shall we not? She wished to have the dead child embalmed. There were many objections to this. The principal one, in Frederick's opinion, was that the thing was impracticable in the case of children so young. A portrait would be better. She adopted this idea. He wrote a line to Pellerin, and Delphine hastened to deliver it. Pellerin arrived speedily, anxious by this display of zeal to efface all recollection of his former conduct. The first thing he said was, 
Poor little angel. Oh, my God, what a misfortune. But gradually, the artist in him getting the upper hand, he declared that nothing could be made out of those yellowish eyes, that livid face, that it was a real case of still life, and would therefore require very great talent to treat it effectively, and so he murmured, Oh, tisn't easy, tisn't easy. No matter, as long as it is lifelike, urged Rosanette. Pooh, what do I care about a thing being lifelike? Down with realism. Tis the spirit that must be portrayed by the painter. Let me alone. I am going to try to conjure up what it ought to be. He reflected with his left hand clasping his brow, and with his right hand clutching his elbow. Then, all of a sudden, ha! I have an idea. A pastel with coloured mezzo tints almost spread out flat a lovely model could be obtained with the outer surface alone he sent the chambermaid to look for his box of colours then having a chair under his feet and another by his side he began to throw out great touches with as much complacency as if he had drawn them in accordance with the bust he praised the little saint john of correggio the infanta rosa of velasquez the milk-white flesh tints of reynolds the distinction of lawrence and especially the child with long hair that sits in lady gower's lap Besides, could you find anything more charming than these little toads? The type of the sublime, Raphael has proved it by his Madonnas, is probably a mother with her child. Rosanette, who felt herself stifling, went away, and presently Pellerin said, Well, about Arnu, you know what has happened? No. What? However, it was bound to end that way. What has happened, might I ask? Perhaps by this time he is... Excuse me. The artist got up in order to raise the head of the little corpse higher. You were saying? Frederick resumed. And Pellerin, half closing his eyes in order to take his dimensions better, I was saying that our friend Arnoux is perhaps by this time locked up. Then, in a tone of satisfaction, Just give a little glance at it. Is that the thing? Yes, tis quite right. But about Arnoux? Pellerin laid down his pencil. As far as I could understand, he was sued by one Mignot, an intimate friend of Regimba. A long-headed fellow, that, eh? What an idiot. Just imagine, one day. What? It's not Regimba that's in question, is it? It is indeed. Well, yesterday evening, Arnoux had to produce 12,000 francs. If not, he was a ruined man. Oh, this perhaps is exaggerated, said Frederick. Not a bit. It looked to me a very serious business. Very serious. At that moment, Rosanette reappeared with red spots under her eyes which glowed like dabs of paint. She sat down near the drawing and gazed at it. Pellerin made a sign to the other to hold his tongue on account of her. But Frederick, without minding her. Nevertheless, I can't believe. I tell you, I met him yesterday, said the artist, at seven o'clock in the evening in the Rue Jacob. He had even taken the precaution to have his passport with him. And he spoke about embarking from Havre, he and his whole camp. What? with his wife. No doubt. He is too much of a family man to live by himself. Are you sure of this? Certain, Faith. Where do you expect him to find twelve thousand francs? Frederick took two or three turns around the room. He panted for breath, bit his lips, and then snatched up his hat. Where are you going now? said Rosanette. He made no reply, and the next moment he had disappeared. End of chapter 17, part 2. Recording by Kate McKenzie. Chapter 18 of Sentimental Education. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by D. Cutie Cat in Osaka, Japan. Sentimental Education by Gustave Flaubert Chapter 18 An Auction 12,000 francs should be procured, or, if not, he would see Madame Arnaud no more, and until now there had lingered in his breast an unconquerable hope. Did she not, as it were, constitute the very substance of his heart, the very basis of his life? For some minutes he went staggering along the footpath, his mind tortured with anxiety, and nevertheless gladdened by the thought that he was no longer by the other side. Where was he to get the money? Frederick was well aware from his own experience how hard it was to obtain it immediately, no matter at what cost. There was only one person who could help him in the matter, Madame Dembreuse. 
She always kept a good supply of banknotes in her escritoire. He called at her house, and in an unblushing fashion, Have you twelve thousand francs to lend me? What for? That was another person's secret. She wanted to know who this person was. He would not give way on this point. They were equally determined not to yield. Finally, she declared that she would give nothing until she knew for what purpose it was wanted. Frederick's face became very flushed, and he stated that one of his comrades had committed a theft. It was necessary to replace the sum this very day. Let me know his name, his name. Come, what's his name? Du Chaudière. And he threw himself on his knees, imploring of her to say nothing about it. What idea have you got into your head about me? Madame d'Ambreuse replied. One would imagine that you were the guilty party yourself. Pray, have done with your tragic airs. Hold on, here's the money, and much good may it do him. He hurried off to see Arnaud. That worthy merchant was not in his shop, but he was still residing in the Rue de Paradis, for he had two domiciles. In the Rue de Paradis, the porter said that Monsieur Arnaud had been away since the evening before. As for Madame, he ventured to say nothing, and Frederick, having rushed like an arrow up the stairs, laid his ear against the keyhole. At length, the door was opened. Madame had gone out with Monsieur. The servant could not say when they would be back. Her wages had been paid, and she was leaving herself. Suddenly he heard the door creaking. But is there anyone in the room? Oh, no, Monsieur, it is the wind. Thereupon he withdrew. There was something inexplicable in such a rapid disappearance. Riegenbach, being Mignot's intimate friend, could perhaps enlighten him and Frederick got himself driven to that gentleman's house at Montmartre, in the Rue L'Empereur. Attached to the house, there was a small garden shut in by a grating which was stopped up with iron plates. Three steps before the hall door set off the white front, and a person passing along the footpath could see the two rooms on the ground floor, the first of which was a parlor with ladies' dresses lying on the furniture on every side, and the second, the workshop in which Madame Riegenbach's female assistants were accustomed to sit. They were all convinced that Monsieur had important occupations, distinguished connections, that he was a man altogether beyond comparison. When he was passing through the lobby with his hat cocked up at the sides, his long grey face, and his green frock coat, the girls stopped in the midst of their work. Besides, he never failed to address to them a few words of encouragement some observation which showed his ceremonious courtesy, and afterwards, in their own homes, they felt unhappy at not having been able to preserve him as their ideal. No one, however, was so devoted to him as Madame Riegenbach, an intelligent little woman who maintained him by her handicraft. As soon as Monsieur Moreau had given his name, she came out quickly to meet him, knowing through the servants what his relations were with Madame d'Ambreuse. Her husband would be back in a moment, and Frederick, while he followed her, admired the appearance of the house and the profusion of oilcloth that was displayed in it. Then he waited a few minutes in a kind of office into which the citizen was in the habit of retiring, in order to be alone with his thoughts. When they met, Riegenbach's manner was less cranky than usual. He related Arnaud's recent history. The ex-manufacturer of earthenware had excited the vanity of Mignot, a patriot who owned a hundred shares in the Cicler, by professing to show that it would be necessary from the democratic standpoint to change the management and the editorship of the newspaper. And under the pretext of making his views prevail in the next meeting of shareholders, he had given the other fifty shares, telling him that he could pass them on to reliable friends who would back up his vote. Mignot would have no personal responsibility and need not annoy himself about anyone. Then, when he had achieved success, he would be able to secure a good place in the administration of at least from five to six thousand francs. The shares had been delivered, but Arnaud had at once sold them, and with the money had entered into partnership with a dealer in religious articles. Thereupon came complaints from Mignot, to which Arnaud sent evasive answers. At last the patriot had threatened to bring against him a charge of cheating if he did not restore his share certificates or pay an equivalent sum. 50,000 francs. Frederick's face wore a look of despondency. This is not the whole of it, said the citizen. Mignot, who is an honest fellow, has reduced his claim to one-fourth. 
new promises on the part of the other, and, of course, new dodges. In short, on the morning of the day before yesterday, Mignot sent him a written application to pay up, within 24 hours, 12,000 francs, without prejudice to the balance. But I have the amount, said Frederick. The citizen slowly turned round. Humbug. Excuse me, I have the money in my pocket. I brought it with me. How you do go at it. By Jove, you do. However, tis too late now. The complaint has been lodged, and Arnaud is gone. Alone? No, along with his wife. They were seen at the Havre Terminus. Frederick grew exceedingly pale. Madame Regenbach thought he was going to faint. He regained his self-possession with an effort, and had even sufficient presence of mind to ask two or three questions about the occurrence. Regenbach was grieved at the affair, considering that it would injure the cause of democracy. Arnaud had always been lax in his conduct and disorderly in his life. A regular hair-brained fellow. He burned the candle at both ends. The petticoat has ruined him. Tis not himself that I pity, but his poor wife. For the citizen admired virtuous women, and had a great esteem for Madame Arnaud. She must have suffered a nice lot. Frederick felt grateful to him for his sympathy, and, as if Riegenbach had done him a service, pressed his hand effusively. "'Have you done all that's necessary in the matter?' was Rosanette's greeting to him when she saw him again. "'He had not been able to pluck up courage to do it,' he answered, and walked about the streets at random to divert his thoughts. At eight o'clock they passed into the dining room, but they remained seated face to face in silence, gave vent each to a deep sigh every now and then, and pushed away their plates. Frederick drank some brandy. He felt quite shattered, crushed, annihilated, no longer conscious of anything save a sensation of extreme fatigue. She went to look at the portrait. The red, the yellow, the green, and the indigo made glaring stains that jarred with each other, so that it looked a hideous thing, almost ridiculous. Besides, the dead child was now unrecognizable. The purple hue of his lips made the whiteness of his skin more remarkable. His nostrils were more drawn than before, his eyes more hollow, and his head rested on a pillow of blue taffeta, surrounded by petals of camellias, autumn roses, and violets. This was an idea suggested by the chambermaid, and both of them had thus with pious care arranged the little corpse. The mantelpiece, covered with a cloth of guipure, supported silver gilt candlesticks with bunches of consecrated box in the spaces between them. At the corners, there were a pair of vases in which pastilles were burning. All these things, taken in conjunction with the cradle, presented the aspect of an altar, and Frederick recalled to mind the night when he had watched beside Madame de Bruze's deathbed. Nearly every quarter of an hour, Rosanette drew aside the curtains in order to take a look at her child. She saw him in imagination, a few months hence, beginning to walk, then at college, in the middle of the recreation ground, playing a game of bass, then at twenty years a full-grown young man. And all these pictures conjured up by her brain created for her, as it were, the son she would have lost, had he only lived, the excess of her grief intensifying in her the maternal instinct. Frederick, sitting motionless in another armchair, was thinking of Madame Arnaud. No doubt she was at that moment in a train, with her face leaning against the carriage window, while she watched the country disappearing behind her in the direction of Paris, or else on the deck of a steamboat, as on the occasion when they first met. But this vessel carried her away into distant countries, from which she would never return. He next saw her in a room at an inn, with trunks covering the floor, the wallpaper hanging in shreds, and the door shaking in the wind. And after that, to what would she be compelled to turn? Would she have to become a schoolmistress or a lady's companion, or perhaps a chambermaid? She was exposed to all the vicissitudes of poverty. His utter ignorance as to what her fate might be tortured his mind. He ought either to have opposed her departure, or to have followed her. Was he not her real husband? And as the thought impressed himself on his consciousness that he would never meet her again, that it was all over forever, that she was lost to him beyond recall, he felt, so to speak, a rending of his entire being, and the tears that had been gathering since morning in his heart overflowed. Rosanette noticed the tears in his eyes. "'Ah, you are crying just like me. You are grieving too?' "'Yes, yes, I am.' He pressed her to his heart, and they both sobbed, locked in each other's arms. Madame d'Ambrouze was weeping too, 
as she lay face downwards on her bed with her hands clasped over her head. Olympe Rickenbach, having come that evening to try on her first colored gown after mourning, had told her about Frederick's visit and even about the twelve thousand francs which he had ready to transfer to Monsieur Arnaud. So then, this money, the very money which he had got from her, was intended to be used simply for the purpose of preventing the other from leaving Paris, for the purpose, in fact, of preserving a mistress. At first she broke into a violent rage, and determined to drive him from her door, as she would have driven a lackey. A copious flow of tears produced a soothing effect upon her. It was better to keep it all to herself and say nothing about it. Frederick brought her back the twelve thousand francs on the following day. She begged of him to keep the money, lest he might require it for his friend, and she asked a number of questions about this gentleman. Who, then, had tempted him to such a breach of trust? A woman, no doubt. Women drag you into every kind of crime. This bantering tone put Frederick out of countenance. He felt deep remorse for the calumny he had invented. He was reassured by the reflection that Madame d'Ambruse could not be aware of the facts. All the same, she was very persistent about the subject, for two days later she again made inquiries about his young friend, and, after that, about another, de Lauriers. Is this young man trustworthy and intelligent? Frederick spoke highly of him. Ask him to call me one of these mornings. I want to consult him about a matter of business. She had found a roll of old papers in which there were some bills of Arnaud, which had been duly protested, and which had been signed by Madame Arnaud. It was about these very bills Frederick had called on Monsieur d'Ambruse on one occasion while the latter was at breakfast, and although the capitalist had not sought to enforce repayment of this outstanding debt, he had not only got judgment on foot of them from the Tribunal of Commerce against Arnaud, but also against his wife, who knew nothing about the matter, as her husband had not thought fit to give her any information on the point. Here was a weapon placed in Madame d'Ambruse's hands. She had no doubt about it. But her notary would advise her to take no step in the affair. She would have preferred to act through some obscure person, and she thought of that big fellow with such an impudent expression of face who had offered her his services. Frederick ingenuously performed this commission for her, the advocate was enchanted at the idea of having business relations with such an aristocratic lady. He hurried to Madame d'Ambruse's house. She informed him that the inheritance belonged to her niece, a further reason for liquidating those debts which she should repay, her object being to overwhelm Montaignan's wife by a display of greater attention to the deceased affairs. De Lauriers guessed that there was some hidden design underlying all this, he reflected while he was examining the bills. Madame Arnaud's name, traced by her own hand, brought once more before his eyes her entire person, and the insult which he had received at her hands. Since vengeance was offered to him, why should he not snatch at it? He accordingly advised Madame d'Ambruse to have the bad debts which went with the inheritance sold by auction. A man of straw, whose name would not be divulged, would buy them up, and would exercise the legal rights thus given him to realize them. He would take it on himself to provide a man to discharge this function. Towards the end of the month of November, Frederick, happening to pass through the street in which Madame Arnaud had lived, raised his eyes towards the windows of her house, and saw posted on the door a placard on which was printed in large letters, Sale of valuable furniture, consisting of kitchen utensils, body and table linen, shirts and chemises, lace, petticoats, trousers, French and Indian cashmeres, an erard piano, two Renaissance oak chests, Venetian mirrors, Chinese and Japanese pottery. "'Tis their furniture,' said Frederick to himself, and his suspicions were confirmed by the doorkeeper. As for the person who had given instructions for the sale, he could get no information on that head. But perhaps the auctioneer, Maitre Bourdemont, might be able to throw light on the subject. The functionary did not at first want to tell what creditor was having the sale carried out. Frederick pressed him on the point. It was a gentleman named Seneca, an agent, and Maitre Bourdemont even carried his politeness so far as to lend his newspaper, the Petits Affiches, to Frederick. The latter, on reaching Rosanette's house, flung down this paper on the table, spread wide open. Read that. 
"'Well, what?' said she, with a face so calm that it roused up in him a feeling of revolt. "'Ah, keep up that air of innocence. I don't understand what you mean. "'Tis you who are selling up Madame Arnaud yourself.' She read over the announcement again. "'Where is her name?' "'Gull, tis her furniture. You know that as well as I do.' "'What does that signify to me?' said Rosanette, shrugging her shoulders. "'What does it signify to you? "'But you are taking your revenge, that's all. "'This is the consequence of your persecutions. "'Haven't you outraged her so far as to call at her house? "'You, a worthless creature, "'and this is the most saintly, the most charming, "'the best woman that ever lived. "'Why did you set your heart on ruining her?' I assure you, you are mistaken. Come now, as if you had not put Seneca forward to do this. What nonsense! Then he carried away with rage. You lie, you lie, you wretch! You are jealous of her. You have got the judgment against her husband. Seneca is already mixed up in your affairs. He detests Arnaud, and your two hatreds have entered into a combination with one another. I saw how delighted he was when you won that action of yours about the Kowlin shares. Are you going to deny this? I give you my what? Oh, I know what that's worth, your word. And Frederick reminded her of her lovers, giving their names and circumstantial details. Rosanette drew back, all of the color fading from her face. You are astonished at this. You thought I was blind because I shut my eyes. Now I have had enough of it. We do not die through the treacheries of a woman of your sort. When they become too monstrous, we get out of the way. To inflict punishment on account of them would be only to degrade oneself. She twisted her arms about. My God, who can it be that has changed him? Nobody but yourself. And all this for Madame Arnaud, exclaimed Rosanette, weeping. He replied coldly, I have never loved any woman but her. At this insult, her tears ceased to flow. That shows your good taste. A woman of mature years, with a complexion like licorice, a thick waist, big eyes like the vent holes of a cellar, and just as empty. As you like her so much, go and join her. This is just what I expected. Thank you. Rosanette remained motionless, stupefied by this extraordinary behavior. She even allowed the door to be shut, then... With a bound, she pulled him back into the ante-room and flinging her arms around him. Why, you are mad! You are mad! This is absurd! I love you! Then she changed her tone to one of entreaty. Good heavens! For the sake of our dead infant! Confess that it was you who did this trick, said Frederick. She still protested that she was innocent. You will not acknowledge it? No! Well then, farewell and forever. Listen to me! Frederick turned round. If you understood me better, you would know that my decision is irrevocable. Oh, oh, you will come back to me again. Never, as long as I live. And he slammed the door behind him violently. Rosanette wrote to Deslauriers, saying that she wanted to see him at once. He called one evening, about five days later, and when she told him about the rupture, that's all, a nice piece of bad luck. She thought at first that he would have been able to bring back Frederick, but now all was lost. She ascertained through the doorkeeper that he was about to be married to Madame d'Ambreuse. De Laurier gave her a lecture and showed himself an exceedingly gay fellow, quite a jolly dog, and, as it was very late, asked permission to pass the night in an armchair. Then, next morning, he set out again for Nogent, informing her that he was unable to say when they would meet once more. In a little while, there would perhaps be a great change in his life. Two hours after his return, the town was in a state of revolution. The news went round that Monsieur Frederick was going to marry Madame d'Ambreuse. At length, the three Madame Moselle Alguer, unable to stand it any longer, made their way to the house of Madame Moreau, who, with an air of pride, confirmed this intelligence. Pierre Roc became quite ill when he heard it. Louise locked herself up. It was even rumored that she had gone mad. Meanwhile, Frederick was unable to hide his dejection. Madame d'Ambreuse, in order to divert his mind, no doubt, from gloomy thoughts, redoubled her attentions. Every afternoon, they went out for a drive in her carriage, 
and, on one occasion, as they were passing along the Place de la Bourse, she took the idea into her head to pay a visit to the public auction rooms for the sake of amusement. It was the first of December, the very day on which the sale of Madame Arnaud's furniture was to take place. He remembered the date and manifested his repugnance, declaring that this place was intolerable on account of the crush and the noise. She only wanted to get a peep at it. The brougham drew up. He had no alternative but to accompany her. In the open space could be seen wash-hand stands without basins, the wooden portions of armchairs, old hampers, pieces of porcelain, empty bottles, mattresses, and men in blouses or in dirty frock coats, all gray with dust and mean-looking faces. Some with canvas sacks over their shoulders were chatting in separate groups or hailing each other in a disorderly fashion. Frederick urged that it was inconvenient to go any further. Pooh! And they ascended the stairs. In the first room at the right, gentlemen with catalogues in their hands were examining pictures. In another, a collection of Chinese weapons were being sold. Madame d'Ambrouze wanted to go down again. She looked at the numbers over the doors, and she led him to the end of the corridor towards an apartment which was blocked up with people. He immediately recognized the two whatnots belonging to the office of L'Arts Industrielle, her work table, all her furniture. Heaped up at the end of the room according to their respective heights, they formed a long slope from the floor to the windows, and at the other sides of the apartment, the carpets and the curtains hung down straight along the walls. There were underneath steps occupied by old men who had fallen asleep. At the left rose a sort of counter, at which the auctioneer, in a white cravat, was slightly swinging a little hammer. By his side a young man was writing, and below him stood a sturdy fellow, between a commercial traveler and a vendor of countermarks, crying out, Furniture for sale! Three attendants placed the articles on a table, at the sides of which sat in a row second-hand dealers and old-clothes women. The general public at the auction kept walking in a circle behind them. When Frederick came in, the petticoats, the neckerchiefs, and even the chemises were being passed on from hand to hand and then given back. Sometimes they were flung some distance, and suddenly strips of whiteness went flying through the air. After that, her gowns were sold, and then one of her hats, the broken feather of which was hanging down, then her furs, and then three pairs of boots, and the disposal by sale of these relics, wherein he could trace in a confused sort of way the very outlines of her form, appeared to him an atrocity, as if he had seen carrion crows mangling her corpse. The atmosphere of the room, heavy with so many breaths, made him feel sick. Madame d'Ambrouze offered him her smelling bottle. She said that she found all this highly amusing. The bedroom furniture was now exhibited. Maitre Bethemalt named a price. The crier immediately repeated it in a louder voice, and the three auctioneers' assistants quietly waited for the stroke of the hammer, and then carried off the articles sold to an adjoining apartment. In this way disappeared, one after the other, the large blue carpet spangled with camellias, which her dainty feet used to touch so lightly as she advanced to meet him, the little upholstered easy chair, in which he used to sit facing her when they were alone together, the two screens belonging to the mantelpiece, the ivory of which had been rendered smoother by the touch of her hands, and a velvet pincushion, which was still bristling with pins. It was as if portions of his heart had been carried away with these things, and the monotony of the same voices and the same gestures benumbed him with fatigue, and caused within him a mournful torpor, a sensation like that of death itself. There was a rustle of silk close to his ear. Rosanette touched him. It was through Frederick himself that she had learned about this auction. When her first feelings of vexation was over, the idea of deriving profit from it occurred to her mind. She had come to see it in a white satin vest with pearl buttons, a fur belowed gown, tight-fitting gloves on her hands, and a look of triumph on her face. He grew pale with anger. She stared at the woman who was by his side. Madame d'Ambrouze had recognized her, and for a minute they examined each other from head to foot minutely, in order to discover the defect, the blemish, the one perhaps envying the other's youth, and the other filled with spite at the extreme good form, the aristocratic simplicity of her rival. 
At last, Madame d'Ambreuse turned her head round with a smile of inexpressible insolence. The crier had opened a piano, her piano. While he remained standing before it, he ran the fingers of his right hand over the keys and put the instrument at twelve hundred francs. Then he brought down the figures to one thousand, then to eight hundred, and finally to seven hundred. Madame d'Ambreuse, in a playful tone, laughed at the appearance of some socket that was out of gear. The next thing placed before the second-hand dealers was a little chest with medallions and silver corners and clasps, the same one which he had seen at the first dinner in the Rue des Choiseaux, which had subsequently been in Rosinette's house, and again transferred back to Madame Arnaud's residence. Often, during their conversations, his eyes wandered towards it. He was bound to it by the dearest memories, and his soul was melting with tender emotions about it, when suddenly Madame d'Ambreuse said, "'Look here, I am going to buy that.' "'But it is not a very rare article,' he returned. She considered it, on the contrary, very pretty, and the appraiser commended its delicacy. "'A gem of the Renaissance. Eight hundred francs, messieurs, almost entirely of silver. With a little whiting it can be made to shine brilliantly.' and, as she was pushing forward through the crush of people, "'What an odd idea,' said Frederick. "'You are annoyed at this.' "'No, but what can be done with a fancy article of that sort?' "'Who knows? Love letters might be kept in it, perhaps.' She gave him a look which made the illusion very clear. "'A reason the more for not robbing the dead of their secrets. "'I did not imagine she was dead.' And then in a loud voice she went on to bid, Eight hundred and eighty francs. "'What you are doing is not right,' murmured Frederick. She began to laugh. "'But this is the first favor, dear, that I am asking from you. "'Come now, doesn't it strike you that at this rate you won't be a very considerate husband?' Someone had just at that moment made a higher bid. Nine hundred francs. Nine hundred francs,' repeated Maitre Berthemalt. Nine hundred and ten, fifteen, twenty... Thirty squeaked the auctioneer's crier, with jerky shakes of his head, as he cast a sweeping glance at those assembled around him. "'Show me that I am going to have a wife who is amenable to reason,' said Frederick. And he gently drew her towards the door. The auctioneer proceeded. "'Come, come, messieurs. Nine hundred and thirty. Is there any bidder at nine hundred and thirty? Madame d'Ambreuse, just as she had reached the door, stopped and raising her voice to a high pitch, "'One thousand francs!' There was a thrill of astonishment, and then a dead silence. "'A thousand francs, messieurs, a thousand francs! Is nobody advancing on this bid? Is that clear? Very well, then. One thousand francs. Going. Gone!' And down came the ivory hammer. She passed in her card, and the little chest was handed over to her. She thrust it into her muff. Frederick felt a great chill penetrating his heart. Madame d'Ambreuse had not let go of her hold of his arm, and she had not the courage to look up at his face in the street where her carriage was awaiting her. She flung herself into it, like a thief flying away after a robbery, and then turned towards Frederick. He had his hat in his hand. "'Are you not going to come in?' "'No, madame.' And bowing to her frigidly, he shut the carriage door, and then made a sign to the coachman to drive away. The first feeling that he experienced was one of joy at having regained his independence. He was filled with pride at the thought that he had avenged Madame Arnaud by sacrificing a fortune to her. Then he was amazed at his own act, and he felt doubled up with extreme physical exhaustion. Next morning his manservant brought him the news. The city had been declared to be in a state of siege, the assembly had been dissolved, and a number of the representatives of the people had been imprisoned at Mazas. Public affairs had assumed to his mind an utterly unimportant aspect, so deeply preoccupied was he by his private troubles. He wrote to several tradesmen, countermanding various orders which he had given for the purchase of articles in connection with his projected marriage, which now appeared to him in the light of a rather mean speculation and he execrated Madame d'Ambreuse, because, owing to her, he had been very near perpetrating a vile action. He had forgotten the Maréchal, and did not even bother himself about Madame Arnaud, absorbed only in one thought. 
lost amid the wreck of his dreams, sick at heart, full of grief and disappointment, and in his hatred of the artificial atmosphere wherein he had suffered so much, he longed for the freshness of green fields, the repose of provincial life, a sleeping existence spent beneath his natal roof in the midst of ingenuous hearts. At last, when Wednesday evening arrived, he made his way out into the open air. On the boulevard, numerous groups had taken up their stand. From time to time, a patrol came and dispersed them. They gathered together again in regular order behind it. They talked freely and in loud tones, made chafing remarks about the soldiers without anything further happening. "'What, are they not going to fight?' said Frederick to a workman. "'They're not such fools as to get themselves killed for the well-off people. Let them take care of themselves.' And a gentleman muttered, as he glanced across at the inhabitants of the Faubourgs, socialist rascals, if it were only possible this time to exterminate them. Frederick could not, for the life of him, understand the necessity of so much rancor and vituperative language. His feeling of disgust against Paris was intensified by these occurrences, and two days later he set out for Nogent by the first train. The houses soon became lost to view. The country stretched out before his gaze. Alone in his carriage, with his feet on the seat in front of him, he pondered over the events of the last few days, and then on his entire past. The recollection of Louise came back to his mind. She, indeed, loved me truly. I was wrong not to snatch at this chance of happiness. Pooh! Let us not think any more about it. Then five minutes afterwards, who knows, after all, why not later? His reverie, like his eyes, wandered afar through vague horizons. She was artless, a peasant girl, almost a savage, but so good. In proportion, as he drew nearer to Nogent, her image drew closer to him. As they were passing through the meadows of Sordon, he saw her once more in imagination under the poplar trees, as in the old days, cutting rushes on the edges of the pools. And now they had reached their destination. He stepped out of the train. Then he leaned with his elbows on the bridge to gaze again at the aisle and the garden where they had walked together one sunshiny day, in the dizzy sensation caused by traveling, together with the weakness engendered by his recent emotions, arousing in his breast a sort of exaltation, he said to himself, She has gone out, perhaps. Suppose I were to go and meet her. The bell of Saint Laurent was ringing, and in the square in front of the church there was a crowd of poor people around an open carriage the only one in the district, the one which was always hired for weddings. And all of a sudden, under the church gate, accompanied by a number of well-dressed persons in white cravats, a newly married couple appeared. He thought he must be laboring under some hallucination. But no, it was indeed Louise, covered with a white veil which flowed from her red hair down to her heels, and with her was no other than de Laurier, attired in a blue coat embroidered with silver, the costume of a prefect. How was this? Frederick concealed himself at the corner of a house to let the procession pass. Shamefaced, vanquished, crushed, he retraced his steps to the railway station and returned to Paris. The cabman who drove him assured him that the barricades were erected from the Chateau de Eux to the Gymnase and turned down the Faubourg saint At the corner of the Rue de Provence, Frederick stepped out in order to reach the boulevards. It was five o'clock. A thin shower was falling. A number of citizens blocked up the footpath close to the opera house. The houses opposite were closed. No one at any of the windows. All along the boulevard, dragoons were galloping behind a row of wagons, leaning with drawn swords over their horses, and the plumes of their helmets and their large white cloaks rising up behind them could be seen under the glare of the gas lamps, which shook the wind in the mist of a haze. The crowd gazed at them, mute with fear. In the intervals between the cavalry charges, squads of policemen arrived on the scene to keep back the people in the streets. But on the steps of Tortoni, a man, Dussadier, who could be distinguished at a distance by his great height, remained standing as motionless as a caryatid. One of the police officers, marching at the head of his men, with his three-cornered hat drawn over his eyes, threatened him with his sword. The other thereupon took one step forward and shouted, Long live the Republic! The next moment he fell on his back with his arms crossed. 
A yell of horror arose from the crowd. The police officer, with a look of command, made a circle around him, and Frederick, gazing at him in open-mouthed astonishment, recognized Senecal. End of chapter 18 Chapter number 19 of Sentimental Education This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sentimental Education by Gustave Flaubert Chapter 19 A Bittersweet Reunion He traveled. He realized the melancholy associated with packet boats, the chill one feels on waking up under tents, the dizzy effect of landscapes and ruins, and the bitterness of ruptured sympathies. He returned home. He mingled in society, and he conceived attachments to other women. But the constant recollection of his first love made these appear insipid, and besides the vehemence of desire, the bloom of the sensation had vanished. In like manner, his intellectual ambitions had grown weaker. Years passed, and he was forced to support the burthen of a life in which his mind was unoccupied and his heart devoid of energy. Toward the end of March, 1867, just as it was getting dark, one evening he was sitting all alone in his study when a woman suddenly came in. Madame Arnoux! Frederick! She caught hold of his hands and drew him gently towards the window, and as she gazed into his face she kept repeating tis he yes indeed tis he in the growing shadows of the twilight he could only see her eyes under the black lace veil that hid her face when she had laid down on the edge of the mantelpiece the little pocket-book bound in garnet velvet she seated herself in front of him and they both remained silent unable to utter a word smiling at one another at last he asked her a number of questions about herself and her husband they had gone to live in a remote part of brittany for the sake of economy so as to be able to pay their debts armu who is now almost a chronic invalid seemed to have become quite an old man her daughter had been married and was living at bordeaux and her son was in garrison at mostaganum then she raised her head to look at him again but i see you once more I am happy. He did not fail to let her know that, as soon as he heard of their misfortune, he had hastened to their house. I was fully aware of it. How? She had seen him in the street outside the house and had hidden herself. Why did you do that? Then, in a trembling voice and with long pauses between her words, I, I was afraid. Yes, afraid of you and of myself. This disclosure gave him, as it were, a shock of voluptuous joy. His heart began to throb wildly. She went on, Excuse me for not having come sooner, and pointing towards the little pocket book covered with golden palm branches. I embroidered it on your account expressly. It contains the amount for which the Belleville property was given as security. Frederick thanked her for letting him have the money while chiding her at the same time for having given herself any trouble about it no tis not for this i came i was determined to pay you this visit then i would go back there again and she spoke about the place where they had taken up their boat it was a low-built house of only one story and there was a garden attached to it full of huge box trees and a double avenue of chestnut trees reaching up to the top of the hill from which there was a view of the sea i go there and sit down on a bench which i have called frederick's bench then she proceeded to fix her gaze on the furniture the objects of virtue, the pictures with eager intentness so that she might be able to carry away the impressions of them in her memory. The Maréchal's portrait was half hidden behind a curtain, but the gilding and the white spaces of the picture, which showed their outlines through the midst of the surrounding darkness, attracted her attention. It seems to me I knew the woman. Impossible, said Frederick. It is an old Italian painting. She confessed that she would like to take a walk through the streets on his arm. They went out. The light from the shop windows fell, every now and then on her pale profile. Then once more she was wrapped in shadow, and in the midst of the carriages, the crowd, and the din, they walked on without paying any heed to what was happening around them, without hearing anything, like those who make their way across the fields over beds of dead leaves. 
they talked about the days which they had formerly spent in each other's society the dinners at the time when l'heure industrielle flourished arnaud's fads his habit of drawing up the ends of his collar and of squeezing cosmetic over his moustache and other matters of more intimate and serious character what delight he experienced on the first occasion when he heard her singing how lovely she looked on her feast day at st cloud he recalled to her memory the little garden at Ote, evenings at the theatre a chance meeting on the boulevard and some of her old servants including the negress she was astonished at his vivid recollection of these things sometimes your words come back to me like a distant echo like the sound of a bell carried on by the wind and when i read the passages about love in books it seems to me that it is about you i am reading all that people have found with as exaggerated in fiction you have made me feel said frederick i can understand Bertha, who felt no disgust at his charlotte for eating bread and butter poor dear friend she heaved a sigh and after a prolonged silence no matter we shall have loved each other truly and still without having ever belonged to each other this perhaps is all the better she replied no no what happiness we might have enjoyed oh i am sure of it with a love like yours and it must have been very strong to endure after such a long separation frederick wished to know from her how she first discovered that he loved her it was when you kissed my wrist one evening between the glove and the cuff i said to myself ah yes he loves me he loves me nevertheless i was afraid of being assured of it so charming was your reserve that i felt myself the object as it were of an involuntary and continuous homage he regretted nothing now he was compensated for all he had suffered in the past when they came back to the house madame arnoux took off her bonnet the lamp placed on a bracket threw its light on her white hair frederick felt as if some one had given him a blow in the middle of the chest in order to conceal from her his sense of disillusion he flung himself on the floor at her feet and seizing her hands began to whisper in her ears words of tenderness your person your slightest movement seemed to me to have more than human importance in the world my heart was like dust under your feet you produced on me the effect of moonlight on a summer's night when around us we found nothing but perfumes soft shadows gleams of whiteness infinity and all the delights of the flesh and of the spirit were for me embodied in your name which i kept repeating to myself while i tried to kiss it with my lips i thought of nothing further it was madame arnoux such as you were with your two children tender grave dazzlingly beautiful and yet so good this image effaced every other did i not think of it alone for had always in the very depths of my soul the music of your voice and the brightness of your eyes she accepted with transports of joy these tributes of adoration to the woman whom she could no longer claim to be frederick becoming intoxicated with his own words came to believe himself in the reality of what he said madame arnoux with her back turned to the light of the lamp stooped towards him he felt the caress of her breath on his forehead and the undefined touch of her entire body through the garments that kept them apart their hands were clasped the tip of her boot peeped out from beneath her gown and he said to her as if ready to faint the sight of your foot makes me lose my self-possession an impulse of modesty made her rise then without any further moment she said with the strange intonation of a somnambulist at my age he frederick ah no woman has ever been loved as i have been no where is the use in being young what do i care about them indeed i despise them all those women who come here oh very few women come to this place he returned in a complacent fashion her face brightened up and then she asked him whether he meant to be married he swore that he never would are you perfectly sure why should you not tis on your account said frederick clasping her in her arms she remained thus pressed to his heart with her head thrown back her lips parted and her eyes raised suddenly she pushed him away from her with a look of despair and when he implored of her to say something to him in reply she bent forward and whispered i would have liked to make you happy 
Frederick had a suspicion that Madame Ornu had come to offer herself to him, and once more he was seized with a desire to possess her, stronger, fiercer, more desperate than he had ever experienced before. And yet, he felt, the next moment, an unaccountable repugnance to the thought of such a thing, and as it were a dread of incurring the guilt of incest. Another fear, too, had a different effect on him. Less disgust might afterwards take possession of him. Besides, how embarrassing it would be, and abandoning the idea partly through prudence and partly through a resolve not to degrade his ideal, he turned on his heel and proceeded to roll a cigarette between his fingers. She watched him with admiration. How dainty you are! There is no one like you! There is no one like you! It struck eleven. Already? she exclaimed. At a quarter past I must go. She sat down again, but she kept looking at the clock, and he walked up and down the room, puffing at his cigarette. Neither of them could think of anything further to say to other. There is a moment at the hour of parting when the person that we love is with us no longer. At last, when the hands of the clock got past the twenty-five minutes, she slowly took up her bonnet, holding it by the strings. Goodbye, my friend, my dear friend. I shall never see you again. This is the closing page in my life as a woman. My soul shall remain with you even when you see me no more. May all the blessings of heaven be yours. And she kissed him on the forehead like a mother. But she appeared to be looking for something, and then she asked him for a pair of scissors. She unfastened her comb, and all her white hair fell down. With an abrupt movement of the scissors, she cut off a long lock from the roots. Keep it. Goodbye. When she was gone, Frederick rushed to the window and threw it open. There on the footpath, he saw Madame Arnoux beckoning towards the passing cab. She stepped into it. The vehicle disappeared. And this was all. End of chapter number 19 Chapter 20 of Sentimental Education This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sentimental Education by Gustave Flaubert Chapter 20 Wait Till You Come to Forty Year About the beginning of this winter, Frédéric and Delaurier were chatting by the fireside, once more reconciled by the fatality of their nature, which made them always reunite and be friends again. Frédéric briefly explained his quarrel with Madame d'Ambreuse, who had married again, her second husband being an Englishman. Delaurier, without telling how he had come to marry Mademoiselle Roque, related to his friend how his wife had one day eloped with a singer. In order to wipe away to some extent the ridicule that this brought upon him, he had compromised himself by an excess of governmental zeal in the exercise of his functions as prefect. He had been dismissed. After that he had been an agent for colonization in Algeria, secretary to a pasha, editor of a newspaper, and canvasser for advertisements, his latest employment being the office of settling disputed cases for a manufacturing company. As for Frédéric, having squandered two-thirds of his means, he was now living like a citizen of comparatively humble rank. Then they questioned each other about their friends. Martineau was now a member of the Senate. Usonet occupied a high position in which he was fortunate enough to have all the theatres and entire press dependent upon him. Sisi, given up to religion and the father of eight children, was living in the chateau of his ancestors. Pellerin, after turning his hand to Fourierism, homeopathy, table-turning, Gothic art and humanitarian painting, had become a photographer. He was now to be seen on every dead wall in Paris, where he was represented in a black coat with a very small body and a big head. "'And what about your chum Senecal?' asked Frédéric. "'Disappeared. I can't tell you where. And yourself, what about the woman you were so passionately attached to, Madame Arnoux? She is probably at Rome with her son, a lieutenant of chasseurs. And her husband? He died a year ago. You don't say so, exclaimed the advocate, then striking his forehead. 
Now that I think of it, the other day in a shop I met that worthy Marichal, holding by the hand a little boy whom she has adopted. She is the widow of a certain Monsieur Audry, and is now enormously stout. What a change for the worse, she who formerly had such a slender waist. Delorier did not deny that he had taken advantage of the other's despair to assure himself of that fact by personal experience. As he gave me permission, however, this avowal was a compensation for the silence he had maintained with reference to his attempt with Madame Arnaud. Frédéric would have forgiven him, inasmuch as he had not succeeded in the attempt. Although a little annoyed at the discovery, he pretended to laugh at it, and the allusion to the Maréchal brought back the Vatnas to his recollection. Delorier had never seen her any more than the others who used to come to the Arnoux's house, but he remembered Rochembach perfectly. Is he still living? He is barely alive. Every evening regularly he drags himself from the Rue du Grameau to the Rue Montmartre to the cafés, enfeebled, bent in two, emaciated, a spectre. Well, what about Campin? Frédéric uttered a cry of joy and begged of the ex-delegate of the provisional government to explain to him the mystery of the calf's head. "'Tis an English importation. In order to parody the ceremony which the royalists celebrated on the 30th of January, some independents founded an annual banquet at which they have been accustomed to eat calves' heads, and at which they make it their business to drink red wine out of calves' skulls, while giving toasts in favor of the extermination of the stewards.' After Termidor, the terrorists organized a brotherhood of a similar description, which proves how prolific folly is. You seem to me very dispassionate about politics. Effect of age, said the advocate. And then they each proceeded to summarize their lives. They had both failed in their objects, the one who dreamed only of love and the other of power. What was the reason of this? "'Tis perhaps from not having taken up the proper line,' said Frédéric. "'In your case that may be so. "'I, on the contrary, have sinned through excess of rectitude, "'without taking into account a thousand secondary things more important than any. "'I had too much logic, and you too much sentiment. "'Then they blamed luck, circumstances, the epoch at which they were born.' Frédéric went on. We have never done what we thought of doing long ago, it sounds, when you wished to write a critical history of philosophy, and I a great medieval romance about Nogin, a subject of which I had found in Frossard, how Messire Brocard de Fenistrange and the Archbishop of Troyes attacked Messire Eustache d'Ambresicourt. Do you remember? And exhuming their youth with every sentence, they said to each other, do you remember? They saw once more the college playground, the chapel, the parlor, the fencing school at the bottom of the staircase, the faces of the ushers and of the pupils, one named Angelmar from Versailles, who used to cut off trousers straps from old boots, Monsieur Merbal and his red whiskers, the two professors of linear drawing and large drawing who were always wrangling, and the Pole, the fellow countryman of Copernicus, with his planetary system on pasteboard, an itinerant astronomer whose lecture had been paid for by a dinner in the refectory, then a terrible debauch while they were out on a walking excursion, the first pipes they had smoked, the distribution of prizes, and the delightful sensation of going home for the holidays. It was during the vacation of 1837 that they had called at the house of the Turkish woman, this was the phrase used to designate a woman whose real name was Zoraid Turk, and many persons believed her to be a Mohammedan, a Turk, which added to the poetic character of her establishment, situated at the water's edge behind the rampart. Even in the middle of summer there was a shadow around her house, which could be recognized by a glass bowl of goldfish near a pot of mignonette at a window. Young ladies in white night dresses with painted cheeks and long earrings used to tap at the panes as the students passed, and as it grew dark, 
their custom was to hum softly in their hoarse voices at the doorsteps. This home of perdition spread its fantastic notoriety over all the arrondissement. Allusions were made to it in a circumlocutory style. The place you know, a certain street, at the bottom of the bridges. It made the farmers' wives of the district tremble for their husbands, and the ladies grow apprehensive as to their servants' virtue, inasmuch as the sub-prefect's cook had been caught there. And to be sure, it exercised the fascination over the minds of all the young lads of the place. Now, one Sunday during vesper time, Frédéric and Delaurier, having previously curled their hair, gathered some flowers in Madame Moreau's garden, then made their way out through the gate leading into the fields, and after taking a wide sweep round the vineyards, came back through the fishery and stole into the Turkish woman's house with their big bouquets still in their hands. Frédéric presented his as a lover does to his betrothed. But the great heat, the fear of the unknown, and even the very pleasure of seeing at one glance so many women placed at his disposal, excited him so strangely that he turned exceedingly pale, and remained there without advancing a single step or uttering a single word. All the girls burst out laughing, amused at his embarrassment. Fancying that they were turning him into ridicule, he ran away. And as Frederick had the money... Delaurier was obliged to follow him. They were seen leaving the house, and the episode furnished material for a bit of local gossip which was not forgotten three years later. They related the story to each other in a prolix fashion, each supplementing the narrative where the other's memory failed. And when they had finished the recital, "'That was the best time we ever had,' said Frédéric." Yes, perhaps so indeed. It was the best time we ever had, said Delaurier. End of chapter 20 End of Sentimental Education by Gustave Flaubert